أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم صدق الله العظيم Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a special warm welcome to the Vice Chancellor, Dr. Said Qureshi, uh, Principal, and our distinguished guest, Professor Rostring, so coming over on this Sunday and sparing their precious time for us, and all the delegates who have come from different centers. So this is our first uh, renal transplant uh, symposium. And I would like to start uh, by calling upon our head of department, the chief renal transplant surgeon, uh, Dr. Rashid bin Hamid. Bismillah rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum to all of you. To start with the greatest name of Almighty Allah, most gracious and most merciful, whose bounties are unbounded, whose blessings are uncountable, and whose provisions are unending, and whose love is our life, and whose worship is our faith. A very warm good morning to all of you. It is indeed my proud privilege and honor to be here among the renowned nephrologists and the transplant physician of the Pakistan. And on behalf of Dow University Hospital, Oja Campus and Renal Transplant Unit, I welcome all of you uh, who spare their Sunday for this educational activities. And I am thankful to our friend who came from the Quetta and Hyderabad for this uh, symposium. And I would like to extend a special welcome to our international speaker, Professor Rosting, who spared his valuable time for this symposium. And this is our sincere hope that uh, we shall be seeing more of you in future in Pakistan. And this symposium offer an in-depth review of the most clinically encountered topic in transplantation and also provide a unique opportunity to interact closely with leader in transplant uh, field. Once again, thank you for being here. Now, I will show you in a few slides the uh, transplant activities in Pakistan and the uh, introduction of our transplant unit in Dow University Hospital Oja campus. So this is the journey of the kidney transplant in Pakistan. The first kidney transplant was uh, done in pa uh, 1979 in Pindi, and then the, our uh, SIUT take the lead, and most of the transplant uh, was done in uh, SIUT. First cadaveric organ transplant was also done in SIUT in 1995 and first locally harvested cardiac organ transplant was also done in 1998 in SIUT. So this is the scenario of Pakistan. Basically the economy of any uh, country has a major impact on the healthcare system of, the, uh, of, their, of that country. Pakistan belongs to a low socioeconomic country. Uh, according to the Human Development Index, his, uh, the population of our country is more than 200 million. Two-third population live in rural area. Per capita income is less than 1,620. And the literacy rate for male is 58 percent and for female is 26 percent. 30 percent people live below poverty line. And the education expenditure of our uh, total budget is about 2.3 percent, while the expenditure of health is only 0.5 to 0.8 percent of the total GNP. So, from the, this economic backdrop, the, where we spend less than 1 percent of our budget on the healthcare system, 90 percent of our end stage renal disease patients are not able to get their definitive treatment uh, to get renal replacement therapy. 
less than 10 percent patient received dialysis and less than 5 percent patient received kidney transplantation. And we are seeing that the number of kidney disease patients are increasing day by day, but the transplant activities are not increasing according to their need. Presently, we need 20 to 25,000 kidney transplant per year, but presently our current rate for transplant, if we count uh, ethical transplant or legal transplant is around 1,000 to 1,500. But if we also include the illegal transplant which are done in different cities of the Pakistan, then it uh, uh, reach up to the 2,000 to 2,500 transplant per year. We, in Pakistan, there are 30 transplant centers in which 30 percent in government sector while rest in the private sector. In Sin, there are only two transplant centers uh, who are in the public sector. One is SIUT and the second one is Gumbert Institute of Kidney Transplant Center. The qualified nephrologist is 0.5 per million population and the qualified transplant surgeon is 0.2 per million population. Dialysis and transplant in the government sector is free but has limited facilities. Now what are the factors which uh, causing this low transplant activity? Although the economy has a play to a role for this transplant activity, because we see that in the developed country, the per, uh, transplant rate per million population is 20 to 40 per, uh, per million population, while in the developing country it is only 1 to 5 per million population. But what we think, this is the only reason for this low transplant activity? No, there are some other reasons also. Number one is lack of uh, access to the uh, transplant center, which are only situated in the big city, and not every patient is able to reach to this uh, hospital. The quality and safety of this transplant center, and another important thing is the choice of organ. We have limited choice to take the organ from the living donor. Cadaveric transplant program is not yet established, although the SIUT is uh, doing their best for, to aware the, uh, uh, this uh, transplant, uh, cadaveric transplant program in, the, uh, in Pakistan, but still there is uh, not much response from the society or from the public. Then lack of public awareness, lack of education, lack of motivation for organ donation, and the another important thing is well-trained manpower because this transplantation field is a very specialized field which, in which we need a very well-trained doctor, nurses and paramedical staff which we don't have so much. Now, renal transplant unit in Dow University Hospital. Dow University Hospital, Oja Campus, a tertiary care public sector hospital which was established in 2004. We have nine state-of-the-art uh, theater in our OT in which two are dedicated only for kidney tra uh, uh, transplant activities. State-of-the-art ICU is specifically dedicated for the transplant patient and we have a well-equipped radiology department, 24-7 uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, fully equipped lab and most important thing, immunology uh, center, which we have very well established immunology workup uh, uh, lab, which is the second largest immunological lab in the province of Sin. Then in 2016, the founding uh, vice chancellor established this NIZORT. NIZORT is the National Institute of Solid Organ and Tissue Transplantation which provide excellent healthcare services including all solid organ as well tissue transplantation at a very affordable cost for the poor to be benefited. And the major objective of to establish this resort is to become the institute of choice, institution of choice in the field of solid organ and tissue transplantation of the region to provide the most efficient and affordable transplant facilities for all socioeconomic classes of Pakistan and to produce highly trained and skilled transplant physician and surgeon to fulfill their rapidly growing need in the region. So under this umbrella of NIZORT, uh, till now we have done about 75 liver transplant, 500 kidney transplant, and maybe 35 bone marrow transplant. We did our first kidney transplant in Dow University Hospital on 1st March 2017 and within a short period of time we have achieved this milestone 500 kidney transplant. 
Our vision to become a regional center of excellence in the field of transplantation as well as transplant research providing services to the people and professional of Pakistan and in future to make Nizort a center of excellence in the field of renal transplantation for patient and medical personnel where it will be training people to fulfill the much needed requirement of trained medical personnel for the country. And through this symposium, I would like to give some suggestion to the higher authorities or, go or government official. There, there should be more transplant center in Pakistan. The kidney transplant, which is very cost effective and life saving therapy, should be equally available to all people in need. It. This, to increase the transplant activity, elevate poverty, increase education, increase transplant program in public sector hospital. And it is the right of an individual to donate as well as to receive an organ. Commercially motivated renal transplant is unacceptable. Decreased donor program should be promoted and leaving unrelated donor should only be accepted if local ethical committee give permission. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rashid, for your words. Now, I would like to request Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Saeed Qureshi of the Dow University of Health Sciences to come on stage and say a few words and inaugurate officially the symposium. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Professor Rostein, uh, Dr. Rashid bin Hamid, other members of the renal transplant team. We have a lot of senior uh, nephrologists here, Dr. Fazal, Dr. Ajaz, Dr. Asim, and other faculty members, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. It is a great, great pleasure to be here at this symposium, which, is also which also celebrates 500 renal transplants done at the Dow University Hospital. I think this is a great achievement a mi and a milestone in uh, the history of the university. Transplant activity has uh, been increasing in Pakistan, and uh, one of the reasons is that newer transplant uh, anti-rejection drugs are available. And as these proliferate, the transplant activity also increases, and this happens both in our, in our, not just both, but in all our three transplant units. And as things improve further and drugs become cheaper, I think this will also increase. The main obstacle in Pakistan to transplant uh, activity, not only renal but also liver, is the very little utilization of cadaveric transplant. We have to rely on live donors, uh, family donors, to provide the kidney, and only in this way can transplants be carried out. There is too much opposition from our religious uh, leaders, I should say. To, and they are not ready to school the people towards uh, donation of their organs. Professor Rizvi at the SIUT has been trying this for a number of years, but the success has been very minimal. The other problem that, is, uh, that arises, especially in the private sector, is unethical practices. This was mentioned by Dr. Uh, Rashid. And this is, we are quite pleased that this doesn't happen in this province, in Sindh province. This is mainly in the northern parts of Pakistan, uh, uh, where it's still it, although it is now restricted, while previously a lot of people from the Middle East would come in, uh, now that has stopped. But again, still, as far as the Pakistani population is concerned, it is still persists and is a major ethical problem. Activity and expansion of uh, transplant facilities is limited by human resource. This is both uh, technical and paramedical. And as soon as people are trained, they tend to move off to greener pastures and 
we continue to have a persistent shortage of trained manpower in this country. So these are some of the things that hinder the expansion of transplant activity in Pakistan. And I hope with time and with improved economic uh, situation in Pakistan and with improved financial resources, this will be overcome and things will progress. So in the end, I would like to thank Professor Rosteng for being here uh, today, for having traveled from France to Pakistan uh, to be a part of this symposium. He has already, I think, spoken at Lahore and Islamabad. Uh, uh, but again, we are grateful that he could find time to visit us in Karachi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind remarks and inaugural uh, opening. So now uh, we would like to invite our panel of ex experts for the first session. Uh, first, I would like to invite uh, Professor M. H. Ismani. Uh, he is uh, ex-head of department of JPMC, and uh, he was uh, principal of Sir Sayyid Medical College. Sir, kindly come uh, on the stage and take your seat. And currently, he is working in National Medical Center. Our second panel of experts is Professor Ejaz. He is the president of uh, Pakistan Society of Nephrology and uh, he is currently working in Sindh Institute of Urology and Transplantation. Sir, please come on the stage. Our third panel of experts is uh, Dr. Kiran Nasser. Uh, she is working in Kidney Center and uh, she is looking after the transplant program. Madam, please come on the stage. So uh, now I would in like to invite uh, our first uh, distinguished uh, speaker, Professor Fazal Akhtar. Uh, he is a professor at uh, Sindh Institute of Urology and Transplantation. So kindly uh, come on the stage and give your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to first thank the organizer, Dr. Dr. Rashid, Dr. Tasadok, and all the organizing team for inviting me to speak at the first transplant symposium of the University of the Health Science. So evaluation, I mean, say, I mean, we usually divide as the evaluation first of the donor and the evaluation of the recipient. I mean, because of the, for the time factor, I won't be able to cover both of them. So I have concentrated mainly on the evaluation of the kidney donor. So for every, for every the key principle in living donor transplantation for ethics is the same thing. The first is altruism. It should be selfless gift to other. Then an autonomy, and there should be the right of the individual for it to self-determine. Then it benefits taking action to serve the best interest, and then non benefits do not harm. When we were studied, I mean, we have what we say that the. Hippocratic oath, primum non nocre. The, the first thing for the doctor is that do not do any harm. So when we select a donor, we have to think about it that we are not doing any harm. Is the is the taking a kidney completely hundred percent safe procedure? Nothing is going to help to the donor for the rest of life. It's not like that. It's not as gloomy as we think. And this is our study, I think, that we published in a uh, uh, Journal of Transplantation more than 10 years ago. And then we studied the, uh, 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 the people that what happened to them after transplantation. And you can see that they have more increased risk of the hypertension they had, uh, had decreased EGFR, they had protein urea, they had become diabetic, 
and the end stage reader failure. I mean, this is, doesn't pertain to ourselves. You will say that Pakistan, in which the health care is very limited, this happens uh, in Pakistan. It doesn't happen in Pakistan. It happens everywhere, all everywhere the, the country. And the paper published in the BMJ more than 10 years ago said that the, the kidney donation risk increases the risk of the hypertension by approximately 3.6% every year. That means in 10 years, they will have 36% have risk of developing hypertension. And theoretically, in 20 years' time, they will have 72% risk of developing hypertension. And with hypertension, it will come the protein urea as well. And we all, as a nephrologist, we know that the protein urea and hypertension, they are the major risk of decreased kidney function. So I will start, this is a hypothetical case. That 32-year-old man want to donate the kidney to his wife. She had acute cortical necrosis for optical complication. And she had, and she was the only child of, uh, of, the, of the parent. Blood group was O positive, mother was B positive, father was 65 year old, and, uh, and he was O positive. So the husband decided to donate the kidney. He was, 30, he was 32 year old, and he has got a BMI of 29, blood pressure in the clinic, was 149 by 80. 24 hour urinary protein is 300 milligram. And fasting blood sugar is 106 milligram, milligram. The question is, shall we accept this as a donor, considering the risk factor? So the first thing that we did is that do not do any harm. And we have to balance the risk to the donor and the benefit to the recipient. So uh, after the talk, then I will come to, back to this slide again. So the component of living or donor evaluation, like we did everywhere in the medicine, is the first of all, take a good history. The history, and then you have to think about the kidney, kidney uh, uh, history as well beside general history. Then it is important to take the family history as well, social history, and then after taking the history, there is a need for the physical examination, then come the lab test, and then there is a transmissible disease screening, the endemic disease screening, and then sometime in the older donor, then you have to, to uh, work out whether they have any sort of a malignancy. I will come to the general and kidney specific history. I mean, it is important to know whether there is any history of hypertension, coronary heart disease, lung disease, GI disease, autoimmune disease, any neurological disease, any bleeding or clotting disorder. In the women, it is important to, to know whether they had any hypertension during the pregnancy, any, any history of suggesting preeclampsia or eclampsia. Then, then the, in the older recipient, as I said, that any active malignancy and that any past history of any malignancy. So more important for the donor is the history of hypertension whether they have got hypertension or not, then the, then the diabetes. Because hypertension and the diabetes, they, in Pakistan, it constitute about 66% of, uh, of the cause of the uh, end-stage renal failure. Then come the coronary artery disease and the kidney disease, if they have the type of the disease, the time of onset, and the extra renal manifestation, if they had. Then it is important to know the social history, what their occupation is, 
whether there is a history of drug abuse or not, in history of occupation, in history of depression and suicidal tendency. Our, I think, I mean, when, uh, when the family brings the donor, they think that they will bring the donor who is not the earning member of the family or who is the very dependent or for them who is the least useful for the family then they will usually bring them as, their, as a donor. So, but we, it is our duty to protect the donor. I'm sorry. Then physical examination, vital sign, examination of the, all the major organ, the BMI should be less than 30, the blood pressure measurement. At least, it should be at least on two occasions. Have one in the hospital, uh, uh, perhaps one in the even in the two occasion and one in the hospital, or if it is the blood pressure is high, the hospital then preferably somewhere in the at home. And if the blood pressure remains high, then it it is very often due to white coat hypertension. Then you need amb uh, ambulatory monitoring for 24 hours. The hypertension cut off, I mean, this cut off, which I have, uh, I, I was going through the different guidelines. I mean, there are, are a lot of guidelines, KDGO guideline, then the American UNDP guideline, then the British Transplant Society guideline, there is a Canadian Society guideline, and none of them, they mention any cut off. I mean, this cut off, which I have taken from the, from the GNC, that what is the cutoff for the, for the hypertension is the JNC uh, said 140 by 90 is definitely hypertensive. 130 by 85 is borderline hypertensive. Is, is, is borderline hypertensive. So this I, I, this I have taken from the JNC. They usually say that it should be according to their own country. And if they are hypertensive, and if they are well controlled on one or two drugs and they, they have no sign of any end organ damage like retinopathy involved uh, left ventricle hypertrophy or, pro or proteinuria then in spite of having hypertension they can be accepted as donor and measure the blood pressure at least on two occasions and as we said that at in case of doubt, the best thing would be do do the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Be my more than thirty, they are usually discouraged. In all the uh, all the guideline, it, uh, they said that the BMI over thirty, they should be discouraged. But it is a centered experience. Some of the center, they will take the uh, uh, the donor with more than 30, as, uh, accept the donor with more than 30 BMI. But generally, more than 30 BMI, because if they have got a high BMI, there is more chance of having chronic kidney disease after a few years. In age, lower limit, we all know that it should be 18. That means you can give the consent. But upper limit, it varies to the center. In the United States, about 20% of the donor are in between the age of 65 and 70. Living donor, they are at the age 70. But it, it varies very according to the center. At SIET, we usually do not accept we usually do not accept a donor above age of 60. The reason for, for not accepting the old donor above 60 is that the older donor, they have two things. They have got poor, poor graft survival. And, and the second thing is they have, uh, had the post-transplant EGFR is usually less than 60. That means they have they have got at least the some some sort of a CKD. That's what it says. The general lab test I'll say is the same CBC, UCE, liver function test, clotting screen, fasting sugar and fasting lipids, then glucose tolerance test or hemoglobin A1C. I mean the guideline says 
that you don't need to do in each and every donor, but you need to do if, if there is a family history of diabetes, if there are high metabolic risk, like they have the gestational diabetes, or like somebody has, a, uh, has got overweight, they have got like something like metabolic syndrome. And, but in many center, that uh, all patients who come for, for the donation, they, uh, they go through the GTT. In SIUT, we practice that uh, all of the donor, they have the, the GTT. The reason is that uh, I will say about 60 to 70 percent of the people in Pakistan, they have got undiagnosed diabetes. So we cannot say that if there is any family history of diabetes or not. Then, then the urine analysis. The urinary protein, the albumin creatine ratio or protein creatine ratio, that should be the initial investigation. And that is the being followed by the 24-hour urinary protein. The 24-hour protein should be less than 150 milligram, but some center, they accept the uh, uh, donor uh, with urinary protein of less than 300 milligram. Then hematuria, what should be cut off? It is usually between three to five red cells per high power field, but some center, they accept at the donor up to 10 RBC per high power field. I mean, you have to remember that if the 24 hour unit protein is less than one, uh, one gram, then check for the orthostatic protein urea before denying them. I mean, in Pakistan, I think that the, the problem with the renal disease is that if they have got a history of passing a, any stone or if they have got a, a stone, then they, they need 24-hour metabolic studies. And if the metabolic study is abnormal, then, then they, they are usually uh, irritated. The, the metabolic, uh, yeah, abnormal metabolic studies include hypocitrate urea, hypercalcium urea, hyperoxy urea, and if they are not corrected by dietary modification, they are usually non, uh, not accepted. And if they have got a stone, shall we accept them? That we usually, uh, if, uh, say, look, look at them, if the metabolic study is normal, and if they have got a small stone, a, sto a small stone means less than three millimeter of the stone, then we do accept them as a donor. The risk of the diabetes, who should be evaluated? Family history of diabetes or who has got the high metabolic risk. The tests are the glucose tolerance test or hemoglobin A1C. The impaired glucose, the fasting sugar is uh, um, uh, the definition of, of the impaired glucose tolerance test is fasting sugar more than in between 100 to 126 or hemoglobin A1C 5.7. I came across an interesting study published earlier this year, which I want to share. That this was the outcome of the kidney donor with impaired fasting sugar. They studied the patient between 1963 and 207, and they divided into three groups. Those who had, uh, uh, did have the uh, uh, have normal sugar, then the, the group, they had the uh, impaired color, glucose tolerance test, and those who had the fasting sugar of more than 126. In, two th in between, up till 2012, the definition of the impaired uh, uh, glucose tolerance test was between 100 and 140. And the study was between 1963 to 2007. And in this study, you can see that if they have got impaired uh, uh, fasting sugar, they had 63% risk of developing diabetes, 30% risk of developing hypertension. But the mortality, protein urea, end-stage renal failure. It is very, yeah, 
uh, comparable to those who have a normal sugar. But if the sugar is more than 126, they have got a higher incidence of proteinuria, higher incidence of, of end-state kidney disease. So, so we, you can say that, that you, you have, it is not necessary to exclude everyone who has got the impaired glucose tolerance test. The, the, the graft outcome is more, is, is more or less the same. It is just that the, the donor, they have increased risk of developing hypertension, uh, uh, hypertension and diabetes. The lab tests are the blood group, CBC, that, that, I, that I have commit, the, the calcium phosphate, fasting lipids, the, the, these are the usual urine analysis, 24 hour urinary protein, and the measurement of EGFR. GFR. But there are different uh, yeah, uh, tests, either you do the, uh, yeah, the creatine clearance or isotope measurement. The KDO guidelines suggest that the first, uh, first thing you have to do is to do the EGFR from serum creatinine, followed by confirmation with the measured GFR, to, and the measured GFR is 24 hour creatine clearance. All the EGFR from combination of serum creatinine and cystatin C that we call as EGFR creatinine and cystatin. Then EGFR from CKD AP 2022. And very recently, the, uh, uh, this month, an article has been published in American Journal of Kidney Disease. And when they assessed different sort of a measurement of the EGFR, they didn't find uh, any difference with the CKD AP 2021, 2029, or, or EGFR creatine and cystatin C. So any of them, the formula, they can be used. Then imaging test is for, for, the, for the female, you have, you have to measure the, uh, the HCG, then ECG, chest radiograph, and then the anatomic assessment of the kidney, like ultrasound of the kidney. And that, we, that is usually followed by, uh, by looking at the angiogram. Then the screening of the transmissible disease is CMV, EBV, HIV, hepatitis, uh, surface antigen, core antibody, hepatitis C, uh, C, and the HCV by PCR. I've mentioned the varicella antibody uh, in the italic, is that none of the guidelines suggest that you have to measure the head. I have very similar zoster, but uh, it is because uh, yeah, um, the, with the guideline where it has come from, all the children, they had immunization. But in Pakistan, not all of them, the, the children, they had immunization. And sometimes they can get very severe varicella zoster. So, so uh, uh, what we do is, that we always check for the varicella zoster antibody before accepting that as a donor. Now I'll come back to the case. I mean, what you, you have noticed is that the, 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 the donor had the BM, uh, risk factor was BMI of, uh, of 29, 149 blood pressure was 149 by 80, and 24 hour urinary protein was 300 milligram and fasting sugar was 106 milligrams. We are running short of time, so okay. please. Okay, I think this, this is my last slide is. So, so, so what is that if we accept that the patient didn't have any other donor, except for the father who, who is 65, so the BMI of 29, in that case it could be accepted, one blood pressure reading of 149 by 80, I think, it should be have another blood pressure me measurement and necessarily, if necessary, do the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. 24 hour urinary protein was 300 milligram. So we need to exclude out for orthostatic protein urea. But if the protein is definitely 300 milligram and if he's overweight, then he is developing, he has got a risk 
of developing protein urea after donor nephrectomy and the fasting sugar of 106, then you have to risk, balance the risk and the benefit. But, but if he's donating to his wife and uh, 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 your wife, so perhaps in this case, if you ask him to reduce the, his body weight, so we can accept as the donor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fazal Akhtar. We'll have the answer question at the end of the session. Thank you very much, sir, for your valuable information. This will definitely benefit us in the future. Mm. Uh, moving on to the second session of this lecture on ethical issues of renal transplant, I'd like to call upon stage Professor Dr. Asim Ahmed from Kidney Center. Thank you, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rashid. Thank you, Tasadduk, for the invitation, and thank you, all the organizers. Uh, Saeed uh, Rosting, Mr. Rosting is not here, Dr. Rosting, but I think. So, uh, in, during the first talk of Fazal, we've heard, and before that also, we've heard about issues of ethics in transplant. And the issues of ethics in transplants, one of them is very clear, you know. I, I think the Sadduk spoke about it, it's about buying and selling. And Fazal mentioned about balancing risk and benefit. The interesting thing is even in that, we are balancing risk and benefit between two different individuals. Normally we balance risk and benefit within, within that individual, but this is one of the nuances of, of renal transplant. So I briefly talk about renal transplants uh, uh, and ethical issues, both uh, in uh, renal, cadaveric, as well as xenotransplant. So, uh, well, generally we all accept that kidney transplant is a gold standard for, uh, for treatment with end-stage renal failure. Um, and it is supposed to be giving a much better quality of life and probably prolonged quality of life and as compared to other therapies of renal replacement. Uh, clearly, in, since 1954, uh, transplantation itself has come a long way from there. And the first transplant that was done in Boston uh, between the two identical twins, from then onwards, a lot of things have happened in renal transplant. And this is a brief, brief summary or a brief history guidelines of from where we started and where we have ended. And we have actually ended it up into a, a xenotransplantation of a genetically modified pig recently where, where the kidney was, was worked for some time. So transplants are of many kinds. Uh, we all know we've talked about uh, the living transplant and we've talked about transplants which are, which are uh, genetically related and transplants that are emotionally related. And there are few transplants that are purely altruistic. Uh, pure altruistic transplants are transplants where people give kidneys just for the sake of giving kidneys. And the only transplants that I know of, of true altruism are the uh, the Sri Lankan monks that actually used to go to India to donate a kidney because they thought they had two kidneys and they can give it to somebody else that will work. Uh, then we have these cadaveric transplants and then xenotransplant. So as we know in ethics, we know for when we teach undergraduates, we say there are four pillars of ethics, the Georgetown mantra, where the first thing, as I think Fuzzle said, first do no harm or non-maleficence is the thing. If we actually think about transplant, and probably it is the first surgical procedure that is done on a perfectly healthy individual who doesn't require to have that procedure for benefit of somebody else. And there are, there are reasons for it being acceptable as ethical. And one of the reasons is, is as actually Fuzzle also said, that it, is, it does give you a um, uh, 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 sense of, of accomplishment by helping somebody else. And it is a, clearly a beneficial act which helps other people and probably helps the individuals themselves. The, the second pillar was of to, to do good. I mean, the first pillar is the lowest bar, at least do no harm. But if you can do good, that's even better. And so transplant is, is, uh, is, is, is thought to be good because it helps the individual in himself or herself. Um, and it helps another, another recipient, which is usually in, in living related transplant or in living emotionally related transplants is, that, uh, is, is somebody that is close to them. And as Fuzzle said that it's individual choice of what you decide, but in, in, in this history, 
this is the only reason that we accept. So we say it is, uh, we accept a person to give a kidney to somebody else, not for his own or her benefit, and donor consent, and then of course screening and follow up to make sure that the donor doesn't have any issue, is, is the cornerstone of which how we accept people as, as donors. So we all know that I can decide on my own what to do with my body, because I am a fully autonomous person, uh, and the, the, the degree of autonomy is, or the consent is basically based on there, are, there should be no specific other influences affecting my agency. And the other influences could be negative as well as positive, so inducement, coercion are thought to not to be there so that one person can actually then, then donate uh, freely by his, uh, her own choice. So uh, this is one of the major justifications of having a renal transplant. It is individual autonomy, person can do it. But that's, and the components of consent we all know. Consent is not an easy, easy thing. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a signature that is required. It's the whole process of how you explain things to the, the recipient. So number one, as, as well, do we actually explain recipients the long-term risks of diabetes or hypertension or, or other things, as well as no other influence on, him, on her to, to donate? There is a major concern about freedom of choice in donors, in renal donors especially. Uh, is, is the level of understanding and the degree of volunteerness that people have. So uh, clearly in our society there is huge amount of pressure from within and from the surroundings as well as the person themselves. So what if I say no, what will my relatives think? I am one of the few donors. Uh, how will I live with myself if I do not donate and the, my, my wife or my child or somebody else has to go through this? And the, uh, the other thing is in truly emotional donation, like parents to children, the whole sequence of consent and the, the time spent is not there. Most donors decide on the first go. So they know my child is ill, uh, he's not going to, uh, dialysis is going to be very difficult, there is a choice of donation, so they make their choice instantly. So they don't go through that process of understanding the risk, benefit, and then finally what do we do. So the other, the fourth corner is justice. So normally um, equitable distribution and the things, we normally think that justice is, is in organ donation of cadaveric. So you know who gets the donor, who is going to be on the list, why somebody should be or not be on the list. So uh, because they're there, this, uh, the, the issue of supply and demand, how many donors are, are uh, donor kidneys are available versus how many recipients are available. However, it also affects living transplant. So if you look at, if you look at, forget Pakistan and India, and I, I think you have a much better idea, but if you look at registries everywhere around the world, there is a huge disparity in who donates and who receives. So if you look in living transplant. So if you look at uh, the Swiss registry, and this is a, a, a old slide, so say up to two, from 1993 to 2003, 65% of kidney donors were women, and 64% of recipients were men. If you look at the gender differences, uh, this is very recent, gender differences in transplant and kidney disease, uh, men have, a, the first column is men, so men clearly have a faster progression to CKD, men have a higher incidence of CKD, women are less likely to be listed on transplant, uh, women have to wait longer once they are listed, men get transplant much more often, women donate more kidneys than they receive. And they've actually looked at globally, I think the only country with the population, male-female population, and the donation rate is Oman, which is the only one that is actually fits the criteria of how many women there are and how many do donors of women do donate. All other countries have a very skewed, and this is, I think this is from the Norway. If you can see that, sorry the pointer doesn't work, but the living related transplant, the third column, if you see the males and the donors, and then you see this females, same thing in the spousal, spousal pairs. So women always donate more. And it's very interesting that, I'm not sure whether I have a slide, it's also very interesting to note that uh, females donate much more to males, and while males only donate to 31% to females.
so women donate to women as well as to men men preferentially donate to men and less preferentially to female so so there is in a in in a living renal transplant in which we think we have cleared out everything else there is still a great bias of women being the major donor pool and i think uh, at one time SIUT had a major issue with like that and at present they have been trying extremely hard to make sure that the balance of male to female ratios are, is not skewed in, the, in favor of men. So of course we all know the unrelated renal transplant, Pakistan had a very checkered history of unrelated renal transplant. We know that many people are willing to sell. Uh, this is my email, I mean so if you can see emails, uh, you know there's people sending emails saying I'm ready to donate. Uh, my blood group is so I'm, I'm absolutely healthy. This is a message that I got on my, my cell phone. And of course, the, and if you see, see Aslam Alaikum, I want to donate my kidney, please help and contact me. My blood group is O negative, so he's the classical donor with everything else. I kidney donate my kidney, please contact me. And of course, we've seen all these pictures of people donating, and there is a there is a, a book out by Professor Farhat Mozam at CBAC uh, SIUT, and she's looked at uh, uh, ethnographic uh, study of all the donors, and especially from Sultan, and especially from areas which are known as Sultanpura, where the most bending used to happen. So this is a slide I borrowed from Ijaz or Fazal, who got the slide from uh, Nabil from Oman, and he was looking at people that came back to Oman. Who, who got a kidney from somewhere else. And it's very interesting to see that in the purple, everybody used to go to India at one time to get uh, unrelated transplant or buy a kidney. And once India took a legislation, happened in 1994 to ban that, everybody went to, to Iraq to get it. And then George W. Bush invaded Iraq, and so they could not happen again, so it went down. And if you see yellow, the Pakistan uh, was became the largest center of, uh, of vending at that time. Fortunately, after a long struggle, I think 2007, we had a, a law stating that unrelated or vending of kidneys uh, is, is illegal. So of course, we all know why do people sell. So the most common reason is to get out of bonded labor. And the second most common cause is for dowry. And then there are stupid people who want to have a bike or a motorcycle or something else and they want to sell their kidney. I had a person who came and she said, I wanted to have a, I want to buy a motorcycle and I want to sell my kidney. So uh, uh, even among paid donors, there are a lot of studies even in Iran where they have a, uh, have a, uh, a paid transplant, not through, the, through the, the actual recipient, but through the state. But every study uh, over a period of time has shown that people who have vended their kidneys uh, have a poorer quality of life. If you ask them, would you donate? If you were given a chance again to donate again, they all say they will not donate. They were never, they never went better than what they were, and they always stayed in that same degree of poverty that they were before. And of course, if you look at justice, it's, you can never have justice in vending, because people who are uh, rich will always buy, and people who are poor will always sell. So there's, it's not going to be that a poor person is going to buy a kidney of a rich man. It's always going to be a rich man or a woman buying a kidney from a poor man. So in my last two slides, I think I hopefully will be well in time. Uh, last two slides, xenotransplantation, of course, comes with a sets of own sets of, of, its proper, of ethical issues. So in, if you look at the history, this is how the timeline of, uh, of, of xenotransplant happened. And in 2021, which is about a year ago, they actually did a porcine transplant to a, to a, actually a brain dead man. So I'm not sure whether you can call him dead or not, but that's the issue with when we talk about people with brain death and we say that's death. And then you have a study which says there is a brain dead man in which we can put a kidney in and they, uh, the kidney lasted for, they actually <coughs> stopped the experiment after 54 hours or so, but they could actually do it. These are the actual pictures of the porcine transplant. So of course, uh, Professor Rosting would be talking about it. We had to get over the 180 million years of, uh, of, of uh, um, uh, immunity and, and, and other things, how to get uh, to the point where a porcine kidney of a different species of animal could actually come to this. And of course, they, they made, they made uh, what is known as a GE pig which had 
a lot of issues that they did. So they took, knocked out certain genes, they added certain genes, they added a complement factor to it, and eventually that could become a, a universal donor for the, for, for, for the human beings. Actual pictures. Uh, there are many issues in, uh, in, uh, in xenotransplantation. Of course, apart from the issues of uh, zoonotic infections, uh, infections that we don't know about, there are also about issues of how do you surveillance people. Because most people that would go into a xenotransplant will be like a research pro proposal or a protocol. And in research, we tell people that they have a choice to withdraw. Would they have a choice to withdraw once you have got a xenotransplant? Because they would want to follow them over all, all during their, all their life, so to know what happens to them as well as to the, to the kidney. And there are, there are issues of privacy and confidentiality, plus, of course, animal rights. So, so there are many issues in transplant. That is my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your value talk. Moving on to the third lecture of this session uh, on pre-transplant infection evaluation to post-transplant prophylaxis, I'd like to call our next guest on stage, Dr. Amir Kazi, who's done his transplant ID from uh, US, from Indus Hospital, Karachi. Assalamualaikum, everyone. My name is Amir Kazi. I am currently working at the Indus Hospital as uh, an infectious disease and transplant infectious disease physician. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, Dr. Tasadduk, Dr. Rachid, thank you so much. Um, it's really an honor to be here among such an esteemed uh, group of physicians and transplant physicians. Uh, thank you. And since this is our first uh, opportunity to meet, I'd like to share a little bit about my background. I returned from the U.S. Um, a year and a half ago, and um, while in the U.S. I had an interest in transplant, I completed my internal medicine residency from St. Louis, did my uh, infectious disease training from Chicago, and then um, went on to pursue transplant infectious diseases in Houston, um, and had the opportunity to gain experience in kidney, liver, pancreas, bowel, multivisceral, heart, lung, um, stem cell, CAR T cell therapy, transplant. So it's really been wonderful being back here. So we'll talk about um, pre-transplant eva infection evaluation to post-transplant prophylaxis and vaccination. So we'll discuss the approach. We'll go over some of the guidelines and really how to apply those guidelines in Pakistan. I've highlighted in green the areas um, which are applicable in the U.S. and international guidelines to Pakistan. We'll talk about vaccination and post-transplant prophylaxis as well. So the, uh, for the pre-transplant approach from an infectious disease perspective, the, the goal of this screening is to identify conditions which may disqualify either donor or recipient to prevent infection flare-up post-transplant to prevent donor-derived infections, and for, to address pre- and post-transplant prophylaxis. And very importantly, to identify and treat any active infections pre-transplant. A major issue there is with invasive mycobacterial and fungal infections, and these should always, usually, if possible, be treated uh, until there is clinical, radiographic, and microbiologic resolution prior to transplant. So a lot of pathogens and donor-derived infections have been described in the literature. There's a long list. There's bacteria, there's viruses, fungi, parasites, mycobacterial infections. Um, and you know, through the years, some of these have been captured. Some have been identified post-transplant with bad outcomes. However, just to highlight a few in Pakistan that we may encounter or have been encountering, so starting from the top, in, for kidney transplantation, it would be routine bacterial pathogens like urinary pathogens like E. coli or Klebsiella, but in an endemic area where we have typhoid, malaria, dengue, these are other pathogens to worry about, in addition to things like HIV, Hep B, Hep C, uh, for example, traditionally one used to think of Pakistan as a HIV low endemic area, and we now understand that that has changed, that paradigm has shifted, especially now with our experience with the Larkana, Rotterdero outbreaks in the pediatric population and with limited access to care. So there will always remain certain pathogens that we know of and then several that we don't know of. For example, West Nile virus does exist in Pakistan, 
However, we don't have testing um, capacity outside of research-based PCRs to identify this. And along with pathogens that are transmitted during transplantation, it's important to recognize that we do do a lot of screening and testing. However, despite all the advanced testing, even in the West, multiple incidents of donor transmitted infections have been reported and continue to be reported. And this emphasizes the importance of and limitations of organ donor screening. Now, fortunately, um, I suppose from an infectious disease perspective, we do have living uh, donor transplants in Pakistan. So typically our donors are doing well and we're able to obtain a lot more baseline assessment. So a basic transplant ID evaluation has three parts. Part one is the usual ID history and ID assessment that we need to do. Their HPI, their TB risk, their nosocomial exposures, their residence, occupation, travel, lifestyle, sexual, animal, and environmental exposures. Following that, there are certain pre-transplant aspects that we need to see, such as any pre-transplant infections, their serologies and their workup that would um, assess their reactivation risk for infections, their vaccinations. And then in the post-transplant uh, era, knowing uh, what they received for induction, whether this was lymphocyte depleting or non-lymphocyte depleting, how their graft is doing, any perioperative complications, their surgical anatomy, any early or late infections that they encountered, any history of CMV reactivation. I always joke and say that for a transplant ID physician, it's really CMV which helps pay the bills and send your children to school because it's really the main pathogen that we see in transplant across the board. And this is directly linked to an individual's or a recipient's net state of immunosuppression along with any history of rejection and prophylaxis that they may or may not have received. So for screening, um, I'm, I'll go over a few of these, I think, important tables. And again, I've just highlighted what um, is available in Pakistan, what is being practiced in Pakistan as well in green. So the, the routine suspects in screening which have already been discussed are, as I like to call, the triple H, so HIV, the hepatitis B and C viruses, and then the herpes viruses. And all of these are commonly performed and should be performed as well. In addition to that, we do have uh, toxoplasmosis, which is endemic in Pakistan. We see a fair amount of toxoplasmosis in our AIDS and otherwise immunocompromised patients. Testing for it is available and is performed at certain centers. Interestingly, we have a lot of strongyloides uh, in India. It's endemic in India. And for reasons somewhat unknown, not so much um, you know, in Pakistan. Part of that may be due to under-reporting. However, we don't see exacerbations of strongyloides as we do in India. In addition to the, uh, the testing that was mentioned earlier, it's important to screen for syphilis and TB along with routine blood and urine cultures. Karachi is actually a fairly syphilis endemic area. We do see a lot of syphilis uh, in Karachi. So I do think it's important to screen for those as recommended in the guidelines. Tuberculosis screening, and I'll be talking more about this um, in the slides to come about both latent infection and active TB. But it's definitely it's very essential to us in Pakistan, um, ruling out exposures, latent TB, assessing for active TB, and if they, if they have latent TB infection, then treating for it with INH prophylaxis. Urine and blood cultures in our setting uh, definitely have a role to play because we have a lot of resistant organisms, a lot of ESBL gram negatives, carpenem resistant gram negatives. And so identifying that in the pre-transplant setting allows us to do more directed therapy in the perioperative setting and knowing what the recipient uh, might be colonized with in case they develop an infection post-transplant. This is a large slide, but I would like to highlight uh, some points here. This is regarding to interventions, uh, regarding donor and recipient screening results. So by and large, uh, in the top row, we're talking about HIV. So for an HIV positive donor and a recipient that's negative, uh, the recommendation is to reject those donors. I've highlighted in green, again, uh, the points which are important. Um, now, there are trials in the U.S. that are happening for HIV uh, donor recipient positive to positive transplantation, and those are still under trial. Uh, but by and large, for our setting, um, positive to negative would require rejecting the donor. 
Now, in, for a negative to positive HIV setting, it's really about controlling their HIV viral load before proceeding with transplantation. Uh, for CMV and EBV, it's assessing donor-recipient stat status, and for solid organ transplantation, being donor positive and recipient negative is high risk for transmission. For hepatitis C, it's been more of an issue with liver transplant, not so much so with kidney transplant, and there has been a paradigm shift in the way, in the way we think about hepatitis C. And by and large, even if um, the donor and recipient are both hepatitis C positive and the donor is hep C RNA positive, one can proceed with uh, transplantation along with antiviral therapy because we have such excellent uh, antiviral therapy um, in, our, in this day and age. And it has, um, and the one available in Pakistan is so Fosbivir, Daclitasivir, which has no interactions with Tacrolimus or MMF. And even for the reverse setting, um, where, um, where just the recipient has active hep C, that can be controlled in a pre- or post-transplant setting with antiviral therapy. For hepatitis B, it always gets a little bit tricky. However, having an active infection with surface antigen positive or core IgM positive, indicating recent hepatitis B infection um, in the donor, means that we may have to reject that um, that organ. However, based on a transplant center to center uh, or life-saving basis, more so in liver transplants or heart and lung transplants, that can be, um, that approach can be modified. By and large, the common scenario in Pakistan highlighted in the blue box is where we have a donor that's core uh, antibody IgG positive and recipients may be either immune or non-immune. If a recipient is non-immune, in that case, they would benefit from being on antiviral prophylaxis post-transplant. And if they are immune, um, then um, there is no need for additional prophylaxis. Then the very last uh, bottom row, there's a mention of CNS viral pathogen. This is more of an issue with cadaveric transplants when um, young patients may be diseased from an unknown meningoencephalitis um, or a CNS process and the reason for demise is somewhat unknown. And in those cases, CNS viruses like West Nile and rabies can be transmitted. So it's just something to be mindful of uh, regarding cadaveric transplant. So I'll touch upon some of these infections. So for hepatitis B in renal transplant, if a recipient is surface antigen positive, there is a high risk of reactivation and untreated mortality remains high. So in the pre-transplant scenario for the recipient, the idea is to treat as per guidelines, to undergo the transplant, and then the, the recipient can be on indefinite prophylaxis. If the recipient does not meet treatment criteria pre-transplant for hepatitis B, one can still undergo transplant and then remain on indefinite prophylaxis. And thankfully, in Pakistan, we have uh, all the routine hepatitis B therapies such as entecavir and tenofovir and lamivudine as well. This is usually followed up with uh, monitoring in the recipient, so LFTs, DNA levels, ultrasound every six months. And uh, if the recipient is only core antibody positive, the risk of reactivation is low, around 5%. So this is where the data is a little bit more gray. Routine prophylaxis is not recommended, but monitoring can be done. For hepatitis C, the approach remains for recipients to treat and to transplant or to transplant and treat with antiviral therapies. And by and large, for hepatitis C, it really comes down to what the waiting time or waiting list is. For, for newer transplant programs, uh, there uh, may be a short wait in, waiting time. For more established programs, there's a long waiting time, so it gives more time to treat the hepatitis C prior to transplant. For latent and active TB, very important to do a history examination and assess with either an interferon gamma test or quantiferon along with um, imaging. And then if the donor is uh, latent TB, has latent TB infection, they should under-receive INH prophylaxis followed by transplant. This is typically easier to do in a renal transplant setting where there may be um, months to years on the wait list. If the donor has active TB, that is a contraindication to transplant. If the recipient has latent TB, uh, then they should receive INH prophylaxis in Pakistan, and this can be followed by transplant. 
If the recipient has active TB, they should be treated for up to resolution before transplant. If the organ received from the donor with untreated latent TB or active TB does occur, then the recipient should receive INH prophylaxis and the individual can undergo transplant while still taking INH prophylaxis and they can complete their post-transplant course. This, these are some of the latent TB regimens as per the US CDC. The ones highlighted in the, in the below two green boxes are what's available. So there's isonized monotherapy for six to nine months, which is daily, or there's a combination of INH and rifampin for three months, which is daily. Unfortunately, we do not have rifampin monotherapy, which is uh, really easy and a good regimen to do. So for screening summary in Pakistan, it's really the triple H or HIV, hepatitis B, C, and herpes viruses. And then some of the usual suspects with blood and urine cultures, TB, syphilis, toxo, and assessing for COVID-19 in this era. Regarding vaccinations, these should be reviewed pre-transplant and uh, updated. Inactivated and live vaccines can be given. There are various timelines for administering these in the pre-transplant. And highlighted in green are the commercially and easily available vaccines in Pakistan. So that's the influenza vaccine, hepatitis A, B, tetanus, pertussis, and the pneumococcal conjugate or PCV13 vaccine. Other vaccines that need to be brought into the scope would be the PPSV23 pneumonia vaccine and the new Shingrix vaccine, which is a recombinant, recombinant vaccine. Shingles remains a major issue of reactivation post-transplant, and so the newer recombinant vaccine, which is non-live, has excellent efficacy. And of course, the typhoid vaccine, which is available in pediatrics, but not adults. For COVID, it's important to, repeat, um, to complete their vaccine course. Uh, just highlighting here the pneumonia vaccine uh, series. One can give the PCV13 followed eight weeks later by PPSV23 and so on from there. I just want to highlight the slide about the timeline of post-transplant infections. In the early post-transplant phase, it's more nosocomial and surgical infections at the surgical site, wound, lines, UTIs, Foley catheter. And as time goes on, that's when we start seeing more of the opportunistic infections reactivating in terms of viruses, fungi, bacteria, and parasites. So um, in the interest of time, I may have to cut a few slides short, but this is essentially adapted from the guidelines, and this is what post-transplant prophylaxis for kidney transplant in Pakistan may look like. For living donors, um, for prophylaxing against bacterial, PJP, CMV, and fungal, so for bacterial, it's really important to know the periop cultures to do directed therapy, or if those urine cultures and blood cultures are negative, to do cefazolin or perhaps piptaz if something broader is needed for 24 to 48 hours post-op. UTI prophylaxis uh, does have a role in early post-transplant if individuals have asymptomatic bacteriuria, in particular if they have retained stents or recurrent transplant UTIs and of course, latent TB therapy. Uh, for PJP, it would be Septron or uh, TMP-SMX uh, for 12 months. And for CMV, which is very important, it really comes down to uh, their risk status, whether they're high, medium, or low risk for CMV reactivation, and therefore either doing universal prophylaxis with valgancyclovir or valacyclovir versus preemptive therapy. Now for other fungal pathogens, uh, lesser of an issue for kidney transplant, for example, with um, aspergillosis, so um, not routinely indicated. I may have to keep this as my last slide, but for CMV prophylaxis, the germinants are the type of transplant, and kidney, lung, heart, and for small bowel, it should be universal. And thereafter, assessing the zero status and deciding what risk they are, and if they've received lymphocyte depleting therapy. So I'll have to skip through these slides. But essentially, what these high, the point of adding these slides regarding CMV prophylaxis was the bottom line is that valacyclovir can be used, but at very high doses. So it's not practical, expensive, and side effects. So using universal prophylaxis in our high-risk patients for CMV reactivation with val gan cyclovir provides a lot of uh, benefit in decreasing CMV reactivation. Uh, Dr. Amir, we are short of time. Okay. And I believe this would just be my uh, last slide. So 
essentially for CMV prophylaxis in the high risk setting, might be a good idea to invest in Valgan cyclovir. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amir, for uh, a very nice presentation on infection. Now we move on to the uh, last and the fourth session, uh, fourth presentation of the session. Thank you very much, sir. Without further ado, moving on to our next lecture, I'm calling Professor Lionel Rosting on the topic of immunosuppressant medications. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our chief guest who has traveled from France to attend this symposium. A huge round of applause for the professor. So thank you, Salam alaikum. First of all, I would like to warmly uh, thank uh, Dr. Rashid as well as Dr. Tasaduk for organizing this uh, first international uh, transplant symposium. So thank you. And this is my pleasure to be here with you. Uh, this is my 10th visit to Pakistan, second to Karachi. So it's always a pleasure. So uh, we're gonna talk about immunosuppression post-transplant. Indeed, uh, the lecture will give you addresses most of the patients we are dealing with, and indeed, uh, in the setting of only living uh, kidney transplant programs, you have a lot of HLA identical SIBs, and indeed, the immunosuppression for those patients are, is certainly different. But however, when you are dealing with uh, HLA aplo identical transplants, uh, the, what I'm going to talk to you applies to these patients. And indeed, you have to tailor your immunosuppression according to the patient's opportunity or availability to buy the medicines if they have to buy them. Um, well, as you know, there is no tolerance. To the best, there is accommodation for ABO incompatible transplant. We're going to see that later on in the talk. So there is no uh, tolerance. It means that apart from uh, homozygous twins, you have we have to maintain lifelong immunosuppression. And if we minimize immunosuppression for any reasons, we may end up with the apparition of uh, donor-specific alloantibodies that will end up with um, chronic antibody immune rejection. In addition to that, as you know, uh, immunosuppressive drugs have a very narrow therapeutic window, and so therefore, uh, you may end up with toxicities for sure. And uh, as you also know, the cornerstone drugs are calcineurin inhibitors, cyclosporin A or tacolimus, and as you know, tacolimus is far more important than uh, cyclosporin A. And we need to add an antiproliferative agent. This could be either Celset or azathioprine, but here again, um, Celset is far more important than azathioprine. And finally, in some cases, we can replace mTOR inhibitors for various reasons with, uh, uh, sorry, we can replace uh, anti drugs with mTOR inhibitors, but they are quite expensive, especially here. And finally, the corticoids are optional. And, well, I know that you rely on corticosteroids for your immunosuppressive regimes in your patients. However, it's really feasible to have a steroid-free protocol beyond month-free post-transplant. In my center, almost 90% of patients are off steroids after three months post-transplant. At that time, we make a protocol biopsy, and if it's normal, we win off the steroids. Okay, so what is the best immunosuppressive regime? Well, as I said, most likely is to give tacolimus plus uh, mycophenolic acid with or without steroids, but uh, you have to tailor it to the patient uh, possibility of affording the medicines, and this could be replaced um, by, uh, by cyclosporine and azathioprine, even though the results are slightly less good. So, uh, as you know, we have to target the immune system, the T cells, the B cells, the plasma cells. <clears throat> And indeed, uh, we can give a cocktail of immunosuppressive drugs because the immune system is redundant. And to avoid the escape of the immune system to the immunosuppressive drugs, it's better to give a triple immunosuppressive regime. Conversely, in the liver transplant setting, for example, you may have a, a single drug uh, as your maintenance immunosuppressive regime with uh, uh, tacolimus, for example. So we give a cocktail of drugs to block the uh, calcineurin uh, pathway to block the uh, nucleotide synthesis. So
So what is the best immunosuppressive regime? So indeed, we have all in mind the symphony trial. The symphony trial was a very uh, large um, randomized control trial that was conducted in 2000, uh, was published in 2004, in which uh, more than 1,600 patients were randomized to receive either um, tacolimus, cyclosporine, or serolimus in low dose with anti-CD25 monoclonal antibody induction, as compared to one group who received high dose of cyclosporine plus uh, MMF without induction therapy. And the primary endpoint was the um, biopsy proven acute rejection rate. So there were four arms, and as you can see, the targeted values for cyclosporine, the pointer is not working, and for TAC and serolimus were low. So the primary endpoint was the acute rejection rate at one year, and the lowest BPR rate was observed in the tacolimus group, the uh, orange uh, columns, Whereas for the cyclosporine A group, so there are two groups with or without induction, and you see the BPAR rate was around 25%, and induction did not change in those, uh, with cyclosporine the rate of BPAR. And with serolimus, well, one third of the patients had BPAR, so it's not a good idea to give serolimus based therapy without CNIs. Three years down the road, uh, with regards to uh, the probability of graft survival, which is a very uh, strong endpoint, you see the best graft survival was observed in those patients in whom immunosuppression was based on tacolimus, followed by the three other groups, including cyclosporine A. And with regards to EGFR, as you know, the EGFR one year post transplant is a good surrogate marker for long term allograft function. Uh, and you see at 12 months and also at uh, three years, the best EGFR was observed in those patients receiving TAC-based immunosuppression. So since symphony trial, in most of the centers for living and deceased kidney transplants, except for HLA identical transplants, we tend to use tacolimus-based uh, therapy. So can we do better than the symphony trial in 2022? So this was the TRANSFORM study. Uh, it was a huge randomized control trial with more than uh, 2,000 de novo kidney transplant patients in whom immunosuppression was based either on full dose of TAC or cyclo plus MMF plus steroids or reduced dose of TAC or cyclo plus, redu plus reduced dose of everolimus plus um, steroids. And all the patients received, almost all, received induction therapy with either um, ATG or Simulect. And the primary endpoint was a composite endpoint at one year, that was the rate of treated BPAR and EGFR lower than 50. So that is the higher the endpoint, the worse the outcome. So with regards to the endpoint at one year and two year, this was very similar. So at the, at the end of the day, we can say that uh, CNI plus MMF equates a uh, low dose of CNIs plus everolimus-based therapy. The EGFR was actually similar across the two groups. And with regards to uh, wound healing issues, lymphocyl, and so forth, they were slightly more important with everolimus. Why is that? Because mTOR inhibitors do inhibit, or sorry, do interfere with uh, healing processes. So this is a bottom line concern. And finally, with regards to um, infectious complications, we were just uh, had a talk about viral infections. Well, as you can see, with regards to CMV infection, BK virus infection, they were significantly lower in those patients in whom uh, the MMF uh, was replaced by mTOR inhibitors. So uh, we know that mTOR inhibitors do prevent, to some extent, the reactivation of uh, certain viruses. And finally, with regards to the de novo synthesis of donor-specific antibodies, which is a uh, uh, bad point for sure, this was very similar across the two groups. So at the end of the day, uh, the two regimes were similar with regards to efficacy, side effects, and maybe less viral infections with uh, having Certican uh, on board. So the take-home messages are, well, they are equivalent for sure, TAC-based plus MMF or low CNIs plus, um, plus M2 inhibitors. So what about induction therapy? So indeed, uh, 
where in, for your patients who are using uh, induction therapy in some cases when they are HLA sensitized or when they are HLA mismatched, uh, six on six, for example. And you can use either ATG or basiliximab. Uh, the thing is that with regards to having uh, or to dealing with only living uh, kidney transplants, you may start your immunosuppressive regime, TAC, MPA, steroids, pre-transplant one week ahead, and you can skip, in many cases, induction therapy. So this treatment is aimed at uh, inducing a very rapid immunosuppressive state, and this is directed mostly against uh, lymphocytes and it is always associated with high dose of steroids in order to avoid having uh, acute rejection within the first or two weeks uh, post-transplant. And so we have the T-cell depleting agents, phimoglobulins, graphalon, both of them are available in Pakistan. We may replace them by lemtuzumab. It's only available in UK, in, uh, in um, the US. It's not available in France, nor here. Or Indeed, we can use non-depleting T-cell agents, and nowadays it's only basiliximab that is available, and B-cell depleting agents such as rituximab or uh, obetunuzumab are only used when there, is, there are DSS pre-transplant against the donor, or when the husband is the donor to the wife, and she's already sensitized against us, but even though she has no DSA against him, but she has memory B cells. And in that scenario, I think it's very important to give rituximab pretransplant in order to avoid ABMR. So, what are the evidence for using either basiliximab or ATG uh, as induction therapy? So there have been some uh, registry studies and also some meta-analysis, and. With regards to this meta-analysis, the risk of BPAR and the risk of delayed graft function was similar regardless using either ATG or uh, basiliximab induction therapy. But in most of the cases, the studies, either from the US or from, uh, or from uh, Europe, were dealing with deceased donors. Uh, the risk of graft loss is similar as well as the risk of patient death. So this is very important. And with regards to the risk of infection and to the risk of neoplasm, it's significantly higher for those having had ATG as compared to those having uh, basiliximab. So at the end of the day, the efficacy of, the, of induction uh, ATG versus basiliximab is similar, at least in uh, low and intermediate risk patients, but the risk of infection and neoplasm is maybe slightly more important. So this was a meta-analysis. This is the European registry published uh, some years ago, not far away, by Gerhard Oppelz. And he addressed in more than 3,000, uh, more than that, uh, almost 5,000 patients, uh, the three-year graft survival, death sensor graft survival, patient survival, and treated BPAR in low to intermediate risk patients having had either ATG or Simulac induction, and you see there is no difference at all across the two induction therapies. Okay, so this is a study that we published, uh, we performed in France, a randomized control trial in highly sensitized patients. So the PRA was high, but they had no DSA, okay? And the patients randomized received either ATG or daclizumab. Daclizumab is an anti-CD25 monoclonal antibody, just like basiliximab, but it's no longer available for kidney transplant recipients. It's on, uh, okay. And so you can see that there were twice as much uh, BPAR in those having had uh, daclizumab as compared to ATG. For, so for sure, for highly sensitized patients, it's better to use ATG. And, okay. So at the end of the day, uh, does it, do, we know, do we need induction therapy? Well, at least in highly sensitized patients. But for uh, non-sensitized patients, as you can use uh, your standard immunosuppression, one week pre-transplant, you may skip induction therapy and you may save money like that. So what about the use of m inhibitors? Very quickly, uh, we've got two, two drugs, serolimus and neverolimus. I know that they are available in Pakistan. And uh, at the end of the day, the benefits of this drug resides mostly in preventing um, CMV infection, BK virus infection, 
and also to reduce the relapse of skin cancers uh, when it occurs post-transplant. As you know, in Australia, in Northern Europe, skin cancer is, is a big issue and people can die of metastatic skin cancers. So this was a study that we performed a few years back in France that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in which we randomized the patients who have had uh, recurrent skin cancers post-transplant to be converted to serolimus or to be maintained on uh, CNI. And what we found at two years and at five years post-transplant is that the replacement of CNI by serolimus in those patients with skin cancers, relapsing skin cancers, was able to prevent or to reduce, sorry, the recurrence of uh, skin cancers in the long run, and also to decrease the risk of uh, pre-cancers. Uh, pre, uh, uh, pre so, I mentioned that uh, M2 inhibitors were able to prevent, to some extent, um, CMV infection. So, the evidence is based on that study from Brazil. In Brazil, valgancyclovir is not reimbursed by the healthcare system, and so therefore the patients are not given uh, valgancyclovir as a prophylaxis. And in that study, from the biggest transplant center in Sao Paulo, Brazil, they randomized the patients to receive uh, either TAC plus uh, MMF plus basiliximab, or to receive TAC plus reduced dose of Everimus, with ATG or basiliximab induction. So the question was, is uh, the replacement of MMF by Everolimus is able to prevent, to some extent, uh, CMV reactivation? And the answer was yes. You see, those patients who have had uh, MMF plus basiliximab had a very high rate of CMV reactivation, 40%, okay? Conversely, those in whom our MMF was replaced by Everolimus with either basiliximab or ATG induction and significantly and a huge reduce in CMV reactivation. So indeed, by itself, uh, Everolimus instead of MMF is able to prevent CMV reactivation. And so I would like to finish with uh, Belataset. So it's not available in Pakistan yet, uh, but maybe one day. And it's a fascinating drug. So I contribute to the development of uh, Belataset through randomized control trial within the last 10 years. So Belataset, it's a fusion protein that interferes with uh, T cell activation. And so therefore, it, will re it replaces uh, the CNIs. The half-life is quite long, and so therefore, we infuse it every, every month. So it's given at the place of CNIs, as I said, in addition to either MMF or Everolimus. And it's not nephrotoxic, and so this is very important. And we are dealing with deceased donors. And in Western Europe, two-thirds of the deceased donors are expanded criteria donor, that is to say beyond the age of 60 or 65. And so therefore, these kinase are of poor quality, and therefore, at the end of the day, the GFR is not that good. And so therefore, to use this non-nephrotoxic drug in that setting is quite important. But also in the setting, as you would see, in uh, the setting of living uh, kidney donation. And we also use Belatacept uh, not only in de novo setting, but in conversion trial. We have patients who develop authentically um, CNI nephrotoxicity in the long run. So you make a biopsy, so a patient has a creeping serum creatinine, you make a biopsy, there is a CNI related toxicity, there are no DSS around. And so in this scenario, if you do nothing, the patient will develop end stage renal disease. And we can halt the process by replacing at this uh, point CNIs by Belatacept. So it, uh, its effect is through interfering with the CD28, CD80, 86 pathway. And at the end of the day, this will prevent T cell activation. And so there were two benefit studies. These were so called um, benefit and benefit X studies. These were uh, randomized control trial, phase three studies. So in one study, uh, we were using uh, either standard criteria deceased donors or living related donors, okay? So the best kidneys. In the other one, Benefit X, we were using expanded criteria donors, the worst kidneys, okay? And so from the beginning, the patients were having either cyclosporine A plus MMF plus steroids or Belatacept in two different dosing, uh, less intensive and more extensive. 
As you can see at the very beginning, there was uh, uh, the infusion uh, was quite frequent, and all the patients received basiliximab induction therapy. Uh, okay, and so this is a seven-year study, seven year. And what it demonstrated with regards to patient and graft survival is, was that beyond three years post-transplant, there was a huge uh, benefit for having beletacet uh, instead of a cyclosporin A. And what is really amazing is for those kidneys who have never seen CNIs, those one, they have never seen CNI, there is an increase in EGA4 for more, well, you see up to four years post-transplant. Just when you retrieve a kidney from a donor, the remaining kidney is increasing in size and is, uh, is hyperfiltration to compensate uh, the retrieval of the other kidney. This is the same thing that we see with Belatacet. Conversely, for those who are on cyclosporine, this is prevented by the CNI, and so therefore the EGA4 is stable and thereafter declined. And so this is really amazing. However, there were significantly more acute rejection with Belatacep, so it is slightly less efficient than CNIs, but in the long run, this does not impact uh, graft survival. And finally, Belatacep is able to... If there's no questions, then we can proceed for the shield distribution. Uh, uh, before we proceed for the tea, uh, since there's no question, I will... Uh, from the experts, I will congratulate the, uh, there is one question, madam. Assalamu alaikum, good morning everyone. I am uh, Professor Nusrat Shah uh, from Dow University of Health Sciences. Uh, thank you Professor uh, Ross Tang for that excellent and very informative and very interesting talk about uh, immunosuppression during kidney transplant. Um, I was very interested to hear when you talked about the husband being a donor of uh, a renal transplant. So uh, I would like to know your data from France. What is your experience? How many husbands donate their kidneys for their wives? Because uh, in Pakistan, I don't think uh, we have much data or maybe I am not aware. I've never heard a husband donating a kidney for their wife or vice versa also because we always thought the matching, uh, the tissue matching may not be very uh, effective when the uh, couples are donating for each other. Okay, so thank you for your question, which is very important. When a, w a wife is donating to her husband, there are no uh, immunological issues, so we're on the safe side. When the wife is donating to the husband, well, even, well, the HD matching is poor, but there is no immunological issues because the husband is not sensitized against the wife. Conversely, when, a, uh, when the husband is donating to the wife, through pregnancies or miscarriages, uh, she's sensitized by definition against the husband. Even though she has no DSA currently or no PRA, she has memory B cells committed uh, to the HLA uh, types of the husband, and she has plasma cells committed to HLA type. And so, in France we have had, not a couple, but quite a lot of ABMRs, post-transplant, that were only related to a recall immune response against the husband, which is normal, for sure. And because of this memory B cells were around, I think it's, it's wise when possible, in order to avoid post-transplant ABMR to give rituximab pre-transplant, and it's what we are doing, even though they don't have a circulating PRA. They are sensitized 100% for sure. So it's just a, a word of caution, because uh, if you end up with ABMR post-transplant, and I know that there are ABMR post-transplant all across the world, I think it's better to prevent when it's possible. Thank you very much, sir. I'm asking now uh, Dr. Ahmed Usmani for the conclusion and remarks for this session. Thank you very much. It was an excellent session. And before we conclude, I must congratulate the uh, Dow University of Health Sciences that under the dynamic uh, leadership of uh, Professor Said Qureshi, the team has done a wonderful job with restricted resources in a very short period of five years only, they have done a remarkable job by doing 500 renal transplants, which is very commendable. 
Thank you very much. Also, there's a gift for uh, the panel of speakers uh, from the Renal Transplant Unit. Secondly, Dr. Professor Ijaz. I'm asking Dr. Kiran Nasser now. Thank you. From the panel of speakers, uh, I'm asking Professor Fazal Akhtar to uh, come on stage and receive his field. Next, uh, I'm asking Dr. Rashid to receive a shield from the Vice Chancellor. Next, I'm asking Professor Asim to receive his shield and the gift. Next is Dr. Uh, Dr. Amir. <laughs> Lastly, but not the least, Professor Lionel Rosting. Now it's time for the tea break, uh, and we will meet you. Okay, okay. I'm asking Professor M. H. Usmani to present the shield to the Honorable Vice Chancellor. Please, distinguished delegates, please be seated so that we can start our second session. Now, we would like to invite the second panel of experts for this session. <coughs> I request Professor Kamar Naveed and Professor Sumbal Nasir to please come on stage and take your seats, please. I request Professor Ashar Alam to come on stage as a panel of experts, please. I request Dr. Sabah to come on stage and uh, present her uh, talk, please. I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Sabah. She is our chief immunologist who has started the renal transplant program in Dow University Hospital. So she is our backbone. So please give her a big applaud. Please come on the stage, Dr. Sabah. Thank you, Dr. Tasadu. Bismillah rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you. Dr. Sabaha Sarfraz, I am basically an immunologist serving Dow University of Health Sciences as assistant professor. So I am extremely thankful to the organizing committee who has given me uh, an opportunity to share my experience in front of uh, esteemed uh, you know, uh, faculty from multiple uh, dis disciplines. I'll be talking about immunological perspective of renal transplant pathology. 
what is transplant immunology, rejection mechanism, types of rejection, MHC molecules. I'll talk, uh, discuss the immunological workup which we are doing in our lab and tolerance. Why is it important to know about transplantation? A procedure which was rare in the past is becoming more common with the passage of time. And there is a growing need of uh, organs for transplantation. Dr. Rashid has already informed us the mag magnitude of uh, required transplantation and what, the, uh, what we are doing is quite lesser than what is the number which is actually required. Today, we are aware of many facts which are related to transplant immunology. We know that the main obstacle is our own immune system, which provide profound function of self-defense. But we need to explore more facts related to rejection, especially the molecular mechanism in order to establish tolerance, which is immunological unresponsiveness, the ultimate goal of renal transplantation. Major obstacles for a successful renal transplantation are graft rejection, adverse effects due to lifelong immunosuppressive agents, lack of reservoir organs, and donor-specific antibodies, especially in higher titer, which are difficult to manage even with a strong desensitization protocols. Transplant immunology basically is a sequence of events that occur when a graft is transplanted from the donor into the recipient. Graft rejection is the main hurdle for successful transplantation. MHC molecules are target for strong and rapid rejection reactions. If you talk about the mechanism of rejection, basically divided into humoral and cellular, but T cells play a very important role in both of them. Rejection reaction is again divided into two, two stages, a sensitization and a effector stage. In sensitization stage, basically CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells recognize Allo antigens from the graft via T cell receptors. This presentation of allogenic MHC molecules to the receptor T cells can occur via two pathways. It could be a direct path, uh, pathway or indirect. This direct pathway leads to uh, acute rejection, which is mainly mediated via CD8 positive T cells. Whereas indirect pathway is mostly responsible for chronic rejection and mediated by CD4 positive T cells. So here is the diagram. What is the difference between the direct and indirect pathway? In direct pathway, donor APCs present donor antigens to recipient T cells. Whereas in indirect pathway, the recipient antigen presenting cells present donor antigen to recipient T cells. So, uh, as long as the graph is there, the recipient uh, antigen presenting cells uh, pick up those shedding allo antigens from the graph and they initiate the allo immune response. And this is the basis of the uh, lifelong uh, maintain requirement of maintenance immunosuppression and to prevent uh, late and chronic rejection. So this was all about the sensitization. If we talk about the effectors phase, then T cells play a very important role. T cell activation requires three signals, signal one, signal two, and signal three. Signal one is basically allo recognition in which it recognizes the graph antigens. Signal two is basically about co-stimulatory molecules, most common CD80 and 86 on antigen presenting cells which bind to the receptor on T cells, and signal three is cytokine mediated. Once T cells 
receive these signals, then signal transduction takes place. It activates a number of phosphatases and um, different pathways are activated, transcription factors is activated, which ultimately leads to production of interleukin-2. Once interleukin-2 is produced, it plays an important role in activating a large number of cells which are the effectors of the effector stage, like Th cells, helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, and cells of the innate immune system like NK cells. So to sum up, we have a sensitization phase, we have allorecognition, direct and indirect pathways, and then we have an effector phase depending on the type of the pathway. They could activate B cells to produce antibodies against the graph. Then they could produce CD4 T cells, which mediates delay type hypersensitivity reaction, or CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells may be activated. Depending upon the duration post transplantation, and uh, uh, characteristic histological features, rejection is uh, classically divided into hyperacute, acute, and chronic. Hyperacute rejection occurs because of preformed antibodies in the recipient. As soon as the graph is transplanted, they attack the endothelium, activate classic, classical component of complement pathway, and leads to inflammation and thrombosis in the vasculature. Unfortunately, an incurable outcome. Acute rejection can be T cell mediated or antibody mediated. It is characterized by endotheliolitis and is largely, it can be reversible. Chronic rejection is mainly uh, mediated via CD4 T cells and it uh, basically causes ray type hypersensitivity reaction Especially in the uh, small vessels, it causes the uh, uh, smooth muscle proliferation, which ultimately leads to the vascular occlusion. Major histocompatibility complex, also known as human leukocyte antigen, basically they, uh, this complex is pro present on the sixth short arm of the chromosome number six, and they are divided into class one, class two, and class three, class one, and class two plays an important role in transplantation. Class three encodes proteins which are members of the complement pathway. So basically, MHC molecules has got a very interesting uh, history. In 1940s, it was discovered by George Snell, and they discovered these MHC molecules as a transplant antigen during their uh, work in mice or for uh, skin, uh, skin grafting experiments. Even at that time, the immunologists were puzzled why a set of antigens is reserved for such an uncommon procedure. So they keep on researching on it. It took more than decades to actually find, find, find out the actual role of M MHC molecule, which is basically um, regulation of immune responses, especially against protein antigens. They present process peptide antigens, especially to T cells. Is mo they are most polymorphic genetic system. And uh, basically, molecular HLA typing is performed to assess the tissue compatib compatibility between donor and recipient. When transplant was were per uh, performed in uh, actually identical individuals, even they got uh, they got uh, they suffered from rejection, and this uh, uh, finding uh, led to the uh, you know thinking or the understanding that okay, non HLA antigens are also there, which are equally important in causing graft rejection. So amongst them, ABO blood group antigen is the most prominent, which is um, not only present in the RBCs, but also present on the endothelium. It may cause hyperacute rejection, whereas rhesus factor is basically not involved in transplant rejection. Apart from them, we have a list of other non-HLA antigens 
like HY antigens. And this is problematic when a uh, organ is transplanted from a male donor to a female recipient because of the differences of the uh, proteins and genes uh, uh, which are present in, on the Y chromosome. Other non-HLA antigens include MHC class 1 related chain A, MIC A and MIC B. We are also, um, you know, performing this assay in our laboratory. Angiotensin 2 receptor and endothelial antigens play an important role in acute reje rejection and certain mitochondrial proteins and enzymes are also there. Even healthy individuals may contain certain amount of anti-HLA antibodies. These antibodies increase in uh, special conditions like multiple blood transfusions in females with multiple pregnancies, previous transplant, and infections. So basically, transplant immunological workup comprises of ABO blood typing, tissue typing, and anti antibody screening, including both HLA and non-HLA antigens. And last but not the least is cross-matching. So this is the journey of the patient towards the transplantation. We type the donor, we perform HLA typing of the donor and the recipient. We go for, uh, we characterize the uh, recipient for the presence or absence of anti-HLA antibodies. Then we go for the cross match. If it is negative, then the patient is proceeded for the transplantation. In certain cases, uh, when the patient has historic positive uh, CDC before transplant or and had anti-HLA antibodies, we do also monitor their titer post-transplant, but not in every individual. ABO compatibility follows the same rule as for blood transfusion. HLA matching class 1 includes HLA A, B, and C, mostly present in nucleated cells. Class 2, DP, DQ, DR, present on antigen-presenting cells. Basically, degree of HLA mismatch plays a very important role in determining the risk of rejection graph loss. We in our most laboratories are performing HLA A, B, and DR. We are also going with the same. But many centers are also performing HLA DP, DQ, and HLA C. And uh, researchers are coming up that antibodies against these antigens are also Im important in causing rejection. So basically, major impact comes from the match of the DR antigen followed by HLA-B and for then next is HLA-A. We go for tissue typing methods. We are performing sequence-specific oligonucleotide probe. We have a 3D lab scanner because of time constraint. I have to just uh, show you the pictures of these. It we have a 3D lab scan. It works on the principle of luminix. Uh, XMAP technology, which assess more than 500 analytes in one go. We are performing SSO. This is how we uh, do HLA typing. Cross match, CDC cross match. And the, I would like to just end with the uh, virtual cross match. We are all doing basically, uh, HLA lab is not just a tissue typing lab. It Rather, it, one, uh, it is one which provides a uh, sophisticated moral risk assessment provides help in acute door and recipient typing and pro for the better patient management post transplant thank you thank you ma'am for your valuable information moving forward i'd like to request our second speaker professor salman Azayas, to kindly come on stage and please deliver his lecture on medical issues in renal transplant Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tasadduk and uh, Dr. Rashid, Sheikh, Rashid Hamid for arranging such a nice uh, symposium on the renal transplantation after a long pause of uh, any academic activity in this domain for the last couple of years. Uh, I really congratulate all of the DHS team for arranging this symposium and, uh, uh, and, and, and allow us to, to talk on, on these important topics. Uh, my name is Dr. Salman Imtiaz, and uh, I'm going to discuss some of the problem of the uh, medical problem which come across with the patient while dealing with the patient with the renal transplantation. Okay, uh, we all know that the kidney transplant uh, transplantation is the best uh, treatment option for the patient with kidney failure. 
Uh, it not only improved the quality of life, uh, but also improved the survival of the patient on the maintenance hemodialysis. And it is also the most cost-effective treatment strategy for those who are needing the renal replacement therapy. Uh, in this connection, if you compare the, the mortality of the patient which are on hemodialysis uh, as compared with the patient who are on the waiting list of the transplantation, along with the patient who have a, trans, uh, have a kidney transplantation, uh, in this uh, large cohort of about 228,000 uh, patients, out of which uh, 46,000 patients were on the waiting list, and 23,000 patient, 23, patients were all having the first cadaveric transplant between 91 and 297. And uh, it was concluded that the, the long-term uh, mortality, uh, the long-term the long uh, mortality rate was, uh, was 48 to 82 percent lower among the transplant uh, recipients. Uh, this this improved, uh, cardio improved uh, mortality is mostly attributed to the cardiovas reduced cardiovascular uh, uh, events in the, in the patient who have kidney transplantation as compared with the patient who are on hemodialysis and on the peritoneal dialysis. And you can see this, there, is an, there is an improvement in all domain of, uh, of spectrum of the, of the cardiovascular disease ranging from the acute myocardial infarction and the arrhythmias and the peripheral skeletal disease and so on. Uh, Despite this improved uh, survival uh, and improved uh, 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 events in the cardiovascular mortality, there is still high prevalence of the pre-existing uh, as well as de novo uh, cardiovascular risk factor, for example, hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and the smoking in, the in, in, in these patients. Along with this, there are non-traditional uh, risk factors, for example, the metabolic uh, effect of the immunosuppression, uh, chronic anemia, homocystinemia, chronic inflammation, proteinuria, and chronic allograph nephropathy. Uh, both of these uh, traditional and non-traditional risk factors pose an uh, entire spectrum of the cardiovascular disease ranging from the coronary artery disease, heart failure, valvulopathy, cerebrovascular disease, pulmonary hypertension, and the cardiac arrhythmias. Now, if you took hypertension as a risk factor, we all know that the post-transplant hypertension is both result and the cause of the kidney allograft dysfunction. And it is as associ associated with an adverse uh, outcome and the premature cardiovascular related mortality. And the post-transplant treatment target should probably, probably be similar to those with the CKD population, which has not been uh, well studied up till now. And there are no trials in the post-transplant patient comparing the different blood pressure targets. So in uh, connection with the, with, with, the, with the increased mortality due to the blood pressure, this uh, uh, trial was uh, conducted in a, uh, which is a post hoc analysis of the folic acid uh, vascular outcome reduction in the transplant patient. And this, uh, uh, this cohort uh, comprises of about 3,000 uh, patients and uh, most of, uh, with, a, with a mean age of with a mean age of 52 uh, years, mostly were uh, male. And uh, after the adjustment for the demographic and the, and the, trans, uh, and the transplant um, characteristic and the cardiovascular risk factor, each 20 mm of Ag increase in the baseline systolic uh, blood pressure associated with a 32% increase in the subsequent cardiovascular risk and, uh, and, and, and a 13% increase in the mortality risk. Similarly, the, the Similarly, after adjustment at the diastolic blood pressure of less than 70 mm of Ag, each 10 mm of Ag decrease in the diastolic blood pressure level uh, associated with a 31% increase in the cardiovascular risk and a 31% increase in the, in the, in the mortality. Uh, the study was concluded that the higher systolic blood pressure is strongly and independently associated with the increased uh, risk of the cardiovascular and all cardiovascular mortality. Uh, steroid and uh, cyclosporin are, uh, are, are the main culprit of the, of the blood pressure in the post-transplant patient. And so most of the center uh, used to, 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 uh, to opt the protocols of the steroid avoidance or the steroid withdrawal. So in this uh, meta-analysis, In this meta-analysis, which uh, included about 34 studies uh, of about more than 5,000 patients, 
there was no uh, there was uh, in, in the steroid avoidance and the, and 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 the withdrawal regimes there was a significantly increased risk of the acute rejection uh, but uh, along with this there was a significant redu re reduction in the significantly reduced uh, uh, incidence of the cardiovascular risk factor like hypertension new onset of the diabetes and hypercholesteremia uh, cyclosporin is also one of the main cause of the hypertension in, 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 in the transplant patient and in this connection uh, most of the center replaced the balatacept with the, with, with the cyclosporin. Uh, in this systemic, uh, systematic review which included about six uh, randomized trials, uh, was uh, and, and, and the CNI having the same uh, uh, incidence of the rejection at the 12 months uh, of the transplant, but there was a significant improve in the in the in the graph function at the 12 month of the post transplant, and on and on the same side, there is a significant improvement in the in in, in all the metabolic prof profile. Like for example, a well controlled blood pressure, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, and triglyceride were all in, 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 a, in, a, uh, in a better uh, 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 level with the patient who, had, who were on the ballot asset. Uh, dyslipidemia is, 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 is a risk for the atherogenic uh, uh, cardiovascular disease and it is highly prevalent in the transplant patient due to various reasons like for example, they have, they, they, they have comorbid conditions like obesity and the post-transplant diabetes, proteinuria and, along, and the immunosuppression. Uh, so in this uh, alert trial, which is, uh, which is uh, and this trial is an, uh, is an extension and the long-term uh, follow-up of the patient who are on the, on the statin and on the placebo. And uh, in this uh, study, uh, this, this, uh, the, the, which included about 1,000, more than uh, 1,700 patients, which were followed for 6.7 years. And uh, uh, it was evident so it was uh, the, the patient who were on statin, there was a marked improvement in, in, the, in the cardiac and the non-fatal MI and the cabbage, while, while uh, patient, uh, there was a no, no significant difference uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the vascular outcome for like cerebrovascular events, non-cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality. Uh, Post-transplant diabetes is also an important risk factor for the for the for the for the patient who have kidney transplantation, and uh, there is an association of early uh, rise of the of the blood glucose on the long-term mortality. And in this uh, study, uh, which included about uh, more than uh, which about, about 1,400 patients, and in in this study, the patient were. Uh, were uh, at the 10 week of the post transplant OGTT was was performed and the patient were divided into those who have normal glucose tolerance and the uh, impaired glucose tolerance and the impaired fasting glucose as well as uh, uh, as well as the the, the post transplant diabetes and uh, if we if we, if there is a, there was a significant uh, increase in the mortality for the patient who has uh, PTDM and uh, impaired glucose tolerance as compared with those who have normal glucose tolerance. Obesity uh, is, uh, is, is also uh, uh, having a direct impact on the patient survival as well as the graph survival. And uh, in, as in the general population is also having a pose a risk of, uh, of death in these patients. Uh, in this study, which included about 51,000 patients, there was a there was a u shape uh, uh, curve uh, which uh, relation between the risk of the graph lo loss and the body mass index and uh, uh, there is a mortality in, in, in both side of the patient patient who have a, a bmi of less than uh, 22 and the patient who has a bmi of more than 36 similarly the, there is an association uh, which is u shape association between the bmi and the death with a functioning graph and the patient who has lower bmi are, 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 the, are, are on the same risk as the patient who has a higher BMI. Now come to, to the malignancies, which is, a, is the second most important uh, uh, problem and the leading cause of the death in the transplant uh, uh, patient in most of the Western countries. 
and cancer is one of the most feared complications associated with the immunosuppression after kidney transplantation. Uh, the overall risk of the cancer is higher for certain type of the cancer as compared uh, to the age and the, and the sex med general population. For example, like Kaposi sarcoma is significantly higher in the renal transplant patient followed by the non-melanoma -melan skin cancer, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, renal cell carcinoma and thyroid uh, while the other cancer are, are as similar as in the general population. Uh, the overall risk of the cancer related death is higher for the certain cancer type compared to the age, uh, age sex and the general uh, uh, population and most of the patient uh, died due to the non-Hodgkin lymphoma and renal cell carcinoma and, and melanoma and the risk of death is similar uh, with the other cancer as in the general population. Uh, there are many reasons for the higher cancer risk in the transplant patient and some are the traditional risk factor like for example increasing age, male sex, smoking and the prolonged sun exposure uh, which is as in the general population but there are few uh, But there are, there are the risk factors which, which come after the, uh, after the renal transplantation like for example immunosuppression use especially the T cell depleting agent acute rejection uh, of, of the patient, sensitization status of the patient, and the duration of the dialysis before transplantation. Uh, the duration of dialysis is, is, is an important risk factor also. And, and as we know that, that the increasing creatinine or the declining creatinine clearance is directly have an impact on the incidence of the cancer in this population. So uh, in this study, which is performed uh, in a very large population, which is more than one million patient were being studied, uh, uh, studied and uh, there were 76,000 incident uh, cancer in 72,000 subjects and uh, okay uh, so in overall cancer uh, uh, occurrence the renal cell carcinoma is directly associated with the with the decline in the, in the in the renal function and the patient who have a, a creatinine clearance of less than 30 having a profound risk of the of, of, of the renal cell car scan cancer uh, the other cancer is the urothelial cancer which is also related with the with the with the with the creatinine clearance but the prostatic cancer colorectal cancer lung cancer and the female breast cancer have the equal incidence as in the general uh, other population there is a definite geographical uh, variation in the cancer. For example, the observational and the registry data from the Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand indicate most common cancer types are the non-melanoma non skin cancer, PTLD, and the lip cancer. While in contrast, uh, the data from the non-Western Asian and the Middle Eastern tra uh, transplant cohort suggests the higher incidence of urothelial uh, transitional car cell carcinoma, renal cell carcinoma, and gastrointestinal cancer in their pop population. And hepatocellular carcinoma, for example, is, is, is in a highly prevalent in Taiwan due to the high inc incidence of the hepatitis B. Uh, I will come to the local data uh, of the transplantation. Ah. Uh, the, the SIUT publishes uh, data of 22-year experience uh, of the post-transplant, uh, in, in the post-transplant patients. And in this uh, study, um, and they evaluated 1,816 patients out of which 44 uh, developed malignancy. And the most common uh, malignancy was the lymphoma, which occurs in 61% of the patient, followed by the Kaposi sarcoma, which occurs in 25% of the patient. non melanotic skin cancer, uh, followed by the adenocarcinoma, carcinoma in situ of the conjunctiva, acute malai liquia, and seminoma. Uh, the patient who have lymphoma in 27 renal patient, the site of the of the of, of the uh, cancer was mostly in the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, for example, 14 patient developed the, the the cancer in the in in the large intestine. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Moving onwards to the third lecture of this section, I'd like to request Professor Lionel Rosing to please come and enlighten us on the topic of rejection in kidney transplant. Thank you. Okay, so you just have had a talk about uh, immune responses in the setting of uh, uh, transplantation. This was a very nice presentation. Thank you. No worries, she. 
so I will talk about rejections of kidney transplantation. So it will cover uh, acute rejection as well as chronic rejection. As you know, a chronic antibody-mediated rejection is the first cause of allograft loss after death. The first cause of allograft loss is the, the death of a patient with functioning graft, and second cause of allograft loss is chronic ABMR. So, uh, is it still a problem, acute rejection? With regards to T-cell mediated rejection, it's quite rare, provided that the patients have had all the medicines that were required pre and post transplant. So it's less than 10% of patients. But it also can occur in patients in whom adherence to the treatment, whatsoever the reason, is poor. Okay? Or if a physician attempts to minimize immunosuppression for cost issues, for example, and this can uh, result in acute TCMR. And in Acute TCMR, it's, uh, it's easily reversible provided methyl prednisolone pulses. And very rarely, you need to give ATG, antifamicide globulins, in order to reverse an acute TCMR. Con With regards to antibody mediated rejection, this is related to the presence of circulating anti donor specific allo antibodies. In most of the cases, it's anti HLA antibodies that have been missed pre transplant because uh, when you perform a CDC cross match and nothing else, you may miss a lot of donor specific allo antibodies that have been picked up by flow cross match or by uh, Luminex testing. I recognize that luminous te te uh, testing is very expensive in Pakistan, but you can have a surrogate marker for Luminex by using a flow cross match pre transplant. And so, this ABMR, acute ABMR, are reversible provided you implement plasma pheresis, uh, steroid pulses, and rituximab. You need to have rituximab in your recipe in order to kill the memory B cells, and IVIG are, are useless, expensive and useless, useless, useless. Um, well, okay, so acute, a, uh, acute TCMR or acute ABMR are quite reversible. Conversely, a chronic rejection, it's a difficult task. Well, we may have chronic active TCMR. It means that patients who have a creeping serum creatinine, you make a biopsy and you find mostly chronic T-cell mediated rejection. It's a rare condition. It's related to suboptimal immunosuppression whatsoever the cause, and it's uh, treatable by uh, methylprednisolone pulses. But it's a very rare condition. Conversely, as I said, anti-chronic antibody mediated rejection is the first cause of allograft loss, and this chronic antibody mediated rejection can be either inactive, you make a biopsy, you find no activations within the biopsy, or it could be active chronic antibody mediated rejection. And if you do nothing, the patient will lose the graft. And this is related to the presence of circulating donor-specific anti-HLA antibodies. And indeed, uh, it's not commonly um, assessed in Pakistan because cost issues for sure. But you can have a surrogate marker for circulating DSA by just making a flow cross match whenever you want post transplant in order to see that there are circulating DSAs. And at present, we can stabilize chronic ABMR by using IL-6 blockade agents. I will show you that later on. Okay, so I, I, I guess the next uh, talk will be dedicated for uh, renal histopathology in the setting of kidney transplantation, and uh, the speaker will tell you about BANF classification, which is mandatory in order to classify the T-cell mediated, the uh, antibody uh, uh, mediated rejection and so forth, and chronic lesions and uh, acute lesions. Okay, so a typical case of uh, acute ABMR. So this was, the recipient was a lady, she received a, a deceased kidney transplant, she was a mother of three, and she was on a waiting list, and she had no PRA, no DSA pre-transplant. She received a quite well-matched uh, transplant, even though she had three mismatches, a32, DR8, DR11, okay? 
So uh, the post-transplant follow-up was very uneventful. By day five, uh, she had a normal serum creatinine, and by day seven, she was anuric. And I, so what did happen? So we make a, a, a CDC cross-match, and it turned out to be positive. It was indeed negative pre-transplant. So it means that by day six, she had circulating donor-specific allo antibodies that make her anuric, and this DSA was directed against A32. So A32 was an uh, HLA incompatibility or mismatch, and we HLA typed the husband, and the husband was A32. So it means that she had a recalled immune response against A32 through previous pregnancies because the husband was A32. And by mischance, the deceased donor was A32. And due to this recall immune response, she has ABMR. So this is the reason why nowadays, uh, in the setting of living donation, when the uh, husband is donating to the wife, we pretreat with uh, rituximab. And the biopsy showed um, thrombotic microangiopathy, which was not related to tacrolimus, but it was indeed related to ABMR. So we treated her as such with four plasmapheresis uh, sessions followed by rituximab and we repeated that twice. And eventually she recovered and one year later her renal function is normal and the DSA has disappeared. But she's still keeping on B memory cells against A32, okay? And so, yes, this is the, uh, the very nice uh, outcome of that patient, and we did not give IVIG. IVIG are useless at treating ABMR. So what about chronic active ABMR? So this is a story of a young man. He has IgA nephropathy. He uh, had a kidney transplant, a disease kidney transplant. He was on TAC and MMF therapy. Everything was fine except the fact that he needed very often adjustments for uh, Tacrolimus because the trough levels were very hectic. And we know that this is a risk for developing de novo donor specific allo antibodies. And so in France, on a yearly basis, we assessed post transplant on a yearly basis the occurrence or the presence of donor specific allo antibodies that are de novo. And so after six years post transplant, he developed creeping serum creatinine with de novo albuminuria. The renal workup was normal, anti-HLA antibodies, uh, BK virus was negative for sure, and anti-HLA antibodies became negative, uh, became positive, sorry. And so this is the Luminex screening, it was positive, whereas the year before it was negative, and when we um, assessed the anti-HLA antibodies of class 2, there were two DSAs, one against DR11 and one uh, against DQ7. So it means that within a year, the patient has developed immune response against the donor. It's a specific immune, uh, immune B cell response against DR11 and 7. We made a biopsy and we found double contours within the glomeruli. We found glomerulitis and we found um, peritubular glomerulitis as well as interstitial uh, inflammation. And so this is the all marks of chronic active, chronic because this is beyond one year post-transplant, chronic active antibody immediate rejection. And if you do nothing, within one or two years, the patient will lose the graft. So what did we do? Indeed, because it's an immune process mediated by the B cells, you have to target the B cells, and we gave rituximab one gram once, and we placed him on tocilizumab. tocilizumab it's a monoclonal antibody, it's Actemra, it's available in Pakistan for sure. It has been used for uh, COVID-related pneumonia, but also it because it targets the IL-6 pathways, it prevents the damaging of a kidney. I will just show you, uh, this is the IL-6 pathways. So IL-6 is a cytokine that is produced by the liver, and IL-6 is able to uh, stimulate the CD4 T cells, the CD8 T cells, which are the cytotoxic ones, is able to stimulate the plasma cells, it's able to stimulate the B cells, the memory B cells, and at the end of the day also to target the endothelial cells. And by blocking this IL-6 pathway with a monoclonal antibody, Actemra, 
you block all these uh, stages and you stabilize your chronic antibody mediated rejection okay so we just come back uh, on the treatment of acute rejection okay so when you have uh, acute antibody mediated rejection what can you do we have therapies for acute ABMR. So this was the first study to demonstrate that as compared to plasma pheresis alone, if you add IVIG, you've got better results. So it means that plasma pheresis alone for treating ABMR is able to remove the antibodies. And if you add on top of that IVIG, it's better. But the most important trial was this one. It was performed in France. And so you see the patients had acute ABMR and they were given either IVIG alone, uh, left panel, or IVIG, plasma pheresis, and rituximab. And these are the DSAs as assessed by mean fluorescence intensity. You can see IVIG are doing nothing on the DSAs. Conversely, when you add plasma pheresis and rituximab, you've got a huge drop in the DSS. At the end of the day, IVRG are useless, but conversely, plasma pheresis and rituximab are the cornerstone treatment for acute ABMR. Okay, and when it comes to the graft survival, you see those patients who have had plasma pheresis, rituximab, IVIG had a very good outcome as compared to those who have had only IVIG. So forget IVIG, please. So what can you do when you've got chronic active antibody mediation? So it's a process that occurs at least one year post-transplant and that will uh, destroy the graft within a few years. So the options are either the removing of the antibodies, the DSA, donor specific antibody, by let's say apheresis, plasma pheresis, and to modify immunosuppression by using one of these uh, medications, rituximab, tocilizumab, bortezomib, and so forth. Okay, so this is the first randomized control trial in which patients having chronic ABMR plus late occurrence of donor-specific antibodies were randomized to either placed on placebo drug, so nothing special in addition to the current immunosuppressive drugs, TAC, MMF, and steroids, or bortezomib. So bortezomib, it's a drug that targets the plasma cells because the plasma cells at the end of the day will produce the antibodies. And this was a one-year trial, a two-year trial. As you can see, this is the EGFR at the beginning so in red it's bortezomib, in blue it's placebo, and you can see bortezomib is as efficient as a placebo in that setting. It's very efficient for treating multiple myeloma for sure. So death sense and graft survival, patient survival was almost similar, but there were more neurotoxicities with uh, um, bortezomib treated patients. And at the end of the day, when it comes to the MFI, which assesses the um, donor specific antibody there was no difference so forget bortezomib in the setting of chronic abmr so this is a recent uh, paper that examines the use of clatsakizumab so clatsakizumab it's not yet available it's not yet available it's a monoclonal antibody that targets il6 okay and il6 it's well it's mandatory in order to expand the immune system and in that study so the patients were randomized either to placebo i'm stuck i'm sorry oh yeah um, uh, or to clatsakizumab, and what they found, I'm stuck again, so back please. Is it possible to go back? Okay, oh. and so this is the EGFR. So this is in red, this is the EGFR for patients who have been placed on the active drug, clatsakizumab, and you see the EGFR was almost stable within two years, uh, one year. Conversely, those who were placed on placebo, there was a decrease in GFR. So blocking IL-6 pathways, it's important. So what, so in another study, patients were, uh, were randomized to receive either plasma exchange, rituximab, IVIG, or nothing special for transplant glomerulopathy. So transplant glomerulopathy, it's a condition in which you've got circulating donor-specific antibodies, and at the end of the day, this will result in the allograft loss. And what they found, 
is that in that setting of transplant glomerulopathy, if you compare nothing special, that is just to say TAC MMF versus plasmapheresis, rituximab, and IVIG, you have no difference. So it means that for chronic active ABMR, it's pointless to give a plasmapheresis, IVIG, rituximab, but instead, as I showed you, it's better to give a uh, to block IL-6 pathway. So this is the IL-6 pathway. And so this is the first study that was published from Italy uh, two years back, in which uh, patients having chronic ABMR with transplant glomerulopathy with de novo proteinuria were given uh, tocilizumab, which blocks the IL-6 receptor. Okay? And what they found was that with regards to the DSAs, they were significantly reduced, which is good. And with regards to the EGFR, it was, it was stabilized. Oh. Okay. And this is our experience that we published a few months back in which, uh, this is my center, in which we treated patients with chronic active ABMR with tocilizumab, and we treated as such 40 patients and we found that, in fact, after a year of treatment, the renal function was stabilized. However, the histological follow-up showed no statistical difference. It means that when you give tocilizumab in patients having chronic active ABMR, you stabilize your renal function in spite still having the chronic histological lesions. So it means that blocking IL-6 pathway will block uh, the immune system, which is frozen within the kidney, and you stabilize your renal function. And so I think it's very important, but it means that you, you need to give Actemra on a monthly basis to this patient. And we have patients who are treated as of four years now with Actemra, and they have a stabilization of our renal function, and I think it's, uh, it's fascinating. So Actemra is available in Pakistan. You can use it for treating a chronic active ABMR. The cost, however, is quite high. Uh, the next slide, I uh, will skip that. And when we look at the um, EGFR in our patients, you see the EGFR was really stabilized. And so therefore, at the end of the day, it's better to prevent. What does that mean? It means that you need to have, when it's possible, an adequate a chronic immunosuppressive regime. And so it means it's better to have in the recipe tacrolimus, MMF, with or without steroids, instead of having cyclosporine A plus azathioprine, unless you are HLA identical, not twins, but just HLA identical. But apart from these cases, it's better to use a good level, to maintain a good level of tacrolimus exposure. So I thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable talk. Now I'd like to request Dr. Sunil Kumar, who is an associate professor in the Infectious Disease Department of SIUT, to kindly come on stage and deliver his lecture on cytomegalovirus infections and kidney transplant. Thank you. Uh, thank you to organizers for invitation and congratulations for arranging such a great symposium. Uh, it's always easy to speak when you have knowledge of immunosuppression and rejection because the balance of these is infection. If you over immunosuppressed, more infection. If you in under immunosuppressed, more rejection. But that when you treat, it's more infection. So uh, CMV, we know that it is a most important infectious complications uh, post transplant. And in the absence of prophylaxis, actually up to 75% uh, of patients with solid organ transplant can have CMV reactivation post transplant. But once the infect CMV infection is established, uh, there is actually a rapid increase in the CMV viral load, and we should be landing to tissue invasive disease. So uh, timeline where the CMV occurs, it's very uh, easy to remember. The period of most intense immunosuppression, this is starting from four weeks, probably up to six months, this is where there is a reactivation of CMV. Uh, depending upon different risk factors too, but this is where you find most of the CMV uh, post-transplant. So, but remember, whenever there is a rejection and we are going to treat with anti-rejection treatment, it resets the thermostat because it's uh, 
uh, brings the immune system back to zero, this means the risk of infection will be again back to uh, high because of treatment with rejection. So, uh, uh, different risk categories depending upon uh, donor and recipient status. So, uh, usually in developing countries, because the R positive, which is recipient positive, this falls under the intermediate category. And high are people in which there is donor, donor positive, but recipient CMV, IgG is negative actually. And these are very, uh, actually in developing countries, it's almost, almost non-existent. But in developed countries, uh, this status of uh, D positive, R negative, this is around 40%. So, uh, if we have latent CMV infection because of different risk factors which we will discuss, we may have active CMV viral replication and it may exert direct effects or indirect effects. So what are the direct effects? It can cause CMV viral syndrome in which can, there are non-specific symptoms that patient can present with fever, patient may have leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, myalgia. This is just CMV viral syndrome and we may have tissue invasive disease depending upon uh, where it invades, it can cause a variety of uh, things like hepatitis, we may have colitis, and we may have uh, nephritis. Indirect effects, actually it again depends, ke it alters the immune uh, system, that means ke there may have role in graft rejection or graft dysfunction. It may actually increase susceptibility to other opportunistic uh, infections like uh, different infections post-transplant, which may be bacterial and fungal. And which may lead to decreased graft and patient survival post-transplant. So, uh, it has been observed that if you offer prophylaxis versus no prophylaxis to other CMV infections, some of which may be due to this HSV and varicella zoster, may be due to the prophylaxis what we are giving because it's uh, uh, antiviral, but also the reduce the incidence of bacterial and PJP. So, uh, uh, there are two ways of uh, measuring CMV post-transplant. One is, which is basically up nowadays obsolete, which is PP65 antigenemia, but uh, because the, it depends upon uh, level of uh, leukopenia, so that's why the, we have moved towards molecular diagnostic test, test, that is we are doing quantitative CMV DNA level, and it has become almost a standard uh, across the uh, but there are some issues with CMV virals. It depends that uh, you have checked in uh, plasma or you have checked in whole blood. Uh, being ke in whole blood, there may be high viral loads, which may be difficult to interpret. Also, uh, its levels depends upon ke at which stage of CMV you are seeing. Whether patient has CMV viral syndrome, patient has tissue invasive disease, and patient may have just viremia at that point. But also, in compart uh, just like tissue invasive disease, we may have CMV viremia negative actually because it's in the some compartment which causing uh, active tissue invasive disease. So CMV may not virus may not predict these patients. But it has been strongly recommended because of lack of a standard a standardization. Every center should define and validate their own levels. Actually, we cannot have uh, standard levels following across the. Uh, uh, basically centers, so every center should validate their own thresholds because there are some issues with uh, levels. We will discuss in subsequent slides. So there are two strategies uh, classically being followed, okay, whether to give universal prophylaxis or whether to approach with preemptive therapy. In universal, medicines to all, prophylaxis to all, at risk patients, usually start with a period of intense immunosuppression which is around one month post-transplant so you can start after 10 days of transplant and continue it for depending upon type of organ and depending upon recipient status. And preventive, the problem is okay, you should know your threshold. Okay, we will check CMV viral load at certain duration of time and when that threshold reaches then you can treat for till the CMV becomes negative and then again you go back to your preemptive therapy. So uh, there are problems with thresholds. So in solid organ transplants, different papers predict a patient may have symptomatic. In this, if you are checking in plasma, roughly level is around 3,000. And when you are checking in whole blood, it may goes up to 4,000 actually. Different thresholds have been uh, published in solid organ transplants. 
And if we see uh, the transplantation guidelines published in 2018, again, uh, because most of our patients are recipient progressive, they have actually suggested a level of 3,000 in which you have almost 99.6% negative predictive value that symptomatic disease nahi hogi. Roughly level of uh, 6,000. Although that has been ke high risk hoga toh, people have described different levels. So again, there is no standard level, no standard threshold to follow. Every center should their own levels to be decided upon preemptive. And that's the biggest problem with preemptive therapy. Of course, there are some pros and cons of both disease in which in preemptive you need to call patients for uh, for example two weekly so you need to ask patient to come after two weeks have a cme pcr done then we check it and then decide other way around prophylaxis is not very we give treatment to all of these patients but prophylaxis has added advantage that it can reduce also other CM, uh, other infections like herpes varicella zoster it also prevents the reactivation of these but once you give antiviral, there are always chances of antiviral resistance, CMA resistance actually. So, question is, which is better? Preemptive is better or that? So, this is actually a meta-analysis almost uh, eight years back in which uh, they did no statically significant difference between prophylactic and preemptive group. But this is almost, and they looked at CME syndrome, late onset CME disease, also rejection, but prophylactic group has more leukopenia and that's understood when you give drug which is known to cause leukopenia this means chances are the patient may develop leukopenia but this is almost uh, uh, almost a decade back eight years back my analysis so do we have any local experience with us uh, evaluating these two tactics so this is uh, from uh, Dow University of Health Sciences Center in which they assess the high-risk patients which is D positive or negative and intermediate risk and they have defined a cutoff of 400 okay on 400 they are going to treat in preemptive therapy so once they see of course uh, there will be more cme infection in preemptive group because we are happening we are letting the cme happen then we treat so cme infection disease was significant in uh, basically uh, preemptive group same with it but uh, if we look at ultimate goal which is rejection Sorry. So see, rejection was not significant. Patient survival, graph survival, all was not significant. This means they are not favoring one strategy over others. And there is also a poster from Shefa International in which there are uh, liver transplant recipients in which also they have taken a cutoff of 137 in that they have found no difference between these two groups. And in India, also they have unable to uh, basically uh, Okay, what is what should be uh, favored over one strategy over others? Uh, at SIUT, uh, our own experience, we get uh, taken a cutoff of 3,000, and then we see CME all across whole year uh, when we evaluate it. Of course, when we are doing a preemptive strategy, this means okay, 43 percent of them will fall in a period where in which there is more intense immunosuppression. But we have a cutoff of 3,000. Uh, but we have also no uh, difference in rejection and graph survival when we evaluate these patients. So, uh, latest data recently published uh, in May 2018, that was a large, a large randomized control. They have follow-up of seven years post-transplant, in which they see, of course, there is more CME infection initially, but after that, actually the both strategies are same. There's no difference at all. And they have cut off of 400. But uh, to graph survival and uh, patient survival, they both were non-significant. The p-value was not significant for both strategies. Whether it's, and this is a very large, long follow-up of seven years. So this means, again, they, that raises the uh, basic issue, okay, whether the universal prophylaxis is better or preemptive. Uh, the, the people who are supporting preemptive therapy, actually they uh, uh, argue that in, there will be enhanced CMV specific immunity with preemptive because let, you are letting a CMV happen because there will be more uh, multifunctional T cell and neutralizing antibody titers with the time they will increase and basically they will do some priming. So the people are now supporting more preemptive approach as compared to previously in which there were people more towards the universal prophylaxis. 
Uh, of course, there are different drugs available, gansaclovir, van gansaclovir being available easily in Pakistan and their doses. But the most important thing from a nephrologist perspective is knowing a correct estimated GFR because that will define ke aap log dose, what dose we are going to use it. And it changes very fast. On every 25 decrease in estimated GFR, the dose will be different for both actually well again circular, again circular, whatever you are using actually. So this means ke, uh, you should have a, a dose adjusted according to estimated GFR. But uh, the new concept is coming up. Ke, what is immune status is about that? So that's why the CMV IGRA, which is being done by uh, Ali Spot, this is still in, in fancy. The trials are not much uh, there, but they are supporting. Ke, we can decide our immune uh, strategy of CMV on the basis of what the immune system is actually. And this is actually a proposed uh, proposed algorithm or proposed table by. Uh, American Society of Transplant in which they say okay, if there is positive CMV IGRA then we can hold our uh, immune, uh, hold our anti-CMV prophylaxis deciding on that actually whether it's at starting or end of treatment so this is like an, still this is coming up as a source of effect so uh, duration recipient positive in kidney transplant in our setup, three months is good enough. And there is, as we discussed, no choice at all. And that is being recommended by different guidelines. Once there is established CMV disease, that is, you need to clear, uh, wait for improvement of symptoms. In this case, IV GAN is preferred over oral GAN because there is uh, uh, issues of absorption. So IV GAN cyclovir should be given for those established CMV. We need to discuss with nephrologists what's the time of re reduction in immunosuppression at which patient have severe CMV disease, non-responding patient, patient had very high low viral load and patient may have severe leukopenia at that time. Order. Second most important thing, do donor predict this. In Pakistan at this moment we are doing only living donor transplants. So in living donor transplants there is always less risk of CMV. So this means our strategy should be individualized according to our patients rather than following uh, guidelines from a disease organ donation. So this, this means when we started a decade back, there was only two approaches. Now the approaches have changed actually. We have a concept of preemptive therapy, short and long. We have a hybrid of strategy in which you do prophylaxis for one, year, one month, then move towards that. This IEM is your immunity. This is coming up as a strategy. You know when the immune system is positive, stop your prophylaxis, monitor that. When it goes down because of anti-rejection treatment or immunosuppression, start treatment. And now the vaccination concept. Some are backed by very good randomized control trial. Some are still in basically the randomized control trials are going on. This means the CMV treatment is evolving to conclude it, as it is the most important common infection. Prophylaxis should be done. Now it uh, depends upon center to center what uh, method they found easy. After of this session, I'd like to request Dr. Aisha Hassan Maiman, who is a consultant histopathologist from Akhan University Hospital. Let me introduce her. Uh, she is a chief uh, pathologist. We are collaborated with her, and uh, she has done all the renal biopsies of transplant of our transplant program. And the most important, the reporting time, which none of the pathologists has agreed to give, she report us within eight to 10 hours. So give him a warm welcome. Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Uh, uh, I would like to briefly talk about uh, renal allograph biopsies and what a physician needs to know about them. So I have no conflict of interest to disclose. So the main objectives uh, for today would be to uh, discuss the past, present, and the future of the kidney diagnostics in renal allograft biopsies. So the first successful renal transplant was uh, between two identical twins. Uh, it was done in Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, it was a successful transplant. Uh, the patient survived for uh, almost eight years. and. Uh, at that time, there was no, no immunosuppression given. 
So despite significant developments in the diagnostic modalities for immune injury in the renal allograph, biopsy still remains the gold standard uh, for evaluation of graft dysfunction. On an average, the biopsy findings changed the clinical diagnosis in 36% and therapeutic management in 59% of the cases. So this shows you the importance of performing the renal allograft biopsies. So the BAMF classification of renal allograft biopsy was developed in an attempt to standardize the renal allograft biopsy interpretation and reporting. So the goal of the use of this classification is to be able to give a diagnostic biopsy grading that will provide both a prognostic and therapeutic tool. So till the early 1990s, uh, there was no standardized classification of renal allograft biopsies, which resulted in considerable heterogeneity in reporting among various centers. Uh, Kim Solis, who is the co-founder of BAMF classification, uh, he, along with pathologists from John Hopkins University, he convened the first meeting, which was uh, uh, in Banff, Alberta in August 1991, which led to the creation of the first standardized international classification of biopsies of transplanted kidneys. So this is the, uh, 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 the venue where the first meeting took place, the Banff in Alberta in 1991. So every two years after that uh, first meeting, every two years, the transplant pathologists, clinicians, surgeons, immunologists, researchers from more than 30 countries get together for these BAMF meetings. And BAMF working groups were formed in 2009 uh, meeting with the aim of conducting multi-center trials to evaluate the clinical relevance, practical feasibility, and reproducibility of potential evidence-based changes in the BAMF classification. So BAMF working groups, they provide progress reports um, on activities that they have carried out over the last two years. And then new and modified criteria and specific recommendations for diagnosis and reporting are established. So this is the last meeting uh, uh, which took place uh, on, uh, in September 2022, which was again in the Banff, uh, Alberta. And it was more, uh, mainly focused on the molecular diagnostics and uh, artificial intelligence. So the multidisciplinary and the international approach has allowed the Banff classification to gain international acceptance as the main reference used for scoring of kidney allograft biopsies in research studies, routine practice, and clinical trials. Over the past two decades, the BAMF meeting reports have been among the most cited papers uh, in the field of organ transplantation medicine. So you can see over there, uh, from the initial uh, start of the BAMF um, meetings reports, till 2021, there is a progressive increase in the number of Google Scholar citations. So these are the different BAMF meeting reports that come every two years uh, with the updates uh, on the BAMF working groups and the new uh, changes in the guidelines of BAMF reporting. So as you can see, uh, the evolution of BAMF classification from 1991 to uh, 2021, the important changes uh, have been uh, uh, mentioned over here. C40 negative antibody mediated rejection was introduced just before 2013 meeting and artificial intelligence and digital pathology uh, has been uh, discussed in the current meeting in 2022. So the adequacy of the specimen, uh, the optimal biopsy should have at least 10 non-sclerose glomeruli and two arteries. So it should have an adequate portion of cortex. So if you have biopsy from the medulla, or if you have less than seven glomeruli, so that's an inadequate biopsy. So the BAMF diagnostic categories for renal allograft biopsy uh, so uh, the biopsy can, uh, these are the diagnostic categories for, for BAMF allograft biopsies. You, uh, the biopsy can be normal with non-specific changes. Then the category of antibody-mediated rejection, then T-cell-mediated rejection, then IFTA, which is interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, which tells you the chronicity in the renal biopsy. And then we have other non-rejection causes, which includes uh, BK virus nephropathy, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, calcineural inhibitor toxicity, acute tubular injury, recurrent glom glomeropathy, spilonephritis, drug-induced interstitial nephritis, etc. So we have to keep all these differentials in, your, uh, in our mind while we are interpreting the renal biopsies. So acute tubular necrosis is one of the most common uh, diagnostic categories that we come across in a renal biopsy. The findings can be very subtle. If you have a biopsy that looks very normal on light microscopy, then you should look for acute tubular injury that usually manifests in the immediate post-operative period. Compare, these are the normal proximal tubules showing a brush, fuzzy brush border 
right? And here the tubules, they show attenuated epithelium with flattening and regenerative changes in the nuclei. So this is a classic uh, histology of acute tubular injury. So this is a famous cartoon that when you have no clue about the diagnosis, then you should think that's probably ATN. So I won't go into the details, but um, different categories have been given scores in BAMF, like the interstitial inflammation and tubulitis, uh, which is the hallmark of T-cell mediated rejection. They have given a score of zero to three. Similarly, glomeritis and peritubular capillaritis, which are the hallmarks of antibody mediated rejection, they have been given score one to three. 0 to 3, right? So all these categories, they are uh, classified on the basis of um, these scores and then given a diagnosis based on that. So antibody-mediated rejection can be acute, chronic, active, and chronic. So they have definitive uh, morphological criteria, immunological criteria, and serological uh, positivity for donor-specific antibodies. So this is the histological criteria for antibody-mediated rejection. This is, this is a glomerus which shows inflammatory cells within the capillary lumina. So this is a classic example of glomeritis, which is a hallmark of antibody-mediated rejection. These are tubules surrounded by these peritubular capillaries showing inflammatory cells. So this is peritubular capillaritis, again a hallmark of antibody-mediated rejection. And sometimes you have frank fibrinoid necrosis of the vascular wall, which can be a component of both antibody and T-cell mediated rejection. And ATN. Sometimes I have a few cases I've seen that just present with ATN-like picture and you don't have any accompanying glomeritis and peritubular capillaritis um, to show microvascular injury. So such cases, they show C4D positivity or donor-specific antibodies uh, on serology to confirm the diagnosis of antibody-mediated rejection. So antibody-mediated rejection can sometimes solely present as ATN. So you have to be careful to rule out antibody-mediated rejection whenever you have a case of ATN. So this is the classic example of chronic active antibody-mediated rejection. You can see double contours along the capillary loops. So C4D stain is a degradation product of activated complement factor C4. Here you can see strong linear diffuse positivity in the peritubular capillaries. So for immunostochemical stain, even a focal positivity can be taken as positive. For immunofluorescence, you need to have diffuse positivity. So this is immunostochemistry showing linear strong brown staining in the peritubular capillaries and this is immunofluorescence highlighting the peritubular capillaries, which is a diagnostic marker for antibody-mediated rejection. So we have also an entity which was introduced in 2017, C4D negative antibody-mediated rejection, which will have all the features, histological features of antibody-mediated rejection, but and even the serological evidence that is, the donor-specific antibodies will be present, but you won't have any C4D positivity in these cases. So on, when we get a case uh, where we have histological evidence of uh, antibody-mediated rejection, but we don't have supporting C4D deposits, then we usually tell them to correlate with donor-specific antibodies. But there are also some cases where donor-specific antibodies might be negative as well. So now they have introduced uh, molecular diagnosis, that is endothelial uh, transcripts to, uh, they have incorporated that in the, so endothelial transcripts have been incorporated as diagnostic criterion for C4D negative antibody mediated rejection. So again, this is BAMF classification, which is uh, on tubulitis and inflammation and vasculitis. Uh, it has been uh, divided into the grades. So I will just skip to these, uh, skip through these. So other entities that you have to think of which come in the differential of acute T-cell mediated rejection is drug-related tubular interstitial nephritis, pyelonephritis, viral infections, and post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. This is a case of uh, drug-induced viral uh, tubular interstitial nephritis. You can see um, infections in the renal, renal allograph, which can be bacterial or fungal, and they can also be viral. Uh, the most common viral infections that we see in renal transplant is CMV and BK virus. So this is a case of CMV uh, infection showing endothelial cells uh, with uh, intranuclear inclusions. This is CMV immunostain highlighting those nuclear uh, inclusions. This is a case of polymer virus infection showing these glassy intranuclear inclusion bodies. 
And this is SV40 immunostain that we routinely do on all our transplant biopsies, which show strong nuclear expression in the BK virus uh, positive cells. So poly I will just, uh, just take two, three minutes. Uh, the polymer virus nephropathy uh, BAMF working group has developed a morphological classification that groups together histological changes, clinical parameters, and facilitates comparative outcome analysis. On the basis of these two features, intrarenal polymer virus load and interstitial fibrosis scores. So these are some of our cases. You can see uh, the presence of viral inclusions, presence of scarring in the biopsy, and the SV40 stain showing nuclear positivity in the viral infected cells. So as the chronicity in the biopsy increases, the prognosis, the chances of graft failure also increases. This is, the, uh, this is our six cases of polymer virus, which have been divided into these PVN classes. And you can see that PVN class three has the worst prognosis and uh, one of the patients of PVN class three and one of the patients of PVN class two uh, uh, resulted in graft failure. The best prognosis was seen in the PVN class one. So now the BAMF uh, working group on polymer virus nephropathy, they have divided it into classes and have encouraged us to report according to these criteria. So IFTA has been introduced, inflammation in the areas of uh, tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis. Um, have been recently introduced as a hallmark of chronic active T-cell mediated rejection and is associated with adverse outcomes in kidney transplantation. So this is just a case of calcineurin inhibitor toxicity and sh showing you the characteristic histological features that you see. So this is uh, recently introduced in the BAMF uh, 2022 meeting, also discussed in 2019 meeting. Now they are doing many projects using artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. And they are doing computer-assisted digital pathology uh, with and, and analyzing the whole slide images uh, by a machine. So now the BAMF working group uh, on digital pathology has been established in 2019 and working on that. And they will be uh, presenting uh, the data soon. So the take-home message is the goal of the BAMF score uh, process is ongoing integration of advances in the histological, serological, and molecular diagnostics to produce uh, a consensus-based reporting system that offers precise scores, accurate diagnostics, and applicability. So the future for BAMF classification is bright. BAMF platform offers ample opportunity to increase our precision and accuracy in diagnosis, staging, grading, and thus stratifying our patients for optimal treatments and further improved allograft survival. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your lecture. Now I'd like to ask the panel of experts if they have any questions or closing remarks for the speakers before we move to the audience. All of the speakers uh, gave us a thorough information on most of the topics. Uh, sadly, we missed with the, some of the topics were long. This one question I wanted to ask is, what My is your opinion on uh, zero antigen transplant? And uh, have you done those and what are the outcomes and the risk factors in these patients? Uh, yes, uh, zero mismatch. We have uh, done uh, zero mismatch transplants, uh, quite a few numbers. And uh, we, uh, again, it's, uh, we uh, do go for anti uh, presence of or absence of anti HL antibodies and we go for the cross match. And then, uh, if everything is negative, then we have transplanted them, and they, they did fine. I mean, we have performed the exact, exact number Dr. Tasadduk will share, around, around uh, uh, 78 we have done so far with zero mismatches. So, so you, there, there's no harm in doing so. I would like to add in this, sir, we have done, I think, 60 to 70 zero matches and we don't have very bad experiences. Even the five-year data is not that bad. Can, can I have my opinion on that? Uh, yes, I think it's doable, provided that the patient is maintained on tacolimus and MMF and loads of steroids. Indeed, if these zero mismatches transplants were attempted with cyclosporin A and azathioprine, the outcome might be worse. But as long as you have standard immunosuppression, I mean, state-of-the-art immunosuppression, sorry, I think it's fine, uh, really. We are using the induction therapy with the ATG, and TAG-MMF is the standard for high risk. And we put this, these patients at high risk. Okay. 
And in France, most of the uh, living related kidney transplants are zero match because in most of the cases, it's between spouses. And so therefore, we also induce them with low doses of ATG and the results are very good, yeah. And I would, add, I would like to add one thing more, that in Pakistan, like uh, females are a soft donors and wives are the first one who come up whenever the husbands have the disease. So majority of the time siblings doesn't come up. So wives are the one who come up for donation. Anyone from the audience? Yes, uh, Dr. Sunil from Liaquat University of Medical Health Science. Uh, I would like to ask two questions from the DUHS renal transplant team. First one is that uh, what is your experience of CMV negative transplant? Any one donor or recipient is CMV negative, then uh, is there your, any experience of out of 500 renal transplant? Second is that uh, a study shown by the Dr. Sunil from SIUT that uh, yeah, there was no difference between the universal and preemptive prophylaxis. You have given the, you have selected the two groups and given the universal prophylaxis of CMV versus preemptive prophylaxis. Nowadays, what are your recommendations? Which prophylaxis are you following? Thank you. That's a very good question. To be honest, uh, I just remember two cases who were CMV negative at the time of a screening because our population is 99.9% .9 positive. And now I don't see any patient. I just remember two because they were negative. So we have uh, highlighted that these two ladies are negative. And your second question is uh, preemptive versus universal prophylaxis. I would rather go for universal prophylaxis. It has better outcomes rather than preemptive because uh, checking PCR is not that easy in our setup. It's an expensive modality and you have to do it on a very regular basis if you are going for the preemptive uh, prophylaxis. So universal prophylaxis is better than preemptive, in my opinion. Maybe uh, Professor Ostring will add something. I just have a comment. In Western Europe, at least 20% of the uh, current transplanted patients are CMV zero negative, 25%. And indeed, when those patients are receiving a CMV zero positive kidney transplant, uh, we prophylax them for six months. And in spite of that, in one third of them, they will develop beyond six months of prophylaxis, uh, primary CMV infection, and sometimes it's very difficult for them to get rid of it. And so indeed, in Pakistan, it's uh, really different. As Dr. Tassadok has said, almost all your patients are CMV zero positive. And in my center, we use um, universal prophylaxis because it avoids uh, the the cost of uh, iterative PCRs because in the preemptive strategy you need to have preemptive PCR, you need to perform sorry uh, PCRs and it's very costly so we use uh, universal prophylaxis yeah. and, uh, and above that uh, whenever there is a mild rejection or anything uh, we give ATG then we restart the prophylaxis that is very important to remember that whenever you are using ATG, then you have to think about CMV. You do not forget CMV, otherwise patient will have severe infection. Uh, thank you. I am Dr. Puran Kumar. I have a question to Dr. Sunil. He somewhat mentioned about CMV vaccination. So Dr. Sunil can tell in detail something about CMV vaccination. So CMV uh, vaccination is still basically a... Uh, uh, even not qualifying the randomized control trials, the people are doing a, to develop sensitization of immune system before that. So uh, not much data is there, whether to do it pre-transplant or post-transplant. The focus is on uh, doing uh, prophylaxis post-transplant, depending upon your own strategy. Just like Dr. Tasad looks at K, he finds feasible to uh, prophylaxis universally. At SIUT, we are doing preemptive prophylaxis. We find it very easy. Uh, we have done cost calculation. K, it will be cheaper for us to do CMV PCRs at regular intervals because patient is following with us, and uh, we are doing it at our own center. So we are finding it very easy. So we are doing it uh, uh, preemptive prophylaxis. With uh, but the problem is of threshold. The problem is of coming up uh, threshold. As uh, doctor said, had okay, we have a unique population for which uh, basically having uh, most of our transplants are 
living related transplants with a recipient universal positivity or D positive R positive. This means these patients may behave differently than uh, what we are getting it from Western where we have 25 to 30% with R negative. So our strategy should be uh, from, but if, for example, you have a 500 transplants data, you can evaluate your own transplant data because the late CMV is getting problematic. And late CMVT has a role in chronic antibody mediated rejection. This, this, that's why the seven years transplant data is very important ke, to understand our knowledge ke, what should we do. So probably we are looking for a great answer, particularly in renal transplant with R positive. Yes, Just a comment on CMV vaccination. Uh, my center participated to many trials uh, for vaccinating uh, CMV seronegative uh, kidney transplant uh, candidates. And in fact, all the, the studies with the vaccines, and there have been many candidate vaccines, were failures. So, so far in 2022, we have no CMV vaccine which might be efficient in our uh, population. Now we'd like to start the shield distribution ceremony for which I'd like to request Professor Dr. Nusrat Shah to please come on stage. Pro, pro, pro Vice Chancellor of Dow University Health Sciences. I'd like to request our panel of experts, Dr. Kamar Naveed, to please come forward. Now I'd like to request Dr. Ashur Alam to please come and receive his shield. Dr. Sabahat, please come on stage and receive your shield. Professor Salman Imtiaz, please come on stage. Now I'd like to request Dr. Sunil Kumar to please come on stage. Welcome back and uh, now we are going to start our third session and for that I would like to invite uh, Professor Abdul Manan Junejo to first come on the stage as a panel of ex uh, expert. He is the head of department from J Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center and he is my supervisor as well. He has trained me well that today I am here at this position just because of him. So give him a big round of applause. Uh, second panel of exp uh, experts is uh, Dr. Sonia Yaqub. Uh, she is the head of department at Aga Khan University Hospital and I'm very thankful that she has given her time to become a panel of experts. Thank you very much. Our third panel of expert, uh, Professor Abdul Kareem Zarkoon, is unable to reach here because of her, his personal reasons. So we will replace the panel of experts with Professor Salman Imtiaz from Indus Hospital. So he'll be joining us in five minutes as he's in the prayers. So I would now like to invite uh, Professor Rubina, who is a professor at uh, Sin Institute of Urology and Transplant. And uh, she has a vast experience in uh, renal transplant. And she'll be giving a talk on post-renal transplant uh, lymphoproliferative disorders. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present here today. And first of all, I will congratulate to uh, Dow International team 
for carrying out 500 successful transplants and organizing uh, this uh, um, symposium here at today. So, um, actually, when uh, I was asked to give this uh, talk on recurrence of kidney disease in transplant, it was just um, two weeks ago. So, um, there was not enough time. So what I did then, I, uh, I have chosen uh, some recent review articles on the topic and uh, some large big registry data and have compiled this uh, talk for today. Okay, whenever we uh, go through any article or chapter uh, on the transplant, we find this uh, one statement uh, everywhere that the renal transplant is the best renal replacement therapy for end stage kidney disease. Uh, well, um, there is no doubt that this is best renal replacement therapy and uh, we all who are involved in the uh, renal medicine or surgery, we aim to uh, bring best of this best renal therapy. So uh, for that purpose, we have to uh, begin with uh, uh, from selection of pre-transplant patients and uh, this morning you have heard the um, expert talk from Professor Fazal for the selection of uh, recipient and the donors in pre-transplant stage. Uh, with the transplant uh, beginning um, in early 50s since that time till today, there are many uh, advances in the surgical techniques and uh, uh, graft failure related to surgical complications has uh, almost negligible in these days. There is also improvement in the immunosuppressive regimes. So the rate of uh, rejections and graft loss related to rejections are also reduced at this time. But still there are, uh, we see the graft losses in some patients and uh, recurrence of uh, disease in transplant causing graft failure is a topic which should be considered seriously. By definition, recurrence of original disease which was responsible for end stage in the kidney, it recurs in the graft and it causes the graft dysfunction. The risk of glomerular diseases recurrence in the kidney graft is based on the type of GN and the second or third most common cause of death censored graft loss. Third cause after rejection and infection. There are some entities other than the glomerular disease which can reoccur and contribute to graft dysfunction. So if we broadly categorize the diseases which can reoccur in the renal transplant, there are some immune complex glomerular lesions like uh, membranous uh, nephropathy, like uh, IgA nephropathy or MPGN. Then uh, podocytopathies, most commonly the FSGS and very rarely the minimal change disease. Then the glomerular diseases with organized deposits like uh, fibrillary uh, glomerular nephritis, immunotectoid glomerular nephropathy and amyloid. Then paraproteinemia associated renal disease with or without the organized deposit deposits like MIDD uh, and then lesions uh, related to vascular diseases like ANCA associated vasculitis or um, thrombotic microangiopathies. Then some inherited or metabolic diseases. So we will uh, go through these one by one. First of all, we, we actually don't know that what is the extent of the problem. What is the uh, extent of the uh, recurrence, uh, graft loss with the recurrence of the disease? Because um, in uh, many centers, and especially when we talk about our uh, part of the world, uh, most of the patients, we don't know the exact cause of the end stage renal failure or the primary disease causing the end stage renal failure. So, and kidney biopsy is um, very rarely available in our patients. So, um, this may impact on the proper differentiation of the recurrent disease from pre-existing 
either if it occurs in the early post transplant it could be uh, we cannot say that it is donor related or it is the recurrence of uh, original disease or if it's occurring very late in the graft then we cannot uh, it is hard to differentiate from the de novo or recurrence of primary disease well uh, 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 many patients they have minimal or modest degree of protein in the urine in post transplant period and um, uh, and it may occur under normal circumstances or after acute rejection process or after some infection but higher levels of proteinuria that are close to or over the nephrotic range indicates the presence of glomerular disease regardless of the etiology often associated with recurrent or de novo disease processes patients with recurrent gn they present with hypertension new onset or worsening of proteinuria and active urinary sediment with or without worsening of graft function uh, results of various routine laboratory tests urinalysis and common ser serological test for infections autoimmune disease vasculitis and paraproteinemia aid in the diagnosis of a specific type of suspected recurrent glomerular or other diseases recurrent renal disease may have a subclinical or clinically symptomatic presentation in the post transplant period it is preferable to obtain the pertinent information of the primary disease in the native kidney including the biopsy results and clinical activity of the disease at end stage wherever it is feasible the recurrence of the disease in post transplant post transplant period varies very widely it may occur within few weeks or uh 5 to 10 years post transplant diagnosis depend on number of factors the variability in the follow up times sometimes uh, uh, some centers they uh, call on uh, follow up very infrequently so they may uh, miss the recurrence in early period diagnostic criteria used and threshold to determine a recurrent lesions the common biopsy practices with different institutions and nephrologists some centers they do the protocol biopsy and they pick the recurrent disease very soon availability of comprehensive processing of renal biopsies uh, not all the centers who are doing transplant and uh, renal histopathology they have availability for electron microscopy which is very important for the uh, diagnosis post transplant period proceeding the recurrence of disease varies in frequency among specific a systemic examination of the renal biopsy with routine special stains for light microscopy using a complete panel of immunofluorescence staining and conducting an electron microscope is recommended in suspected cases electron microscopy in the setting of transplant kidney biopsies plays a crucial role in the diagnosis and confirmation of both subclinical and overt clinical recurrence disease as well as some early and late features of transplant rejection coming to the diseases uh, one by one uh, first of all uh, i will talk about iga nephropathy which is uh, most widely variable primary glomerular disease in renal transplant where glomerular mesangial deposits of galactose deficient IgA1 are found this may be initially asymptomatic or an indefinite for an indefinite period or present with isolated uh, micro or microscopic hematuria uh, mild proteinuria on rut routine urine analysis the incidence of recurrence ranges from 8 to 53% in different series uh, which are reported in literature and on average about around 30% the variability being partly influenced by racial and geographical background the risk factors for the recurrence of ig nephropathy are um, the young age of the patient at time of transplant the il10 genotype living related donors with close to zero hla mismatch and more aggressive proliferative glomerular disease in the native kidney with increased crescents and rapid progression to end stage renal disease the overall 10 year graft survival is over 60% and 
and how uh, should we manage the recurrence of uh, IgA nephropathy is uh, optimal treatment remains unknown and current practice is to uh, maintain or uh, if they are not already on CNI then change to CNI or maintain the CNI and steroid based immunosuppression regime with addition to anti-protein uric medications. In cases of crescentic rapidly progressive IgN, more aggressive therapy with cyclophosphamide or rituximab can be considered. But this is largely unproven. Early steroid withdrawal should be avoided in patients who had native kidney failure with IgA nephropathy. An uh, nephritis uh, review of literature reported IgA mesangial deposits in 78% of patients who had inoxonlin uh, nephritis in native kidney. Whereas the clinical recurrence occurred in 22 to 35 over 5 to 10 years post transplant. And they reported 10 year graft survival in 88% in these patients. Recurrence can lead to graft failure in 10% of patients and prognosis is more guarded in adult patients. Coming to the membrane proliferative nephritis or uh, some label at mesangiocapillary glomerular nephritis, the new classification is based on the pattern of glomerular injury on the immunopathologic findings. And the two main categories are immune complex mediated, which was formerly known as MPGN type 1, and MPGN with predominantly C3 deposits, also called C3 glomerulopathies, which include C3 glomerular nephritis and dense deposit disease. Immune complex mediated, both primary and secondary types. Secondary is related to infections or monoclonal proteins. They tend to reoccur in the uh, graft. And the presentation is related with non-specific with nephrotic features of hematuria, subnephrotic to nephrotic proteinuria, and slowly rising creatinine. Serological workup in setting shows mainly persistent hypocomplementemia with low C3, CH50, and C4. High rate of recurrence spanning 30 to 70 percent has been recorded from various studies and registries. 95 percent of these recurring within 24 months post transplant, with 25 to 30 percent of graft loss. Some of the known risk factors uh, for recurrence are young age at the diagnosis, living related donors transplant, persistent hypocomplementemia, and severe glomerular lesions with crescents, and an aggressive course in the native kidney. Glomerular monoclonal deposits, typically IgG3, kappa, or lambda, are associated with poor prognosis. C3 glomerulopathies, uh, almost exclusively C3 deposits, and the two are C3 glomerular nephritis or de dense deposit. While they have some uh, clinical similarities, they are morphologically different, and uh, they can be differentiated only on electron microscope for definite diagnosis. Both result from hyperactivation of the alternate pathway of complement due to genetic mutations or development of autoantibodies to complement related proteins or regulatory factors. The genetic mutations are constitutive uh, uh, abnormalities unaffected by immunosuppressive therapies and they persist in the post transplant period, setting up a relatively early and high rate of recurrence. Uh, exact cause of complement dysregulation, uh, it remains unknown, but the genetic mutations uh, for uh, factor H alleles and uh, mutations in the factor H and I uh, genes has been reported. Autoantibodies for example C3 and C4 or C4 nephritic factors directed against C3 convertase of factor H antibodies. This may result in dysfunctional regulatory proteins and therefore uncontrolled amplification of the C3 protein. Clinical features for uh, uh, these recurrent diseases are relatively asymptomatic microhematuria or proteinuria or an acute nephritic or nephrotic syndrome. With, uh, they ha these patients have persistent hypocomplementemia. C3 glomerular nephritis has been seen to reoccur in 67 to 84 percent of the cases within first two years having a higher rate of graft loss up to 50 percent. De uh, dense deposit disease is known to reoccur in 80 to 100 percent of the cases as early as two weeks post transplant. About 15 to 50 percent graft loss is uh, within five to ten years. 
uh, management of recurrent MPGN is uh, number one is the pre-transplant screening for monoclonal gammopathy and uh, if suspected then the hematology review in patients all patients with MPGN then approach to treatment with recurrent disease is not well established there are reported case series of successful treatment with the use of plasmapheresis and other immunosuppressive agents including cyclophosphamide, eclusimab or rituximab. However, the optimal treatment strategy remains unknown and the personalized treatment with plasmapheresis or anti-B cell therapy in immune complex mediated and eclusimab for monoclonal gammopathy or C3 glomerulopathy is recommended. Coming to the membranous uh, glomerulonephritis, uh, uh, which uh, has a breakthrough in the understanding of the idiopathic after the development of this uh, discovery of this uh, NTPLR2. The recurrence of this disease is defined by the reappearance of subepithelial deposits in the glomerular capillary basement membrane composed of polyclonal IgG or C3 deposits by immunofluorescence. And it is confirmed by the presence of PLAR2 receptor staining or other less common antigens thrombospondin that have recently identified and electron microscope localization of the deposits. On an average, 15 to 40 percent of the cases of primary uh, membranous reoccur in transplants during the life of the allograft. While most reoccur within two years, a small proportion of them are seen in few weeks. Both primary and secondary uh, may not reoccur in renal transplant if the underlying cause is effectively and adequately treated. Uh, detectable PLAR2 before transplant is significantly associated with recurrent membranes. The risk factor for recurrence are the shorter clinical course to chronic renal failure in the native kidney, old age patient recipients, previous recurrence in allograft, steroid free immunosuppressive protocols or living related donor with more compatible donors and the recipient HLA molecular haplotypes and risk alleles like HLA A3 or HLA DRB1. Graph failure ranges uh, from 20 to 50 percent in 5 to 10 years. Management includes antiprotein uric agents, corticosteroids, alkylating agents, CNI, etoximab, 80 percent of the patients reported achieving partial or complete remission personalized approach of prescribing rituximab, preemptive use of rituximab, insufficient information on, in literature. Coming to the lupus nephritis, recurrence and renal graft generally represent milder forms of glomerular lesions. The lesions represented are class 1, 2, 3 or 5. Uh, diffuse proliferative or class 4 develops in the transplant setting partly related to the ongoing immunosuppressive protocols that could not modify the severity of the lesions. The recurrence rate varies from 0 to 44 percent and some series reported as high as 30 to 50 percent based on the histological diagnosis from protocol biopsies. Though only around 10 percent showed the symptomatic clinical renal, uh, renal disease. Recurrence can occur as early as 5 days to at least, uh, as late as 16 years. Risk factors are uh, younger age, live related donors, especially those having closer to zero antigen mismatch and patients of African descendant with a graft loss of 5 to 15 percent in 10 years. Uh, uh, this study was from uh, UNO's data and this included very large number of uh, patients. Uh, only uh, 6,850 recipients of SLE were reported in this study. And they have shown 2.4% uh, recipient who developed the relapse, uh, recurrent uh, lupus nephritis and, uh, and they have shown um, poor graft survival in these patients who developed recurrent lupus nephritis. Management includes, uh, unless there is clinical evidence, there is no need to change the immunosuppression. Patients with histopathological changes of recurrent lupus should be treated with antiproteinuric, uh, preferably the RAS block. Some suggest in class 3 and 4 lupus to give high doses of MMF or IV cyclophosphamide along with pulse steroid. Coming to the anti-GBM disease, clinical recurrence is defined as 
reappearance or signs of glomerular nephritis along with the histological signs of the proliferative uh, GN and linear IgG staining on kidney biopsy. I don't have time. Ten minutes? Okay. So, um, the HLA DR15 uh, course and management patient survival reported uh, excellent 100% at five years. I will go quickly. Uh, podocytopathy, most common is the FSGS, three underlying mechanisms, primary, secondary, or genetic. Uh, recurrence with the genetic is less common, is, is more common with the primary. And uh, pathogenesis of the recurrence uh, primary FSGS is not clear. A pathogenic role of the circulating soluble urokinase plasminogen has been proposed. Uh, role of co-stimulatory molecules, uh, B71CD80 in podocytes, has an additional impact. Hallmark is the onset of proteinuria of nephrotic range with a rate of recurrence uh, from 30 to 60 percent from different studies. The risk factor for this condition include the young age and progression of end stage within three years of onset in, uh, as a primary disease. Liver related donor is also a risk factor previous recurrence in an allograft and mesangial hypocellularity. Five years survival uh, reported 52% in Australian New Zealand data. Management uh, plasmapheresis is often preferred and recommended. Efficacy of adjunctive uh, therapy including rituximab and CNI remains uncertain. Mechanism by which the rituximab may be effective in reducing proteinuria is through its effect on podocyte function. Switch to CNI in patients uh, who were on mTOR inhibitor and the role of preemptive plasmapheresis, uh, immunosupresorption uh, and the other therapies is uh, remain debatable. There are no randomized controlled trials has been published on the use of these therapies. There are only uh, case reports or a small case series. Okay. I will stop. I can just go to the. There are five more. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So where was? I will skip these. These are less common. Minimal uh, MIDDs, vascular regions. Uh, ANCA um, recurrence is uh, nearly 20% in renal, uh, renal allograft and graft loss directly as a result of recurrence is relatively low in uh, ANCA positive patients. Then complement mediated uh, uh, TMA or atypical HUS in renal transplant is defined by the presence of glomerular and microvascular endothelial injury. Recurrence rate is uh, in other forms of TMA is less common but uh, the Mm, HUS related with uh, complement system is more common and it's a bad news for the transplant because uh, graft failure occurs very frequently with uh, atypical HUS recurrence. Uh, poor outcome for regular, uh, in this I have talked, use of prophylactic uh, Eclusimab has shown the promising results in a small case series. These were very few cases, 12 cases were included and four were given the um, prophylactic eclusimab. I will skip this. Inherited disease, diabetic kidney disease reoccurs. Uh, um, risk factors are inadequate pre-post-transplant glycemic control that may be enhanced by immunosuppressive therapies containing calcineurin inhibitors, especially the tectrolimus and mTOR inhibitors. Reoccurrence rate may be as high as 25 to 40 percent and graft loss in 5 to 10 years with recurrent diabetic disease. Oxalosis is an important cause of primary hyperoxaluria, inherited autosomal recessive disorders and there are different gene mutations. So uh, pre-transplant workup for the patients where the oxalosis is suspected is very important. 
and um, the studies which reported combined liver and kidney transplant, the data is uh, from European Dialysis Transplant Association showed a three-year survival of only 23% of living related kidney donors and 17% uh, in cadaver donors. And they have reported 98 uh, transplants of agusilosis. I will skip this. So, um, to conclude, based on the large studies in transplant registries, recurrent or de renal disease in transplant account for the third highest cause of allograft dysfunction and graft loss. Although many glomerular, tubular, interstitial and vascular diseases have a potential to develop in the kidney transplant, recurrent uh, glomerular lesions appear to constitute the vast majority of the disease. For a proper diagnosis of these diseases in the transplant setting, knowledge of prior kidney uh, disease before and stage routine clinical urine testing for proteinuria and hematuria and a transplant kidney biopsy that are subjected to a light microscopy, immunofluorescent and electron microscopy are essential. The rate and time of current recurrence of post-transplant as well as graft loss are dependent on the specific disease process and underlying pathogenic mechanisms. Patients should be monitored closely and educated about the recurrence risk, treatment options and limitations. Financial considerations are important as many therapies are costly and further large randomized control trials are needed to understand the each disease in native kidney and renal allograft. Thank you. On to the second lecture that will be given by Dr. Mohammad Tasaddu Khan, our chief transplant nephrologist and pioneer of transplant nephrology in Dow University of Health Sciences on the topic of highly sensitized kidney transplant experience in Dow University. Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's a nap time for everyone, but it's very interesting, not a very interesting way to wake you up. Uh, actually, uh, first we will be just giving the uh, few slides regarding the data and what we have done so far, and then coming to the original topic of highly sensitized kidney transplant experience at DUHS. So this is a brief introduction. We, uh, the beginning of our transplant program was in 2017. Uh, we have a designated pre-transplant workup rooms, two wards catering post-transplant care, one HDU for a step down fresh transplant patient, one ICU for initial post-procedure monitoring and recovery. Per year transplant capacity is 80 to 120. Uh, this is an interesting data that uh, we have uh, recipients. You can easily see 82% were male and only 18% were females. So females were not lucky that uh, donors were av available for them. So majority of the males have got the kidney transplant in our center. Donors, here you can see easily difference uh, that 52% were females. As I told you that always wife and sibling, female siblings come first for the donation and 48% uh, are male, which are usually brothers. And this is the data showing from where we have taken all the transplant recipients. So majority, of course, we are from SIN, but interestingly, we are taking 20% 20, 20 cases from Balochistan and 17% from Punjab. This is very interesting for us as well, that people are coming all the way from Punjab uh, for this transplant program. We have few from other countries as well, Afghanistan and South Africa, uh, Qatar and Dubai as well. This is the most difficult part being a transplant physician. You can easily see that we are dealing with an educated class of patient. 50% of the patient are educated. If they are educated, they have loads of questions for a transplant physician because they knew each and everything. They go on Google and they come up with so many questions and the uh, thought process over here in Pakistan, matching and things like that, you have to counsel them a lot. So this is a very difficult task for a transplant physician to cater because the literate persons are like, you can see masters and above are 23% and graduates are 30%. Our transplant success rate first year is of course, everywhere it's good. Three years is 94%. Five year because we have uh, just, uh, I think, 30 cases in the 2017, so it's 83%. Uh, 
And uh, this is how we have progressed. In 2017, it was 28 cases, 2018, 78, then we increased in 106 in 2019 and since the invent of uh, COVID initially for one two months we stopped then we realized no it is not possible because if even patients are going for the dialysis they are, have got more exposure rather than going for the transplant and we got very good results we didn't got any COVID infection in the recent transplant we usually got all the COVID infections in patients who have had transplant three four years back it was not the fresh transplant who came up with COVID infections. So DSA versus non-DSA. So this is the chunk we have done it uh, in DSA. And in DSA, class one, class two, and both. So you can see the class two, which is more vulnerable, is 24%, and both is 51%. So introduction and background, kidney transplantation has indisputably revamped renal medicine and restored hope among patients coming across fatal end stage renal disease. However, sensitization of HLA triggers extensive immunological fences to successful kidney transplantation and henceforth transplant candidates are frequently demoted to the ever-growing waiting list owing to preformed donor-specific antibody. This is the main problem in our country and in Western countries as well. As soon as you see DSA, I would not say in Western countries, in our part of the world, as soon as you see DSA and you say, no, your transplant cannot be done. So it is not the case over here in Dow. We have done uh, all the patients who have got DSAs and we have desensitized and done it successfully. So the definition of sensitization is variable. One definition defines uh, whoever has got a high PRA of more than 20% and it ranges to 90% as well. The definition of sensitization has undergone a paradigm shift uh, after the adoption of new concepts of calculated PRA since uh, 2019 which immunologists can easily understand. Why this sensitization occur? We all know that uh, the previous exposures, the females have pregnancies, uh, s patients with second transplantation, because in our setup, uh, transfusion is very frequent in CKD population who are on dialysis. So we usually have patients who have done eight to 12 times of transfusion by the time they come up for the transplant. And those who have already had transplant, like second transplant, and uh, we have also done a patient uh, with the third transplant. That was the first time in Pakistan history that uh, third transplantation has been done and one year, uh, and it's one year back. So, Immunological challenges, what are the immunological challenges in highly sensitized patients who have a PRA of more than 20 with DSA, less than three antigen match or zero match, which we were discussing earlier, presence of DSA and highly immunogenic diseases like hepatitis C and other autoimmune diseases. Those patients are vulnerable to get uh, rejections due to autoantibodies as well. So other autoimmune diseases are risk factors as well. So major, what are patients sensitized to? So we all know that those are HLA class one and HLA class two. And HLA class two is more vulnerable because it targets for the immune mediated injury. So because it is, uh, you know, expressed on the epithelial and endothelial cells. Since it is expressed on the endothelial cell, so it is, it is a major target for the immune mediated problems. And there are non-HLA antigens as well, which can cause acute rejection, even hyperacute rejection. That include MYC A, MYC B, anti-endothelial antibodies, angiotensin 1 receptor antibodies, and Vementin antibodies. Only two uh, are performing in Dow, MYC A and MYC B, we are doing it, but rest of the antibodies, we are not checking it. Maybe SIUT uh, are performing those, but these are also important as well. Why we need uh, desensitization? Because since uh, we are a country where the CKD is on the rise and we have lots of lots of patients coming and ending up in renal failure, so if, and there are shortage of uh, donor as well and we don't have any Dickies donor program, 
So if a patient comes to you and say that uh, he is my donor or she is my donor and unfortunately there is a DSA or the patient turns out to be highly sensitized, then you don't have any option other than to reject or you, do, you go for the desensitization protocol. So we opted for starting desensitization protocol after our first, even in the first year we have done four desensitization program, uh, patients and we got a very good results and we continue doing it uh, and we built a confidence in ourselves initially. It's a very tough job for a transplant physician to initiate that thing because you have a whole team and since they are aware of the DSA, even the surgeon, the junior doctors and the other people, they all are scared of going for a desensitization protocol. It is very tough for a transplant physician to take a decision to proceed for the transplant. And if the patients keep on hemodialysis or they remain uh, as a dialysis patient, the number of deaths are double as compared to the renal transplant. We are all aware of that, that kidney transplant is a better modality than continuing hemodialysis. Who drives the most uh, benefits who, are, who have uh, got to increase the transplant candidate access to transplantation by decreasing HLA antibodies and number of unacceptable antigens for listing like reduction in calculated PRA to decrease known DSA prior to planned positive cross-match transplant to reduce the risk of immediate graft graph loss from catastrophic hyperacute rejection. So this is the most important thing which is always in a physician mind that will, it, will this graft work or not. Because since you are doing a high risk uh, patient, so at times your heartbeat goes above 100 when the patient is in theta. So you always I call and ask that is the transplant going okay or not. Because this is a very big responsibility on a transplant physician if you are doing a desensitization protocol that uh, that surgery goes well and the graft works well. So this is a very high risk for AMR, acute antibody mediated rejection and uh, allograft raw loss. So these factors has to be assessed carefully. And I would uh, say that you have to take a calculated risk. There is always a risk but you have to be very sure what you are doing. So how to screen for HLA specific antibody? There are three ways that you have to do CDC cross match, then you can go for flow cytometry in highly sensitized patients or those who have the DSAs. And we have a very good immunologist in our setup, so she is working very hard and doing our Limonex uh, on uh, class one, class two identification. And in high risk patient, they are doing on single bead assays as well. So we start with the PRA. If PRA is negative, then we don't go further. PRA class one and class two is negative, we don't go further. If PRA one is positive, then we'll go for class one identification. If that turns out to have any DSA, then we'll go for desensitization. If there is no DSA, there is no point to go for desensitization. That is an important message to carry from this uh, symposium that if there are no DSA, there is no point for going for a uh, desensitization, even if they have 99% sensitization. What we know DSA means allograft rejection. What we do not know how to monitor anti-HLA DSA and how to treat anti-HLA DSA. That is very important. And definition, the presence of preformed antibodies against HLA, which are ex specifically is, uh, expressed by kidney transplant donor. This can result in hyperacute and acute rejection. So this is very scary. So what are the timings when we can check, like pre-transplant, of course, with the Luminex technology, and transplant day, one week, second week, four week, and eight week. And any time, whenever you think that there is a problem with the graft, and we nephrologists uh, always check creatinine, and we are very sensitive to the creatinine as soon as it rises. So you, since you know that this is a highly sensitized patient, so you can always send the DSA. So what are the uh, safe MFI values where you can proceed for the transplantation? Every center has a different values. We started with uh, 1,500, then we developed confidence in ourselves. Now we are dealing with more than 3,000. At least 3,000 we are proceeding with the transplant if the patient has been desensitized. And the data says that less than 2,000 has a less rejection rate and more than 3,000 has 73% rejection rate. But if you have desensitized and you have given all the medication, I have not seen much rejection in uh, uh, desensitized patient. 
and the uh, solution for this is a paid kidney exchange program which we have also started at, at our center and four swap transplant has been performed till now and we are working hard on it but it is a very difficult job because you have to compile two families together and with the same uh, sex with the same uh, uh, risk factors you have to swap the, them so we have till now done four but this is a uh, another possibility in a highly sensitized patient that we can start and work on this so there are two protocols uh, what we uh, which is a standard of care that, that is the john hopkins uh, protocol and the cadas sinai so we are following the john hopkins one because we are a poor country we cannot afford to have a high dose of immunoglobulin because in the john hopkins protocol you have to use 100 mg per kg of immunoglobulin and in cadas sinai you have to use a 2 g per kg uh, of immunoglobulin so that is not possible because the one vial of immunoglobulin of uh, I think it will cost uh, around more than one lakh so it is very expensive the, these transplants are expensive so there are many published studies and uh, they have uh, shown uh, different data but one year patient survival is 95 percent one year graft survival is 86 percent acute rejection occurred in 36 percent acute any body mediated rejection occurs in 27 percent long-term outcomes are still lacking because this desensitization pro uh, is not happening everywhere so there are emerging therapies which are coming for the desensitization I'm not going into the details of this because uh, the final uh, results has to be come but I would just discuss two that uh, interleukin 6 blockage uh, it, it, tocilizumab it has been used during the COVID as well, but it has a good result in those especially who are resistant to the uh, rituximab and immuno IVIG. And uh, this cysteine protease inhibitor, imlidiphase, uh, this has a very uh, uh, bright future and people are looking at it because imlifidase uh, has a very uh, initial uh, trials have shown it has a very good uh, results of reducing the DSA and uh, there are very less chances of uh, 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 rejection in, in those patients who have, uh, who have been given imlidiphase. And the eclusimab is a terminal complement inhibitor that has been used in the western countries as well but uh, it is yet to be arrived in the Pakistan so we have no experience but uh, it has been well used in the western world and it has uh, given a promising results in the desensitization protocol as well. So patient included at Dow University Hospital, uh, patient with negative CDC but DSA positive on solid phase assay, solid phase assays are Luminex one and positive CDC cross match with or without DSA, low or high titers. Even the cross match can tell you because if you have a good immunologist you can tell easily what titers you are having of the T cell or the B cell and we have a very good communication uh, with the immunologist in order to proceed for the transplantation. So if there is a low titer you can uh, go easily. In the Luminex HLA class 1 or class 2 positive DSA with MFI values ranging from 1500 to 20,000. I can tell you one thing very easily that uh, in some patient we had a problem uh, even with a very low MFI values and in some patient uh, we do not have any issues. So this values are very uh, non-reliable to be very honest but we have to check values as well because I have seen acute rejection in those with a very small value and you have to calculate and sum up the, all the MFI values in order to go for the renal transplant because a highly sensitized patient usually doesn't have only one DSA it usually have two or three DSAs on different HLA antigens and uh, uh, those who have second kidney transplant recipients we have done more than uh, 16 uh, second kidney transplant recipients and we have done only one kidney uh, third kidney transplant recipient or low titer autoantibodies these are the results and uh, these are not the results these are the uh, patients who were included with the number of you can see the number of DSA HLA class 1 or class 2 and you can easily see the MFI values in the last column and uh, we have given the desensitization protocols in these ones 
one thing I would like to tell you that when you give the desensitization protocol, especially after using the rituximab, your CDC will definitely come positive for B cells. So th this thing you should keep in mind for the junior audience as well because sometimes whenever a transplant physician or nephrologist see a CDC, if it, it turns out to be positive, they just reject the patient. So if there is any history of using of rituximab, your B cell will remain positive. So you don't have to worry. You only need to look for the T cell. T cell positivity is always lethal. So these are the creatinine and urea and uh, we are coming up with a study. Uh, we have uh, st published a case series in the Saudi Journal of Kidney Disease, but uh, now we have more cases, so we are coming up with a uh, original article. This is the desensitization protocol. On the day first and uh, second, we do plasma phrases session. Then we give injection rituximab on day two after plasma phrases, no plasma phrases on day three, then eight sessions of plasma phrases after day three and IVIG. 100 mg per kg per dose after each session of plasma phrases. Repeat dose of uh, rituximab pre-transplantation and then we follow the uh, we follow the HLA titers, MFI values. If it turns down or if it comes down, then we proceed for the transplantation. And these are other things uh, which we are doing like induction with the ATG, three doses starting from the day of surgery, 1.5 mg per kg, we give as low as possible. We don't want to give, you know, put patient at risk. And we are using TAC and MMF the, in these high risk uh, individual. And other strategy, what I have adopted to start immunosuppressive therapy one week prior to the transplant to achieve the TAC level. And uh, we are not using steroids very high, with a very high dose. We are just using 0.5 mg per kg. And intraoperatively, we are just giving 500 mg uh, solometrol. We are not using much of a steroid unless and until it is required. And we, give, we are using a Ceftron DS on an alternate day prophylaxis. And Valgan Cyclovir, of course, a universal prophylaxis protocol has been followed. But uh, we are giving 450 and uh, we have uh, uh, written an article as well on this uh, the, by comparing those who have given 900 and those who have given 450 because of the uh, price, because of the financial, because uh, Valgan Cyclovir is highly expensive. But now I think there is a Mito come, coming up in the market and which is much cheaper than the original Valgan Cyclovir. So data from the multiple centers have shown that uh, there are increased risk of rejection, especially with the CDC positive uh, patients. So conclusion, in our transplant center, we successfully desensitized and transplanted 67 HLA sensitized uh, kidney transplant candidates with moderate and high DSAs and T and B lymphocyte positive CDC. Our desensitization protocol comprised of multiple plasma phrases session with simultaneous low dose IVIG and rituximab. Upon follow-up, we did not witness any significant transplant-related events such as allograft dysfunction or rejection immediately. Thank you very much. Now, moving on to the third lecture on the topic of chronic allograft nephrology, I would like to request Professor Vakaruddin Kashif. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon everyone. Two corrections, I'm not a professor since I'm not a faculty at, at an academic institution right now. And the other thing is the topic is chronic allograft nephropathy and not chronic allograft nephrology. That's all right. Um, so, all right, so it's a vast topic. I'll try to um, stay within my time limit of 20 minutes. Uh, might go a minute or two over. Um, so, um, as we have heard from many speakers before, that uh, the kidney transplant uh, arena has shown a lot of success over the last couple of decades and um, short-term graft survival has tremendously improved um, owing to uh, more potent immunosuppression, more better recognition of, of the immune status of the patient and immune risk. However, if we look at long-term graph uh, uh, survival, uh, there are still questions that need to be answered. Um, and, oops, 
So if you look at this study published by Hariharan recently, uh, looks at um, both patient and graft survival. Uh, the lower two are, are living and deceased donor graft survival. And you can see, although we have improved tremendously over the last couple of decades, but still there is 50% or almost 55% graft survival at 10 years um, and, uh, in, in the deceased donors. So a lot of work that needs to be done on that. Primarily, this is due to a combination of death with functioning graft um, as well as uh, uh, death censored graft loss as well. Uh, the latter, it results in significant increase in morbidity and mortality. Um, it also adds a lot to the financial cost of returning to, to dialysis and is associated with higher risk of death. Um, it also adds to the ever-increasing uh, uh, list of transplant uh, patients who are waiting for a transplant. And in the West, there are almost 15 to 20 percent of patients or 15 to 20 percent of transplants are being done as a second transplant. So it's important to talk about this. Um, as I go through my presentation, there will be several uh, 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 terms that you will hear, chronic rejection, transplant glomerulopathy, chronic allograft injury, or cr uh, chronic allograft dysfunction. These two terms are basically uh, equivalent of CKD in, in, in native uh, k uh, kidneys. Uh, then we'll talk about chronic allograft nephropathy, or CAN, and uh, the newer term uh, is IFTA, or interstitial fibrosis and tubular nephropathy, uh, tub tubular atrophy. Um, so, if you talk about chronic allograft dysfunction, um, is this the point? Yeah, Ch chronic allograft dysfunction. So, it's a clinical condition. It's a progressive uh, decrease in renal graft uh, function, uh, is usually ac uh, accompanied as in CKD, uh, usually accompanied w by, by proteinuria and hypertension. And there are a number of causes of chronic allograft dysfunction, which include chronic allograft nephropathy, de novo GN, uh, BK associated nephropathy, late acute rejection, uh, and some, some of the other things like renal artery stenosis and ureteric obstruction, et cetera, and et cetera. Um, the the chronic, chronic allograft nephropathy was a term that was included in the BAF uh, classification in about 1991. Um, and this kind of replaced the chronic rejection because earlier the concept was every graft that was failing after five or 10 years that was thought to be chronic rejection. But then we realized that chronic rejection was a smaller proportion of, of, of these patients and there was a lot else that was going on. Um, and so chronic allograft nephropathy replaced chronic rejection in these classifications. And in 2005, then IFTA, or which is uh, uh, immuno, uh, sorry, um, which is um, uh, fibrosis and tubular atrophy, interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, that replaced um, uh, the term CAN. So IFTA is proportional interstitial fibrosis with tubular atrophy in a diffuse distribution. Uh, glomeruli may show ischemic changes with uh, congregation of basement membrane, thickening of capillaries, as Aisha was uh, showing in her presentation, um, uh, the, the slides of patients going through segmental or global glomerulosclerosis. Severity is graded um, uh, uh, based upon how much area is involved. If uh, less than 25% is involved, that's grade one. If 25 to 50% is involved, that's grade two IFTA, and if more than 50% is involved, that is grade 3 IFTA. Similarly, vascular lesions, if they are present, if they are none are present, then it is uh, 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 grade, two, uh, grade 0. And if more than 25% or more than 50% are, are, uh, are involved, then it is grade 2, 3, or uh, uh, grade 1, 2, and 3. So this is an early stage IFTA where there is some tubular dropout, there is some uh, uh, inflammation that you can see, there is uh, uh, mild glomerulosclerosis, uh, segmental sclerosis that you can see um, in a couple of the glomeruli that are present. But as it advances, this is what it ends up being. There is vast fibrosis and scarring. Most of the glomeruli are sclerosed. There's hardly any tubules that you can see. Uh, some more pictures of the same, um, but again, the same message. So the question is, what happens in these patients and what happens to these grafts? If it's, it is not all chronic rejection, then what it is? And the story pretty much starts before the transplant or at the time of transplant, and that's where we need to start looking at. Um, 
So there may be fixed deficits at the time of transplant. Um, suboptimal donor tissue, older donors, size mismatch, uh, uh, reduced baseline function and reserve, all of this translates into a reduced nephron mass um, that you have transplanted into this patient. In such allograft, there is decreased capacity to, to respond to injury. These don't do very well in, in, in stressful conditions. So with accumulation of senescent cells uh, with associated inflammatory response leading to impaired organ function. Uh, reduced nephron mass, like in CKD, results in hyperfiltration. It results in progressive loss of kidney function. And uh, even in the absence of further injuries, this uh, process will progress over years and result in fibrosis. There is pro-inflammatory pro environment in, uh, due to ischemia reperfusion injury uh, in patients uh, with dead, uh, brain dead donors. And they, they, that also leads to a higher risk of acute rejection, which then translates into chronic change that happens in these patients. So if you look at a, a donor cell when it's transplanted, even if it looks healthy, the kidney looks healthy, but there is a lot of stress that the, the that kidney goes through. There's ischemia reperfusion injury, there is oxidative stress at the time of transplant, and these cells turn into what we call senescent cells. These senescent cells are actually normal looking cells. They are actually normal functioning cells, but they are unable to proliferate. They are unable to participate in cell cycles, and they are unable to repair themselves. Cells. So what happens is they leak uh, um, uh, reactive oxygen species, which initiates a cascade of events involving several cytokines and um, senescence-associated secretory phenotype, which results in conversion of these epithelial cells to mesenchymal cells, which are shorter in height, which results in a larger lumen of the tubule. And you can see that in these patients, you have very large tubules, and then there is extracellular matrix deposition by these cells which leads to uh, uh, um, uh, fibrosis and it leads to IFTA and turns into chronic allograft dysfunction and uh, loss of graft. All right, so uh, at the time of transplant, another thing that is happening is cold ischemia time, ischemia reperfusion injury, and re delayed graft function. As you all know what cold ischemia time is, it is well associated with, uh, 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 as a risk factor for delayed graft function and acute rejection. Delayed graft function not only has an effect on short-term uh, transplant results, but also in the long-term results and long-term graft survival. So ischemia reperfusion injury is intimately linked to both prolonged uh, cold ischemia time as well as delayed graft function. There is no pharmacological intervention that has actually resulted in fixing delayed graft function, but there are certain things that help. For example, use of machine perfusion technology in patients where kidney is being transported from one state to the other or one city to the other in deceased donor programs. Um, there is uh, this concept of delayed introduction of CNIs. Now, there is no robust data backing this, uh, this, this strategy but this is a very common practice that if you introduce CNI on day four, day five of transplantation, that might actually be better and may, may prevent delayed graft function. And ATG, of course, that has been used and it is being used. And then there are certain experimental drugs because this delayed graft function and the injury that is happening is complement mediated. So complement mediated uh, injury can be inhibited with C1 esterase inhibitors. Again, in experimental uh, stages, let's see what it shows. So if you look at allograft injury, uh, there is, uh, uh, the causes can be divided into either uh, uh, immune mediated or non-immune mediated. Um, we look at immune mediated factors. Uh, so uh, the transplant related factors are either non-immune mediated or immune mediated. Immune mediated is either antibody rejection or acute uh, T cell mediated rejection uh, and some microvascular inflammation without antibodies that can happen. Non-immunological factors include, of course, the donor age, the renal age, vascular morbidity uh, coming from the donor, then transplant related with ischemia reperfusion injury, delayed graft function, CNI toxicity, infections, mechanical complications. All of these result in damaging the, the graft in the short term, which translates into a process that goes on in the long term and causes nephron loss and fibrosis. And of course, recipient related metabolic and uh, uh, cardiovascular disease factors also contribute. 
And another way of looking at these injuries is to look at um, uh, the various segments of the, of, of the graft rather than looking at diseases. So chronic tubular interstitial uh, injury, endothelial injury and glomerular injury is one way of looking at, uh, at it. Chronic uh, tubular interstitial injury, injury could be caused by BK nephropathy in the long run. It caused, could be caused by recurrent UTIs, could be caused by s uh, CNI toxicity or cellular rejection. So there, in the environment of repeated stress injury or effect of calcineurin inhibitors, tubular epithelial cells express pro-fibrotic growth factors. These activate pericytes, fibroblasts, and fibrocytes and produce matrix. Two of the uh, 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 molecules that we keep hearing about is TGF-beta and microRNA-21, which are both pro-fibrogenic signals. Once this cascade is started, it keeps uh, promoting more fibrosis. There is also some genetic predisposition of, of patients to develop IFTA because not everybody in the long run, every graft will develop IFTA, so there might be a genetic predisposition. Among these, the microRNA21 is interesting because you can actually measure microRNA21 in the urine of, of patients, and there's a very nice uh, study. Um, uh, published a couple of years ago, looking at microRNA as a potential biomarker of interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy in kidney transplant recipients. And the area under, of, uh, under the curve it was, was very, um, it was very sensitive and specific and could differentiate between no IFTA or early stage IFTA versus advanced uh, IFTA. So this is something that is still experimental. This is something that is still in the pipeline, but this might be a very useful tool to monitor these patients for uh, long-term uh, graft maintenance. Um, and another important thing is inflammation within the graft. So if there is scarring, yes, but if there is inflammatory cells within the graft, then it is, it is uh, also very, uh, um, uh, it, it relates to long-term graft life. And uh, this is a study published by Jeremy Chapman and his group uh, three, four years ago looking at chrónic interstitial fibrosis, fibrointimal vascular hyperplasia and chronic glomerulopathy and comparing it with IFTA or no IFTA at year one. So protocol biopsies at year one, looking, differentiating patients whether they have IFTA or not, and then they followed them over years, five or 10 years, and, and, and they have shown that when there is IFTA acutely present at year one, long-term fibrosis is uh, present. So the, as I said, the story starts very early at the time of transplant and within the first year, it is not what we are seeing at, the, at, at year 5 or year 10 with proteinuria and scarring is, is the end story that we are looking at and there is no intervention that you can do at that time. So this is where uh, the, the, the money lies or the buck lies as they say. Um, if you look at the hardcore endpoint of graft survival, by year one IFTA, you can see no IFTA at year one versus yes IFTA at year one and the graft survival is dramatically different in the long run. So we talked about tubular interstitial disease. Let's talk about endothelial or vascular injury that could be caused by acute uh, um, uh, chronic cellular rejection or antibody mediated rejection or micro, uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. Um, so whenever there is endothelial injury, um, endothelium is the interface between the donor and the recipient. This is where, the, where, where all the immunogenicity is being uh, created. So injured endothelium will lead to vasoconstriction, inflammation, hypercoagulation, upregulation of adhesion molecules, and this will increase graft immunogenicity. Furthermore, endothelial cells, when they die, when there is apoptosis, they re release apoptotic exosomes, which result in endothelial dysfunction of the other healthier endo endothelium and auto, auto antibody production and complement deposition. Additionally, endothelial cell activation re results in inflammatory cell recruitment, which eventually leads to new intima formation and fibrosis and scarring and further uh, uh, damage to the, to, to the graft. And then 
we'll talk about chronic glomerular injury, um, either it's recurrent disease uh, as talked about by Dr. Rubina Nakvi in detail, or it is uh, um, uh, antibody mediated rejection resulting in transplant glomerulopathy. Transplant gl glomerulopathy is a morphologic pattern reflecting chronic glomerular endothelial injury in renal allografts characterized by remodeling and reduplication of glomerular basement membrane. It is seen both in chronic antibody mediated rejection as well as thrombotic microangiopathy. This is um, uh, a cool slide I think uh, looking at the basement membrane and you can see um, that there is duplication as pointed out by these arrows. These are, uh, 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 this is a very typical example of transplant glomerulopathy and this is not a very old graph. This was, this is, as you can see, four and a half months post-transplant, the upper two and the lower two are 11 months post-transplant uh, exhibiting uh, transplant glomerulopathy. Um, the three entities that require a little more discussion, and we, I think I'm on time, so let's talk about those. That is chronic active antibody-mediated rejection, calcineurin inhibitor toxicity, and viral nephropathy with BK virus polyoma, because these three may form the bulk of the long-term graft loss. Um, chronic antibody-mediated rejection, uh, it's a major cause of chronic graft loss um, and it is being recognized more and more in the, in the recent few years uh, that it, pay, play, it plays a huge role in, in, uh, in IFTA and chronic allograft nephropathy. And unfortunately, there is no effective treatment for that at this point in time. Um, uh, there is almost, uh, uh, it may explain up to 50% of graft, graft loss and it is linked to um, HLA mismatch. So while we are talking about decent sensitization and while we are talking about uh, zero match and, and, and a mismatched uh, transplant, we have to remember that whatever data we are looking at, most of the data that we are looking at is acute outcomes. Uh, what happens in six months? What happens in one year? And yes, we are desensitizing them and doing it and they are doing very well. What we are not, we, what we don't know about yet is what is going to be the long-term outcome of these patients. And it seems that this mis these mismatches uh, do re uh, result in um, chronic allograft nephropathy and they, they, most of the transplants are lost because of that. Um, for example, DQ mismatch was something that we used to not care about in the past, but now DQ mismatch has been shown to de novo uh, DSA produ uh, production and rejection and it is something to pay attention to. Um, so for chronic antibody mediated rejection, initially the diagnose, diagnostic criteria was identification of DSA, evidence of endothelial damage, and um, a proof of complement mediation which was through C4D staining. But uh, now we know that we can have a negative DSA and still have antibody mediated rejection, or we can have a negative C4D, uh, uh, CD4 staining and still have antibody mediated rejection. So it has to be looked at uh, uh, more carefully uh, through biopsies. Two minutes? Okay, three minutes. All right. Uh, so, organize, uh, once diagnosed, the median survival is very poor. Risk factors uh, for graft failure after the diagnosis is heavy proteinuria um, and, of course, reduced allograft function, and as well as presence of de novo uh, DSA. Uh, management, unfortunately, there is no uh, um, uh, FDA-approved management. Uh, current standard of care is plasmapheresis and IVIG, uh, but there is the, we the data behind that is still very weak and we don't really know what really works. Uh, people have used rituximab and several other things. Recent uh, uh, international consensus guidelines show, uh, they basically say that we have to optimize immunosuppression, reintroduce steroids if this, they are on steroid-free uh, uh, regime. Uh, target a, a little higher tacrolimus level than usual and of course like you do in CKD management of their blood pressure, management of their proteinuria, management of their diabetes uh, to try and reduce uh, um, uh, their, their um, chronic process as much as possible and try to Im increase the graft life. Um, when you don't have a cure for anything then prevention becomes very critical and prevention um, uh, means improved compatibility. Again, Yes, desensitization is important. Doing uh, poorly matched uh, uh, transplants with higher, more potent immunosuppression is important and is the need of time, but that increases long-term complications. 
there are certain things in the pipeline anti protease dr drug uh, botezumab uh, very uh, promising initial uh, uh, trials there are two randomized controls that are trials that are underway and hopefully we can uh, we can learn from those c1 esterase inhibitors uh, tosi um, a lot of things are in the pipeline and i hope that in the next 2 3 years we will see results of these studies and we will know how to treat antibody mediated rejection better than what we do now Calcineurin inhibitor, quick word on it, it's a double-edged sword, be careful, um, it can cause both acute and chronic graft dysfunction, there is a very complex mechanism involving all segments of the, of the graft um, and activation of renin-angiotensin um, uh, system. Um, there is um, reactive oxygen species involved within microcorneal dysfunction, um, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that, that needs uh, a whole 20-minute uh, talk by itself. Uh, there's no specific therapy other than reducing uh, CNIs, but then that results in higher rates of rejection as well. So again, we are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place when it comes to that. One important thing to remember is CNI effect in biopsy does not mean CNI toxicity. A lot of times when you do a biopsy, there are other things going on and there's another Point number four written in the impression that there is CNI toxicity going on as well. So every time you see CNI effect doesn't mean that that's the cause of graft dysfunction. Sometimes you have to just let it be. So if there is acute rejection going on and there is CNI effect, then you bear with the CNI effect and you treat acute rejection and treat them with a higher levels of CNIs rather than backing off in CNI thinking that that's the reason why there is graft dysfunction. Um, so that's, I think, an important thing to remember. Um, tecrolimus, less fibrogenic than cyclosporin, no question about it. So uh, there's a, uh, a lot of centers are not even using it anymore. Just one more slide after this. Um, viral nephropathy, BK virus, again, a whole topic by itself, but that's one, an important cause of, of graft loss in the long term. There's no approved antiviral treatment. Uh, main uh, thing is just proactive monitoring of BK virus uh, viral levels in blood as well as in urine. And if you don't, then there is an inflammation going on and the inflammation results in fibrosis. Biopsy is, an, uh, is gold standard for diagnosis of it. And on the biopsy, it very much similar, it, it looks very similar to uh, acute rejection except for when you see these uh, giant uh, uh, inclusion bodies, viral inclusion bodies, and um, there's interstitial infiltrate along, along with that, which is very typical of BK virus nephropathy. Uh, just an overview and future strategies, basically you have to, uh, it has to be a multi-pronged approach, um, ad addressing coexisting problems at the time of transplant, Health literacy is very important because patient has to work with the doctor as a team. Um, uh, access to caregivers, we don't have enough people trained in transplant, we need to work on that. Um, adherence to therapy and compliance, all of this translates into a better maintenance of the graft and long-term graft function. Innovative non-invasive biomarkers uh, that we talked about to look at when uh, inflammation has started and when fibrosis has started and to catch on early and intervene is important. Uh, nephrologists and primary care physicians may, must be adequately trained. And one of the silver linings of COVID-19 is telemedicine. So now the transplant centers don't, the transplant physicians don't have to be in the community or in other smaller towns and a lot of things can be done on telemedicine. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Now moving on to the fourth lecture of the session on nemocystitis, carinine pneumonia and fungal infections in kidney transplant patients, for which I am asking Dr. Faisal Mahmood from Aga Khan University Hospital to come on stage and educate us on your subject. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. My goal is get double ghanti na baje, right? So, <laughs> so I'll be fast. Um, fungal infections in transplant is a huge topic, so I mean, I've made it as simple as possible, as short as possible, uh, but also what you learn over here will help you in non-transplant as well to some degree. Uh, if I can know a year count. There we go. Okay, so my game plan here, we'll talk about a little bit about fungal infections uh, uh, in general. Um, throw us about diagnostic, which goes beyond transplant, of course, and then touch upon some of the key fungi, so candida, spurgeless, PCP, and obviously 
uh, PJP or PCP. All right. Um, so I, we all know transplant's important uh, because it's the most important thing uh, uh, for long-term rehabilitation, but it does have its own morbidity and mortality, especially when it comes to infections. Um, and you have seen this hopefully before in the earlier sessions when we talked about um, uh, pre and post-transplant evaluation for infections. But as you know, okay, infections in transplant do occur in, with a certain timeline. And um, shuru mein, in the beginning, you'll have nosocomial infections. Uske baad, in between first and six months, you'll have sort of the unconventional ajibu garibad infections. And then you'll have the community-wide infections after six months. Um, so uh, obviously, when you look at the different bacteria or fungi causing the infections, I'm not going to go over the bacterial, viral, and parasitic infections. And they all have their own timelines. But what we'll focus on more are the fungal infections. And in the fungal infections, um, the four that you can see over here are what we'll talk about, candida, Aspergillus, Nemocystis, and Cryptococcus. And just to put this in your, in your head that Candida is early, Aspergillus and Nemocystis is sort of mid, and Cryptococcus is a little late, and uska risk chalta rehta uske baad. But to understand really, you, it, I think it's worthwhile just go over the fungal family, uh, medical school uh, wali cheese, which we sort of have forgotten. Um, because remember, the fungal family includes yeasts, which are like big bacteria, multi uh, unicellular, div uh, multiplied by dividing. And the most important yeasts are candida. Um, uh, but also, cryptococcus is also um, a yeast. And then there are all these lots of other interesting sounding yeasts like Malassezia furfur and Blasto um, uh, schistomyces, which we won't talk about um, in this talk. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the molds. Molds are like these multicellular plant-like thing with stems, which are called hyphae. Um, and uh, fruiting body, seeds which are called spores. And the most important mold, obviously, is aspergillus. But remember, mucor is also a mold. And my pointer is stopped working there. Mucor is also a mold, as are dermatophytes, um, and then a bunch of other molds. And in the beach, you have dimorphs, so the two morphology. And these are all your endemic mycoses, which we don't see a lot of these over here, um, except for maybe uh, penicillium every uh, now and then. And the ones that we're talking about, therefore, are Candida, Cryptococcus, and Aspergillus. Those are the three important ones. PCP is not here because PCP for the longest time we thought was a parasite, and we're not even sure if it's a fungus hack any, um, so far. All right. Um, before we talk about the fungi, let's talk a little bit about diagnosis. Because there's a lot of confusion about how do you diagnose these fungal infections. So cultures, um, cultures are really good for yeasts. For Candida, Cryptococcus cultures are really good. Not so much for the molds. Molds ke cultures are really difficult um, uh, to do. Ideally, you want to do a tissue culture for molds, and uske in the bhi aapke yeed kharab hoti. So a negative tissue culture does not mean ke isko a mold infection nahi hai, yani ke aspergillus uh, nahi hai. Uh, and remember, when you do a sputum ya BAL ka culture, uske in the bhi you can have positive growth for um, uh, aspergillus, and that may not mean there's an infection because wo hawa mein hota, right? So even if you keep a double OT outside, it'll start growing um, a mold in it. Histopathology is probably the best way, and you can even tell between the different types of molds, like mucor versus non-mucor. But the non-mucor, you may not be able to tell consi molds. The, the histopath will only say um, hyphen is a but you can't say consi species. Um, then you have... Uh, then you have a button which doesn't work. There we go. Then you have radiology. Radiology can there, um, remember chest x-rays are not very good um, for aspergillus, maybe better for things like PCP. We'll talk, we'll look, and we'll look at some x-rays for PCP. Um, uh, while HRCT is much better um, for both of these um, uh, modalities. And then you have, you have, uh-huh. There. You have uh, PCRs. Uh, PCRs can there, remember PCRs you do for PCP only. PCRs are good for PCP. We don't have other PCRs for fungi as yet. Aldabata aspergillus ka PCR is being developed um, currently. Then the two tests which are very popular, galactomannan and beta deglucan. You may have seen these being done in your institution. Galactomannan, please remember this is only for aspergillus, only aspergillus uh, and no other fungus. And galactomannan you can do in serum or in the, in, in the bronch. Um, and the good thing the, about aspergillus is specific. If it's positive, then you know this is aspergillus. If it's negative, then you have not ruled this out. Right? So a negative galactomannan uh, 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 does not mean that it's not aspergillus. Nahi hai. And remember, these have been not been optimized for transplant patients, only for the neutropenic patients. But it does have prognostic value in at least the neutropenics. Um, and things like piptazo, tazosin can give you a false positive uh, galactomannan. 
On the other hand, BDG or uh, beta D glucan is the opposite. It is sensitive but non specific. And it is very fungus and positive. It is a very important fungus which is mucor. So, mucor is negative. Hota hai. And cryptococcus is 50 50 percent positive um, only. Um, the, uh, the thing to remember about beta D glucan is that sensitive and non specific. I have seen a lot of people who treat people with antifungals because of beta D glucan positive. Hai. A negative one can rule out a fungal infection, a positive one cannot rule in. So please don't treat people who don't look like they have a clinical infection with uh, just because of beta glucan positive. Hai. All right, so let's talk about some fungi. Um, uh, and candida is probably the most important fungus causing infections in soil organ transplants. Um, and compared to non soil organ transplant, the risk, as you can see, is 3 per thousand admissions compared to just 0.21. And this may obviously the most important one is candidemia. And candidemia can be both size species of candida. Okay, I'm not going to go in detail, but keep in mind that some candida cruzia, candida glabrata, these are the ones which are often resistant to fluconazole and the azoles. Um, this mouse is bothering me. Okay, <laughs> and then mortality is also very high um, with uh, candida. Um, uh, at 12 weeks, the mortality with candidemia can be as high as 40 percent. So one in every other person will die who has candidemia by 12 weeks. So very very high mortality. Um, kisko lagta candidemia? So it's really an interplay between three things. Um, the first is colonization. Heavy colonization. Jitni zada colonization hai, bitna, there's a chance that you will develop candidemia. The host defenses, um, and then finally the virulence of the organism. Some candida are more virulent than the others. And then things that lead to colonization are very simple things that you already know steroids, um, uh, diabetes, broad spectrum antibiotics, prolonged stay in the ICU. On the other hand, things that affect host defenses, we obviously will think of immunosuppression first, but remember, uh, placing a catheter, placing a Foley catheter is also uh, breaching the mucosal um, barrier, leading to candidemia in those patients. Um, oh, where am I going back? Uh, okay, so before we talk about treatment, I think it's important to know okay, what your drugs are. Um, and if you look at the yeasts, um, uh, and these are all of the different candidas you have, and you have cryptococcus, and then you have all of the different antifungals. You have amphotericin, you have the azoles, fluconazole, itraconazole, vodiconazole, posoconazole, which is available, and isuvaconazole, which is about to be available also in Pakistan. Uh, and then you have the icanacandins, this may caspofungin is the one that's available currently. So what is the spectrum of these? Amphotericin, we know, is broad spectrum. It will kill pretty much most of the yeasts. While fluconazole um, does not cover candida cruzii and neither does itraconazole. Vodiconazole, posoconazole, suvaconazole does have do have coverage um, uh, for this. Um, the uh, icanacandin, caspofungin will cover all yeasts. I know I put a little gray box over there with candida parapsilosis, but clinical studies show that you can use this. And this is now the drug of choice, really, for the candidas. Um, and cryptococcus, icanacandins do not cover. It's only amphotericin it, and the azoles which cover um, uh, uh, cryptococcus. So how do we put this um, in um, perspective? Well, whenever you see somebody who may have candida in the blood, think of it in terms of initial therapy and then step-down therapy. Shurume, the drug of choice is icanacandins. The problem is they're super duper expensive, so they're hard to use. So you can use amphotericin. Obviously, I'm, sitting, I'm standing in a hall full of nephrologists and they'll probably hit me with jute if I say amphotericin. You can use fluconazole, but only if, um, if the patient is not critically ill or if, the patient, if there's less likely chance of resistance. And how do you know that resistance uh, ke chances are hai? And there are a couple of things that, you, you can, that have been associated with resistance, for example, females, prior exposure to azoles, um, uh, diabetes before the transplant or use of gancyclovir. But once you know the species, you can step down. You can either use acanacandins, but if it is a sensitive strain, you can use fluconazole. Vodiconazole has no benefit over fluconazole, and it has a lot of drug interactions. So fluconazole is fine, and oral B is fine, except for Vacanda cruzii, um, which, I, as I told you, is resistant to, um, azo, uh, to fluconazole. Usme, you'll use vodiconazole. So really, it's important that your lab will tell you what the species is. Other things to keep in mind, um, uh, there are four other things with candemia, eye exam, testing, central line, and duration of therapy. Eye exams are must within the first week because this will often seed in the eye. I remember even when I was in SIT, I had seen a doctor post-transplant who had lost their eye, his eye because this was missed. Um, he had not gotten the transplant at SIUT. Testing, um, you repeat testing every day or every other day until it's negative. If there's a line, please remove it. And then finally, length of therapy is two weeks from the last negative culture of four weeks if you have not seen 
um, if they're seeding or not. The last thing about candida is particular for transplant, which is what to do with a positive urine culture um, in somebody who has a renal transplant. And we don't know. It's, it's really debated because about 3 to 11 percent of people will have this uh, candida in the, in the urine. And this usually is ascending. And less rarely, less commonly descending. In other words, coming from the blood going down into the kidney. Uh, lots of risk factors for this. Um, uh, and these include female gender, coming to the ICU, antibiotic use, having a catheter, diabetes. So all of the common things you would associate with candida um, infections. Um, so what do you do? So unfortunately, this is associated with increased mortality, but we don't know cases of mortality because of the infection, yeah, because the patient is so they end up having candida um, in their urine. So normally, just removing the catheter is enough. You do not need to give them antifungals, except for in certain conditions. If they're symptomatic, so if you have somebody with a positive urine culture, no symptoms, please ignore it. You do not have to put this person, person on antifungals. If there's renal involvement, for example, if GFR has gone up or there's uh, fever, obviously, is a symptom, neutropenia, or if you're going to do any urological procedure, then you need to pre-treat them before you put them, uh, do the procedure on them. Um, and treatment is difficult. And why is treatment difficult? Because I gave you a list of the drugs, but none of these will penetrate into the kidney except for amphotericin and fluconazole. So uh, bladder penetration is, is an issue. So if you have somebody who's fluconaz who has fluconazole sensitive candida in the urine, you can use fluconazole. But if it's a resistant cystitis with, can uh, with candida, then you're stuck. Uh, you can either use amphotericin or Amphotericin, because flu cytosinia available. Uh, but if it's pyelonephritis, you can go ahead and use icanacandins because that does penetrate the kidney. So really, uh, candida in the urine is, is difficult to treat, and we don't know what to do about it. Uh, the other two are going to be very brief, aspergillus. Uh, aspergillus is not very common in renal transplant. Um, it's more common in heart-lung transplant cases. We get it by inhalation, but the reason I put this in is because if you're having construction in your hospital, make sure that, you, uh, that infection control knows because there can be outbreaks during construction um, in, in your unit. Um, uh, risk factors are um, people with uh, renal failure, repeated bacterial infections, leukopenia, or CME infections. It causes everything from colonization all the way down to disseminated disease um, in the lungs. But remember, extra pulmonary can occur and it can really cause an infection anywhere. But more importantly, in renal transplant cases, you can get um, this during transplantation and that often will lead to vascular anastomosis and loss of the, uh, the, the transplanted kidney. Um, uh, the treatment are antifungals. If I go back to my old slide and now add molds into it, you'll see that amphotericin and the newer azoles, itra, wari, posa, isuva, will cover the, the, uh, um, the as uh, will cover aspergillus. And icanacandins do cover it, but we don't, we have limited data um, on this. So the drug of choice is boriconazole. Just be careful. There's a lot of drug interactions to make sure that you're looking at interactions and looking at your levels of your immunosuppressions on this. Um, amphotericin surprisingly has increased mortality when you use it early on for aspergillus. So body is the, your go-to drug. Icanacandins look great because interactions are safe. The problem with icanacandins is that we have limited clinical data um, on this. Cryptococcus. Um, cryptococcus is obviously of yeast, um, and this is from pigeons and eucalyptus. And we've actually seen a number of weird cryptococci which are associated with the eucalyptus plantations that are around the city currently. It enters the lungs but goes to the brain, and it's the third most common infection um, of, of fungi in transplants. Um, in the brain, it causes meningitis. Cryptococcomas I have never seen. Um, it's been described, but it's very, very rare. Um, and the key thing over here is that it's a very subacute presentation. Patients will not come with headache, fever, neck stiffness. They're going to come with uh, irritability, memory loss, a little bit of confusion um, only, and they will not have a rigid neck. And these will go on um, for, for months and weeks sometimes before you can diagnose it. So have a very low threshold of doing an LP in patients um, like this. Diagnosis is obviously through an LP. And uh, key things are the opening pressure is high. Patients actually feel better post LP because you've relieved the pressure. The glucose and proteins may be normal and cells may not be very, very high, but it's lymphocyte predominant. Culture and India Inc. are good. They can be positive, but the gold standard really is a cryptococcal antigen, um, which can, you can even do in the blood. In HIV patients, it's, it's very, very sensitive. In transplant, maybe not so much. Um, radiology, um, uh, we're going to skip, we talked about that already, but hydrocephalus is what um, you're looking for. Um, but importantly, remember you have non-CNS um, infections uh, also. Lung is the second most common. You can see a lobar pneumonia, but you can also see skin lesions. Uh, double ghanti, kaise? Ghanti. Okay. <laughs> 
50, huh? Three minutes left. Okay, I'm almost done. So skin lesions are um, uh, common, um, and you can see this molluscum-like lesion or a necrotic lesion. And then treatment is in three phase phases, induction, consolidation, and suppression. And the drug of choice is amphenflucytosine, which we don't have, followed by eight weeks of fluconazole and, uh, at a higher dose, and then lower dose for about, um, uh, about a year more of 200. But since we don't have fluconazole, you can use ampho with um, with fluconazole, keep in mind fluconazole dose is 1.2 grams per day, very high dose. And then in that case, your consolidation has to be higher at 800 milligrams. Um, and then obviously your suppression at 200. And if you don't have amphotericin, you can use fluconazole alone at about 1.2 grams per day. But this is for about 8 to 10 weeks. Um, and then you use uh, suppression at a slightly higher dose. But these regimens are inferior with higher mortality. Um, and then finally, um, uh, you do lumbar puncture to see if it's negative or not, um, and then repeated LPs are needed. And I'm going to finish in three minutes with PCP, um, and which we thought was a parasite, but now we know it's a fungus. It's everywhere, um, and uh, rates are about 15% agar prophylaxis na um, uh, And the manifestations are usually a little early, uh, like mid six to eight weeks post transplant. Just like Cryptococcus, very subacute cough and hypoxemia is predominant in these. But pneumothorax is your clue. Somebody coming with pneumothorax post transplant, think about PCP. Um, uh, remember, uh, if people on steroids, cyclosporin, and TAC, you may have mass symptoms, and children may actually have uh, coryza and poor feeding, um, etc. And co-infections are common. Um, in interestingly, in the chest X-ray, normally you'll see, obviously, in kitabo mein, you'll see this bat wing appearance of, of um, uh, palmedema, but you may have this pneumothorax, you may have a lobar pneumonia, you may have just bilateral subtle infiltrates or completely normal X-rays as well. Um, so uh, don't rely on any particular X-ray findings. And therapy is Ceptron DS. Um, if they can take oral, it's two tablets, eight hourly for 21 days. If not, then it's IV, and then you can switch them to oral as soon as, you, as, soon as they're better. But if they're hypoxic, make sure you give them steroids. Dose of steroids is this, 40 mg twice a day for five days, then you give 40 mg QD for five days, and then 20 mg QD for the next 11 days. And then don't forget, after that, you have to give them prophylaxis, which I don't have to go over because I think prophylaxis, but they've already been in talk already. So bottom line, last two slides, is there are a wide variety of infections. The key ones are candida. Think about bloodstream infections, UTIs maybe. Uh, pulmonary um, aspergillosis, which causes pulmonary infections, cryptococcus causes CNS infections, and then finally, PCP, which causes pulmonary infections. Um, uh, the uh, candida occurs early, aspergillus and um, uh, PCP is in the mid, and cryptococcus is late. And then finally, treatment is for candida, icanacandins, azoles, or amphotericin, but do look at the species. And specialist is boriconazole, cryptococcus is ampho, and then fluconazole, and I showed you the three phases. And then finally, PCP is septron plus minus steroids if they're hypoxic, and neighbor doubling T. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Our le next lecture is on the topic of role of uh, transplant coordinators and experience of patients after kidney transplants for which I request one of our young talents, Dr. Mahnoor Azam, from our Renal Transplant Unit to come on stage and give you a lecture. Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Dr. Sayyid Mahnoor Azam and today I'll be discussing the role of transplant coordinator in renal transplant. So renal transplant is basically, this is not working. Okay. So renal transplant is basically the ultimate treatment of choice for patients with end-stage renal disease as it not only provides long-term survival, but it also improves the quality of life. Behind this renal transplant is a, a, a highly competent multidisciplinary team which consists of transplant nephrologist, transplant surgeon, nurse coordinator, nutritionist, and a pharmacist. Other than these people, the uh, transplant team also consists of highly competent clinical staff, the care partner of the patient, and as well as the referring physicians which may be needed for various reasons. Now, who is a transplant coordinator? A transplant, a clinical transplant coordinator could be a doctor, a registered nurse with, specialist, uh, uh, with uh, specialized training in kidney transplant, a social worker, or anyone with health-related field. The role of transplant coordinator is to support the patient and the donor and their family 
regarding the whole uh, pathway of transplant. The success of this organ donation and transplantation purely depends on the good coordination and good counseling of these patients. Other than the counseling, the coordinators are also responsible to talk to the families of potential donors to answer any concerns or queries that they might have and provide information on organ donation, but most importantly, ensure that the whole procedure goes smoothly. The duties and responsibilities of a transplant coordinator are various. They provide proper education and counseling to the potential donor and recipient, their families who are considering the uh, kidney transplantation. They conduct the whole transplant pathway, which is divided into the three phases. They help in scheduling the laboratory investigation, tracing result, documentation of the result, consulting with relevant uh, specialists for pre-op preparation and evaluation. They maintain close liaison with physicians, clinical staff, nurses, technologists, and the Human Organ Transplant Authority officials regarding organ transplantation. So this is a pictorial representation of the clinical duties of a transplant coordinator. They not only provide face-to-face -face care, but they also provide virtual care. For example, in the pre-transplant phase, they deal with candidate evaluation, the waitlist reassessment, pre-op evaluation, reviewing of medical records. In the transplant phase, they're responsible for peri-op medical management, the requirements of dialysis, which is needed before transplant. And after the transplant, the patients are still connected uh, through to the team by the transplant coordinator as they deal with both the inpatient and as well as outpatient medical management. And they also help in reviewing of medical re records. If there is any health-related query, they can go to the re relevant uh, specialist and help in getting the issue resolved. Other than that, the clinical duties of the transplant coordinators are that they're also active at the clinical site. For example, they attend ward rounds with the doctors to know the patient's progress, to be updated about their issues. They also help the transplant physicians and OPDs. They help make sure that the uh, patients are compliant with their, uh, in their uh, they know the, about the treatment and they're compliant with their treatment because it's very important for the long-term uh, graft survival, as uh, you mentioned. It, uh, they are always available on phone for the patients. So for any health-related query, they help sort out the issue immediately. And they also provide financial assistance and counseling to the poor and needy patients. Like here in our renal transplant unit, we have our own welfare organization in which we provide funds to the needy patients. And of course, the interdepartment coordination for, for any consultations or referrals. The primary role of a co uh, coordinator is to be the link between the pa different teams to provide proper, uh, to follow up closely on the well-being of the patient. They also provide discharge teaching to the, uh, they also provide discharge teaching to the newly transplanted patient. They help them and guide them throughout the whole pre process. They guide them about their mandatory follow-ups, the timing of medications, and hygiene management. They also counsel the patients to not miss any medications because it's very important that they do not miss any of their medication for a better long-term uh, graft survival. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Manu. Now I would like to invite a uh, few of my transplant recipient. And first I would like to invite uh, one, uh, Abrar, who has been transplanted in 2017. And uh, now he's pretty well, so he'll come up on the stage and say a few words. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. First, I would like to thank Dr. Lyon and Rostring for visiting Pakistan and giving his speech. And I will always be grateful to, for uh, Dr. Rashid Hamid, and Dr. Tasaduk Khan, Dr. Nasreen, and nurse coordinator Narina, and all the nurses that were pre present at my transplant. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to invite patient Juman. Uh, he has been transplanted, I think, in 2021, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> So please come on the stage. Uh, he's a very educated guy. <laughs> he has done bachelor's in, I think, business? Business, business administration IBA from, from IBA. IBA. So please. Assalamu alaikum. Hope you all are doing well. Uh, my name is Mohammad Juman Maiman and I'm just 20. Well, I am glad today just because such an honorable personalities like you invited me in this gathering. 
वेल well, अगर मैं अपने हेल्थ हिस्ट्री की बात करूं तो जो ये सीकेडी की प्रॉब्लम इंटरनली मुझे कब से थी आई वाज हैविंग नो आइडिया जस्ट बिकॉज एक्सटर्नल मुझे सिम्टम्स में जज नहीं कर पाया मे बी आई वाज यंग इनफ सो बट इन लास्ट ईयर 2021 मुझे कंटिन्यूसली हेड एक सडन वॉमिट्स बॉडी बिल्कुल अनकंफर्टेबल एंड आई साइड मेरी कंटिन्यूसली डिस्टर्ब होना शुरू हो गई देन uh, मैंने इस चीज़ को लेकर जनरल चेक चेकअप करवाए तो उस वक्त जो मेरा बीपी था 230 एंड 100 230 एंड 100 डायग्नोस हुआ और वी वर शॉक्ड फिर उस पॉइंट को लेकर जब मैंने कंप्लीट लेब्स करवाई सो जो किडनी से रिलेटेड मेरी लेब्स थी यू ऑल डॉक्टर कैन अंडरस्टैंड माय क्रेटनाइन वाज 9.2 पॉइंट टू यूरिया वाज वन सो सडनली मुझे फिर डायलिसिस uh, के लिए ही जाना पड़ा देन uh, उस कंडीशन में हमने बहुत सारी हॉस्पिटल विजिट की डॉक्टर से कंसर्न किया लेकिन कहीं से भी सेटिस्फिकेशन हमें नहीं मिली देन अल्लाह ताला ने मुझे एक नई ज़िंदगी देनी थी तो मुझे डॉक्टर तसदुक साहब के पास रेफ़र कर दिया एंड डाओ हॉस्पिटल एंड टू बी होनेस्टली माशाल्लाह फ्रॉम फर्स्ट डे जिस तरह डॉक्टर्स इन आर टी वार्ड की हॉल टीम से जो मेरा रिलेशन रहा जिस तरह से उन्होंने मुझे जस्टिफाई किया जिस तरह से उन्होंने मुझे फैसिलिटीज़ दी ये पेशेंट फोर्टी परसेंट तो वैसे ही ठीक हो चुका था इनके पास जाने के बाद देन डॉक्टर ने एक मैगजिमम कोशिश की कि कुछ रिकवरी हो जाए तो मेरी बायोसी भी की गई इन डाओ लेकिन देर वॉज नो एनी चांस सो देन मुझे ट्रांसप्लांट uh, के लिए रेडी होना पड़ा टिल ट्रांसप्लांट आई हैव फेस्ड फिफ्टी थ्री डायलिसिस एंड नाइन प्लाज्मा फेरिसिस इन दिस यंग एज इन दीज मंथ्स अंडर दी सुपरविजन ऑफ डॉक्टर तसदुक खान देन अलहमद ला इन दिस ईयर इन दिस जनवरी आई हैव सर्वाइड माई सक्सेसफुल किडनी ट्रांसप्लांट माई डोनर वॉज माई मदर अलहमद ला एंड इट्स बीन टेन मंथ्स एंड हम बिल्कुल अपनी नॉर्मल लाइफ में हैं बिल्कुल नॉर्मल एक्टिविटीज़ में विदाउट एनी कॉम्प्लिकेशन एंड विदाउट एनी रिजेक्शन थैंक यू सो मच डॉक्टर तसदुक खान माई सर्जनस एंड इस्पेशली डॉक्टर नसरीन डॉक्टर नोरिन एंड आर्ट यू आर्ट के आल मेम्बर्स थैंक यू सो मच last i would like to invite uh, my another, another patient mr akbar who is a government officer and he has been transplanted in 2020 and he has recently been uh, infection with the bk virus and after that he is doing pretty well assalam alaikum uh, my name is ali chacher and i am working with benazir income support program as a district coordinator so uh, first i will like to thankful to my doctor dr tasadduf khan and entire team because they are very much cooperative and i am very much satisfied with them and uh, in 2018 uh, it was really uh, shocking for me that i got the visa from usa and uh, i had my uh, uh, all the tests from aga khan uh, uh, laboratory and uh, within 3 month when i got my visa and everything and i was traveling to america so i had some issues with my health and when i go for the labs then the result was that the doctors told me that i had my both kidneys are failure and i need uh, immediate uh, dialysis and it was really shocking for me that within 3 months what happened to me and i was like uh, uh it's fine because uh, i was doing good because i traveled different uh, big, uh, usually my job is i am working uh, in interior sin and traveling entire sin so it was so shocking for me and i had like 3 uh, years suffered from dialysis i went to different uh, hospitals but uh, there was some issues covid comes and uh, different things happen so then somebody uh, of my relative suggest me doctor regarding doctor tasadduf and after that i am so much satisfied with them no i i know that uh, after transplant uh, there are some issues with uh, infection but overall the team they are doing wonderful and uh, no doubt uh, it's uh, i am surviving and also i am satisfied with my life and i am uh, wonderful and having a good life as compared to dialysis because now i started my activities uh, before i was working in office but now i am doing field and everything and it's a healthy kind of sign for me and also i am uh, stop taking stress and leave it to allah and also my doctor because uh, usually i have to trust my doctor and 
uh, you should have to faith in yourself, in your God, and in your doctor. So I am really thankful to Dr. Asadu. Thank you very much. Now, in the last, I would like to introduce my transplant coordinators who have done a fabulous job and they are very well trained. And uh, first, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Norina, who has uh, worked in SIUT for many years and after that she has started a program and a big round of applause for her. Uh, next is Nasreen. She is a, a transplant coordinator also and she is looking after patients very well because they are always 24-7 connected with the patient. Uh, all the patients have their numbers and they coordinate first with them and then they uh, in, give the information to me and if the patient required any admission or anything they call them. And last uh, but not the least Zaid and Janzeb. Zaid is uh, also a young chap who has started working with us and he worked really very hard and he coordinates with every department promptly, he arranged bloods because we need blood and everything within you know few minutes so they have to arrange everything and I have a fabulous team uh, and without them I cannot be able to run this transplant program. Last but not the least Mr. Jahanzeb who is working since the we have started the renal transplant program and he is also coordinating very well and giving all the financial support which we are getting from different welfares and we have our own donation program as well uh, from we are collecting money from the rich and rich people and uh, uh, we are giving uh, to those who cannot afford because we cannot deny treatment to any of the patient who comes to us after transplantation and requires treatment and doesn't have money. So we have to uh, show this, uh, uh, we have to uh, continue this program. Last, Mr. Naved, our manager, who have a great job in arranging this uh, symposium in a very short spell of time. We have uh, tried to arrange uh, as better as we could and he is looking after all the ward things as a manager. So give them a big applause. Without them, we are nowhere to run this successful renal transplant program. Thank you very much. Now we are open for a question and answer session. Uh, I would like to ask the panel of experts if they've had any questions from the speakers. Urologist, transplant surgeon. So they both, and his dynamic team that he showed here, that arranged uh, this uh, wonderful and successful events. Regarding this session, I thank our speaker. All the speaker covered the, their topics comprehensively. And they cover whole the subject, but due to the lack of the time, the few, some portion were left. But I hope our students and postgraduate take benefit. As you know, tomorrow our fellowship exam is also started. So most of our postgraduates are also sitting here. Inshallah, they will take the advantage from this event. So thank you very much. I will g uh, now, this, if any query or question, you can ask. Uh, from the Any speaker. questions from the audience? Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Dr. Tasadduk, I really enjoyed your presentation on the desensitization therapy. It's uh, fabulous that you know you are providing transplants to such high risk patients. I just had a question because you mentioned about the cost of IVIG um, in your desensitization protocol. And so, do you use uh, FFPs or albumin for replacement in uh, TPE? And the reason that's relevant is because most of these protocols that were made in Hopkins and Cedar sinai uh, their phoresis sessions use uh, albumin. Hence, it is important that they give IVIG at the end. And from my understanding, most protocols, F uh, phoresis protocols in Pakistan you utilize FFPs, which actually have IVIG within them. So is it, in that case, is it necessary to give IVIG after each phoresis session? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harris. That's a wonderful question. And uh, being uh, working in the Pakistan, 
you have to have a tailor-made therapy. And uh, to go for the standard of care, it is very difficult sometimes to follow the standard of care. So you try to make uh, things which is acceptable for the patient as well as medical. So uh, we are not doing it with albumin, of course, because of the cost. So we are doing with FFPs. And uh, your second question is, yes, this is a good thought. I'm also looking into those articles and uh, Professor Rosting is one of them who doesn't like to give uh, IVIG. And maybe I'll, I'll be brave enough uh, in the near future to escape this IVIG. And uh, to be very honest, for the, for, from this year, we have decreased the dose. We have tried to decrease the dose of like uh, following that uh, John Hopkins protocol of 100 mg per kg. We are giving 50 mg per kg. And we are not getting much bad result. So I'm following Professor Rostring. So he never liked IVIG. He usually prefer rituximab along with uh, plasma phrases. So your question is valid. Maybe in the near future we'll escape the IVIG as well. Uh, I'm asking Pro Vice Chancellor of the Dow University of Health Sciences, Professor Kartar, to come on stage and uh, distribute the shields. Firstly, I'm asking Professor Abdul Manan Junejo to receive his shield, please. Professor Salman Imtiaz, Dr. Sonia Yaqub. Now from the speakers, I would like to call Professor Rubina Nakhvi. Dr. Vakaruddin Kashif. <laughs> Dr. Faisal Mahmood. Dr. Mahnoor Azam. And lastly, but not the least, Dr. Mohammad Tasadu Khan. Now you can proceed for the tea break. No? Wait. Okay. There's a special announcement. Um, we have actually invited uh, the, our sales mentor, Professor Adibul Hassan Rizvi. Because of his health, he was unable to come. Uh, so there is a special shield for him. We have made it. So we would like and request Professor Rubina to collect it from uh, uh, our pro vice chancellor. Thank you. Uh, now we have a, a small activity for the postgraduate trainees. Uh, there will be uh, 13 questions uh, and you will be answering through Kahoot. Uh, the process will be... Uh, 
Dr. Kashif will tell you the, uh, further about the code. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, kindly uh, log in to this www.kahoot.it, uh, write it on your browser and you will connect from it. And, and when maximum people have connected, uh, we will start the quiz. And at the end of the session, uh, the fastest and corrected, most correct answer will uh, receive a gift hamper from us. I would request the senior faculty to please proceed for the tea break and the uh, rest the postgraduates can wait for this Kahoot. Okay, sure. Please the senior faculty please uh, proceed for the tea break. Okay now we are going to start the session. Start Kari. Okay, you will have one uh, 30 seconds to answer the question, to, so please uh, answer fast. Let's start. Okay, a 28-year-old male known on Comop came for donor assessment from work. His urine PCR is 280mg. What is the next best approach for you? Is it repeat 24-hour urine for protein? Reject the donor? Start ACE inhibitor or repeat spot urinary protein creatinine ratio. Okay, so please proceed further. Okay, the fastest answer was from Dr. Asma. Okay, proceed. 19 year old female potential donor comes with her father who is recipient to evaluate willingness to donate. How should we proceed? get donor consent on an affidavit, ask the donor right away about the willingness for the surgery, request father to wait outside and let the doctor discuss with donor separately or get verbal consent from both donor and recipient. Okay, uh, Dr. Mukesh Kumar has, has done the fastest. Okay, next. Reg uh, according to Ben's classification, active antibody mediated disease is circulating DSA with severe tubulitis and interstitial inflammation or peritubularity capillary C4D staining and peritubularity capillaritis or interstitial inflammation or circulating DSA, mid-large vessel intimal arthritis and moderated interstitial nephritis. Peritubular capillary C4D deposition, circulating DSA and peritubular capillaritis. Okay, next. So this time Dr. Neha has given the fastest answer. Uh, C a CKD 5D patient secondary to FSGS inquires about treatment strategies to manage if his primary disease reoccurs post transplant. What will you answer? First line therapy includes a three day course of daily IV pulse of methylpred. Cyclophosphamide should be commenced once reoccurrence is confirmed. Nephrotic proteinuria if two weeks is present a normal light microscopy biopsy exclude FSGS or plasma exchange nine sessions plan should be commenced after diagnosis of FSGS. Okay, uh, Dr. Neha has again answered the first. Okay, for some, for same parent sibling, donor recipient pair, there is a 50% chance of zero HLA mismatch. This statement is correct or wrong? True false cannot be determined depends on the population genetics Do, like donor and recipient both are from same parents then what happens okay okay uh, okay dr neha has again answered the fastest uh, disease with the highest incidence of recurrence among the following options fsgs minimal chain disease mem membranous nephropathy and mesangioproliferative Okay, next. Okay, Dr. Neha is again answered. Okay, 48 year old male, uh, le life related renal transplant two years back on TAC, MMF, and corticosteroid. Renal biopsy was done showing chronic allograft injury. Which one is recommended? Increase steroid dose, decrease tacrolimus dose, replace tacrolimus with serolimus, or start belatisept? 
okay uh, dod has uh, surpassed dr neha now okay a 25 year old female status post live related renal transplant both recipient and donor are cmv serology negative what is the best prophylaxis protocol valgan cyclovir a po valgan cyclovir iv or gan cyclovir or gan cyclovir with oral valgan cyclovir Okay, uh, DOD has again answered. Okay, a CD220 is a surface receptor expressed most abundantly on which of the following cell type? T cell, macrophages, plasma cell, and B cell. Okay, okay. Next question. 49 year old male, live rated renal transplant six months ago, now complained of dyspnea, has TCMR treated with ATG. Uh, oxygen saturation is 89, ABG is 7.4 pH, 24 CO2, 69 oxygen, and 21 bicarb. X-ray is normal. Uh, what will you do? Uh, atypical serology, bronchoalveolar lavage, CT scan of chest, or lung bios biopsy? 48-year-old male, live rated renal transplant, 5 years previously, biopsy shows evidence of chronic allograft dysfunction now. Recommendation to start ACE inhibitor for protein urea will be when protein urea is less than 500 mg, protein urea is more than 500 mg, protein urea more than 1 gram, or protein urea more than 3 gram. Okay, now last two questions. Okay, Dr. Neha is again on the top. Uh, how frequent should be the monitoring for the HbA1c in patients with uh, no dead, new onset diabetes uh, in, in transplant? Every month? every three months, every six months, or every 12 months. New onset diabetes after transplant is now called post-transplant diabetes mellitus, PTDM. Okay, now for the last question. Okay, that's great. Dr. Neha is again winning. Uh, for, for one year post-transplant, 35-year-old uh, male now complaining of rising creatinine, ultrasound showed mild to moderate, hydronephrosis, CT scan, ureteral stenosis. What is the best answer for that? Everyone knows that. This is an easy answer. EBV, hepatitis, BK, uh, virus, or CMV? Okay. Okay, at third position is DOD, second is Dr. Rabia, and on first is uh, Dr. Neha, I guess. Okay, sure. Thank you very much. Now, gifts will be distributed after the fourth session of the talks. So, now finally, you can proceed to the tea break. Moving towards the first uh, talk of this session. On the topic of ABO incompatible kidney transplants by Professor Lionel Rosting, I would like to request him to come on stage and deliver his speech. So, good afternoon for those who are here, still here, surviving. So, uh, is there any place for ABO incompatible transplantation in Pakistan? Most likely, yes, right now, just to increase, to increase the donor pool size. For sure, having a swap program might be much more relevant. If you were to have a swap program, you could uh, not face with ABO incompatible transplant. But in the meantime, you don't have this program yet. And so therefore, uh, ABO incompatible transplantation might be possible. And with regards to the risk of infectious complications following uh, desensitization for ABOI, it's far much less than with uh, HLA incompatible transplant. So, oh, sorry. So, when we are talking about ABO incompatible transplant, we have to face with some immunological barriers. And so, these barriers are called isoagglutinins. These isoagglutinins are either IgMs or IgGs. So if you were to make an ABO incompatible transplant without uh, getting rid of them before transplantation with IgMs when they are present, 
this results in hyperacute rejection on the bench on the table. Conversely, uh, if the IgGs were to be high, this results in delayed ABMR as of day four to five. And at the end of the day, IgGs are always greater than IgM, so the titers are not really the same. And so we need to desensitize pre-transplant in order to avoid a rebound post-transplant. So, uh, indeed, as I said, uh, if you have a swap program, there is most likely no needs for having ABO incompatible transplant. Conversely, if you don't have a swap program, and in France we don't have a swap program, just in order to increase the don living donor size pool, we use ABO incompatible transplants. So, a brief history of ABOI kidney transplantation. It was performed in the 80s inadvertently uh, in two institutions, one in the States and one in uh, Belgium, in Europe. And indeed, those patients were successful, most likely because their isoclin titers were very low. And because of this uh, inadvertent uh, successful uh, cases, there was a program in Belgium. But in fact, the program uh, was very limited because there were some issues regarding rejections, infections, and for these selected patients, they were performing splenectomy because, you know, spleen is a huge reservoir of B cells, plasma cells, and nowadays we replace splenectomy by rituximab. They were using plasmapheresis in order to remove the isoagglutinins, and they were using immunosuppression. And the thing is that with uh, ABO incompatible transplantation, when the first phase uh, is gone, the first few weeks, two to three weeks, there is accommodation. Accommodation, it's not tolerance. Tolerance means without immunosuppression, you get tolerant to the aerograft. Conversely, with accommodation, you still have uh, evidence for complement deposits within the kidney. All the biopsies are C40 positive, but there is nothing at all. There is no consequence of that. So this is accommodation. And in 2022, we still do not know yet uh, how accommodation takes place. Most likely by clonal deletion of the plasma clone that produces the uh, isoagglutinins. So the rebirth of uh, ABOI, a kidney transplantation in the 90s, uh, was thanks to the Japanese teams. Why is that? Because in Japan, uh, in Shintoism, uh, the, the concept of brain dead uh, is, not, uh, is not there. And so therefore, they only rely on uh, living donation. And just in order to extend the donor pool size, they developed uh, ABOI uh, kidney transplantation. And as of 2000, they replaced splenectomy pre-transplant by rituximab. So this is the courtesy of my friend, Professor Ekawa from uh, Tokyo Women's Hospital. And so this is the registry of ABOI kidney transplantation in Japan. So this is the patient. So the time scale is here, 25 years, OK? And so you see the patient survival at 15 years is very good, at 25 years it's very good, and the graft survival, uh, the median time is about uh, 20 years, so it's, it's good. However, the results are far much better since 2000, since um, rituximab has replaced the splenectomy. And this is true from the very beginning, within the first year post-transplant, whereas thereafter it's almost parallel. So it means that by avoiding splenectomy, replacing by rituximab, you avoid infectious complications that might be life-threatening. Okay, so it works. So in blue, these are what is possible, what we're doing every day, O to AB, A or B to AB, because AB patients have no isoagglutinins. Conversely, those who are O, A or B have the isoagglutinins. And as I said, in most of the cases, IgG titers are greater than IgM titers. And the titers are always higher for the O patients as compared to those who are A or B. So how can we assess the isoclinic titers pre-transplant, pre-desensitization? 
So the most convenient uh, and uh, straightforward technique is to use the isoprene titration by hemagglutination. So it's very simple. So you take erythrocytes A or B, and you put the serum of your patients, and you dilute your serum. Neat first, and then one into two, into four, into eight, 16, 32, blah, blah, blah. And the dilution, the titer, sorry, is the dilution for which there is no hemolysis. For example, in that setting, there is no hemolysis, the titer is one into four. And what we consider as safe to get for transplant is to have a titer below one into eight, below or equal one into eight. So when it's greater than that, 16, 32, 64, 120, blah, 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 we have to get rid of this isoagglutinins pre-transplant. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so the, the, the easiest way, as I said, is to use the gel card uh, test, uh, which is a hemagglutination uh, test. And also, uh, if you were to make um, ABOI kinetic transplantation, you have to, to think of which type of blood you will transfuse to your patient. So if it comes to be red blood cells transfusion for any reason, you will give a red blood cell from the same type of the recipient. Conversely, if you have to give a plasma in the process of desensitization or post-transplant, if it's B or A into O, you will give the plasma of the same group of the donor. Conversely, if it's B into A or A into B, the plasma should be AB, okay? Just in order to avoid replenishing uh, the isoagglutinins. So we can get rid of the isoagglutinin thanks to desensitization with apheresis to remove the isoagglutinins and thanks to immunosuppression in order to prevent the rebound. So apheresis, you can use either non-specific apheresis, that is to say plasma apheresis or double filtration plasma apheresis. And if you use plasma apheresis, you can use um, with plasma or with albumin, but if it's with plasma, don't forget uh, to give the right plasma. Or you can use specific immunoabsorption columns. So these columns are covered with the A or B blood type group, okay, with the sugars. And so therefore the, blood, uh, the, the sera, uh, the, uh, the plasma is just going through the columns and it will remove very efficiently the specific anti-A or anti-B isoagglutinins. And with a single column, you can treat 15 to 20 liters of plasma. This will take about eight hours, but it's very efficient because it's efficient at removing IgMs. And as you know, IgMs are only present within the intravascular compartment. Conversely, the IgGs are equally distributed intravascular and interstitial. And the longer the session, the higher the efficiency of removal because you've got a refilling of the intravascular compartment during the session, and therefore, doing so, you avoid the rebound post plasmapheresis. I will skip that. Okay, so rituximab has to be given. Indeed, you will find some papers in which they don't give rituximab because the titers are quite low, and it works in, when the titers are, are low, you can skip rituximab in 80% of patients when they are very low, but in 40% of patients, they will lose the graft, which is stupid for sure. And so and rituximab uh, has to be given at least at 500 milligrams once. It's given between day minus 30 to day minus 10 pre-transplant. The longer, the better, I think. And indeed, you have to give a PCC prophylaxis, as we said earlier on. And at the same time as we give rituximab, we start with tacrolimus, MMF, and steroids, that is to say pre-transplant, and this avoids the rebound of the isoagglutinins. Okay, so as I said, you may have some rebound after the apheresis uh, session, especially after plasmapheresis. And uh, 
post-transplant, there is almost no rebound, so there is no point to reassess post-transplant via isoclinin titers. The only thing is to assess clinically of the patient and the serum creatinine, that's it. So, why do we speak about accommodation? We speak about accommodation because, for example, in this uh, Swedish uh, study, the patients were desensitized with specific immunosorption columns plus rituximab plus immunosuppression. And you see the target is one in two eight. There was a huge decrease at the time of transplant, it was almost nil, and afterwards you have got no rebound. So accommodation is it's called that because you don't have a rebound and within the kidney there, there are no damages. Indeed, if you only use rituximab without plasma pheresis, it's not enough. Indeed, there is a significant decrease of isoclin titers, but you see almost no patient is reaching the, the cutoff of 1 in 2, 8 or 16. And so therefore, you have to, do, to give at the same time apheresis plus rituximab. Okay. Okay, so this is that. Okay, so in our center, we do as such, we give rituximab, as of minus day 10, we start prednisone, tacrolimus, MMF. We, we give either DF, double filtration, plasma pheresis, or specific immunoabsorption, according to the titers. The higher the titers, uh, the much more need for immunoabsorption. Conversely, the titers are medium, 1 in 2, 120, for example. You can only use plasma pheresis. And uh, the goal is to have a titers below 1 in 2, 8 the day of transplant, and we induce with basiliximab and not with ATG in order to avoid a BK virus nephropathy post transplant. <coughs> <coughs> so, post transplant, uh, we give a same immunosuppression, and as of day 15, we replace MMF by Everolimus in order to prevent the reactivation of BK virus. Why is that? Because BK reactivation is far much frequent after ABOI as compared to HLA incompatible kidney transplant. And we perform surveillance biopsies at month 3 and 12. So these are the results in Europe comparing ABOI to ABO compatible uh, living kidney transplantation. You see the results, patient survival, graft survival are similar. They are slightly better when the apheresis technique of is adsorption as compared to plasma exchange, so it's slightly more efficient with regards to graft survival. Uh, a incompatible or B incompatible kidney transplants have the same outcome. This is the Japanese uh, study. So this is the UK registry whereby you can see that ABO incompatible living uh, kidney transplantation has the same graft survival as compared to altruistic donation or pair exchange donor. So at the end of the day, there is no difference. So I'm not sure that we need a, a pair exchange program. ABO, incompatible transplant results are very good. Rejection? Yes. We have some cellular rejection, but as for ABO compatible transplantation, so it's not a problem. Conversely, we really have to be aware of isoagglutinin mediated humoral rejection. It always occurs by day 3 to 10 post-transplant, and the symptoms are mild fever, sudden oligonuria, rising serum creatinine. If you were to make a kidney biopsy, it's pointless. But if you make it, you find interstitial hemorrhage and diffuse C40. You know, I've been doing more than 120 ABUI cases in my center. And at the very beginning, for the first patient, uh, very few, but some of them have had these features. We made the biopsy, the biopsy was horrible, but after treatment, they recovered all. And so we no longer make the biopsy now. We immediately uh, treat them with plasma pheresis, and after four sessions, we give rituximab, 
And in most of the cases, in my experience, every case has uh, been treated successfully, except one case in which we gave eculizumab in order to save the kidney because of this type of rejection. So this is a case of a patient. So you see the isoclin titers 1 into 32 before we start desensitization. So it was not that high. The day of transplant, you see the titers were 1 into 4. This is the, uh, the, the, uh, the black lines. It was fine, but after four days, it developed anuria. You see in orange, we've got a serum creatinine, a decrease first, and then an increase, anuria. And so he benefited from seven plex sessions, steroid pulses, and at the end, rituximab, and he recovered diuresis after a few days, and thereafter, serum creatinine declined and became normal. And now the azulin titer is one into four. So, good outcome. What are the post-op complications? There are some. So first of all, these are the intraoperative blood losses. If you come across with the ABOI uh, scientific literature, you would see that all the ABOI desensitized patients have more bleeding issues during and after transplantation, most likely because when we perform plasmapheresis in Europe, at least, it's against albumin because fresh frozen plasma is too expensive and so we give instead albumin and this might concur to having more intraoperative blood losses. <coughs> so this is more my experience in uh, when I was in Toulouse. We compared ABOI patients to ABO inco uh, compatible patients and with regards to uh, renal artery thrombosis, renal vein thrombosis, uh, renal artery stenosis, urinary leakage, lymphocytes, uh, one decence and peritoneal breaches. It was very similar across the two groups. So the major infectious concern is regarding BK virus reactivation. So this is a German study, the first one to demonstrate that if you compare ABOI to ABO-compatible living donors, you see the rate of BK virus nephropathy is almost three times higher after ABOI. And these results have been also found in the US registry, whereby they compared the rate of BK virus nephropathy in HLA-incompatible patients who were desensitized with uh, plasmapheresis, IVIG, rituximab, to ABOI uh, desensitized patients. As you can see, also in the US, the, the incidence of BK virus reactivation was three times as much with ABOI. And also the time to BK virus nephropathy was shorter with BK virus, uh, with uh, ABOI patients. So this is something to bear in mind, and this is the reason why we never give ATG to our ABOI patients, never. And the reason why we replace, as of post-op day 15, MMF by 30 can with a minimization of tacrolimus. And in that US study, the uh, independent risk factors for developing BK virus nephropathy were, were the age, the higher the age, the higher the risk, and the ABOI incompatibility. So to conclude, it's possible to have an, or to set up an ABOI kidney transplant program, provided you've got a good immunology lab to assess accurately the isoclin titers. This is the first thing to do because you can be in huge trouble if you cannot trust your lab. So this is the first thing to do. And when, when it is done, then you can move to your patients and you have to select only those patients with low titers or intermediate titers. But forget the high titers. For the high titers, you need to put into the play at least one immunoabsorption session. Otherwise, you will never succeed or you may expose your patients to hyperacute rejection or delayed acute rejection. So the humoral rejections that are mediated by isoagglutinins occur mostly within the first three weeks post-transplant. And in the uh, Japanese registry, they have had no uh, isoagglutinin mediated rejection beyond day 21. So this is very important to keep in mind. So they are not too expensive. Well, it's only rituximab plus the cost of a few sessions of plasmapheresis. We never give IVIG, as I 
in this setting. And finally, uh, it's a very good alternative to, uh, to ABO compatible uh, transplantation when you don't have ABO compatible living donors. So this is my home city in the winter time. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now, moving towards the second uh, lecture of this uh, last uh, session. Now, I would like to call Dr. Mansoor Shah, a very well-renowned senior nephrologist working at Al Khan University Hospital in South City, on the topic of post-transplant diabetes mellitus. Assalamualaikum. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Sadduk and his team too for inviting me to give this uh, brief talk on post-transplant diabetes, although it doesn't cause any acute complications, but it does contribute to long-term problems. This is the timeline of the transplant pros, uh, trans since transplants were started. And and it was, uh, first of all, the transplant physicians were all uh, centered on the uh, rejections and allograft loss, so high doses of steroids were used. So it was not until 1964 that post-transplant diabetes was recognized as a significant problem. The incidence of uh, post-transplant diabetes varies from organ to organ, but it can be as low as 4 or 2.5 percent and up to 25 percent. But I think the lower value underestimates and the higher value overestimates uh, the occurrence of post-diabetes depending on <coughs> the, what are the variations because prior to lack of standard defini definition, what was the post-transplant diabetes or what it will come to that and presence of modifiable or non-modifiable risk factors, duration of follow-up looked at. If you look at one year, it is much lower as compared to later follow-ups. And primary diagnostic indication, because some indications predispose to transplant. So what is local experience? Locally, we see this is from the SIUT. There was an incidence of about 15.7% of post-diabetes transplant. And this is from Lahore, which again, falls within the same range of 24.3% in their study. So what are the risk factors for developing post-diabetes transplant, uh, post-transplant diabetes? So we have non-modifiable risk factors like the athletic origins, age if they're more than 45, male recipients, and the most important is the family history of diabetes. So we should always inquire in transplant patients whether they have family history of diabetes or not. This is the one single most important non-modifiable factor. Otherwise, history of acute rejections and deceased donor and male donor uh, recipients are risk factors. Okay. Then we have potentially uh, modifiable risk factors. Top of the line is HCV. It has been noted patients, uh, HCV recipient patients have got four times higher incidence of post-transplant diabetes as compared to those without HCV. CMV infection and uh, also predisposes to higher incidence of post-transplant diabetes and same with pre-transplant impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting glucose and those with uh, proteinuria and hypomagnesemia. And modifiable risk factors, if we can modify them before the transplant, that is obesity, a BMI of more than 30, and of course, the use of immunosuppressants, they are all diabetogenic. And like we'll talk about how they cause uh, predisposed to transplant diabetes, serolimus also causes uh, insulin resistance and vitamin deficiency. This is a graph showing this is the time of transplant and this is cyclosporin versus uh, tacrolimus, the pink being tacrolimus and tacrolimus is much more diabetogenic, almost causes 30% uh, incidence of diabetes by about two years as compared to uh, cyclosporin. And then we have end organ specific diagnosis like in end stage renal disease, but autosomal dominant kidney disease is more associated with post transplant diabetes and liver disease, it is hepatitis C or NASH as a diagnosis, and end stage lung disease, it is a fib cystic fibrosis which is associated with higher incidence of solid post-solid organ transplant diabetes. Now this gives us the pathophysiology of uh, how uh, diabetes develops. It is a 
There are two factors which result in the development of diabetes, a beta cell dysfunction and insulin resistance. The, for the beta cell function, calcineurin is necessary for the function of the beta cells and we have calcineurin inhibitors. So both of them called beta cell dysfunction with increased isolate cell apoptosis. Now steroids can cause insulin resistance. How do they cause insulin resistance? Number one, they cause increase in blood glucose by causing gluco increased gluconeogenesis and decreased glycogen synthesis. This floods the bloodstream, bloodstream with sugars and at the, in the adipose tissue, they inhibit the synthesis of glucose transporters. So the glucose does not enter the uh, adipose tissue. And in the muscles, they inhibit the insulin-mediated glucose transport. So all the sugars. So these are the actually gates which, which the steroids close for the utilization of glucose in the bloodstream. And this results in insulin resistance. And in the adipose tissue, they also cause dyslipidemias by causing increased lipolysis, increased triglycerides, and increased adiposity. So there are two basic effects which immunosuppressants do, beta cell dysfunction and insulin resistance. So these are the effects of various immunosuppressants on what the metabolic profile in the post-transplant diabetes like corticosteroids, they increase post-transplant diabetes, tacrolimus increases almost this 30% incidence after two years, uh, whereas cyclosporin does so, but not so much. mTORs also cause insulin resistance and cause may increase the incidence of diabetes. There is increased lipids, whereas the monoclonal antibodies do not affect the metabolic profile, nor does the mycophenolate or azathioprine. The blood pressure is increased more so by steroids and tacrolimus and much more by cyclosporin. The nomenclature used for uh, describing various kinds of hyperglycemia in transient associated hyperglycemia of transplant, which usually occurs in the first two weeks of transplant. Almost if you, if you tend to diagnose diabetes in this period, almost 90% of the patients will be diagnosed as diabetes. So the, as the immunosuppressant doses goes down, the sugar levels go down. Then initially it was called steroid diabetes because high doses of uh, steroids were being used uh, to control the rejections. And then it was new onset diabetes after transplant. But in 2014, the consensus conference uh, reverted NODAT to NODAM or post-transplant diabetes because NODAT did not include those patients who may have had developed diabetes before transplant because the metabolism of insulin occurs in the kidney and then the, when the kidney was not working and the patients were on dialysis so the insulin effect would last much longer and the, and the sugars would have remained controlled. When the transplant occurred this just flipped 180 degrees and now the insulin was normally metabolized and the sugars started going up. So that's when after that they start they should be post-transplant diabetes mellitus, not new onset, because this would include those patients as well who had pre-existing diabetes which was not diagnosed. The diagnostic criteria are the same as American Diabetic Association and Kedigo guidelines also put the same uh, parameters for diagnosis that is an A1C of 6.5, fasting glucose more than 126, and random glucose or two, or two hours after OGTT at 200 milligrams or any of the symptoms of diabetes. What's the difference? If there are any uh, endocrine colleagues here, I apologize to them for the simplicity of this. We have type 1 diabetes where the basic problem is insulin deficiency, type 2 diabetes which is mainly insulin resistance, and post-transplant diabetes where we have both pancreatic cell dysfunction contributed to by calcineurin inhibitors and insulin resistance contributed to by the steroids. And this can happen at any age, but there are also many transplant uh, specific confounders for occurring of the diabetes. The ketoacidosis is quite rare in post-transplant diabetes. How to manage these? In the initial phases, when the patients are in the ICU, insulin infusion to keep the sugars between 140 and 180, and in non-critically L to keep the fasting sugars less than 140 and random plasma glucose less than 180, 
and using basal, bolus basal insulin to control the sugars. Post transplantation, week one to six, that is when the patients are getting discharged. If the insulin requirement is more than 20 units, then use regular aspart insulin or NPH. Glargine is usually not recommended. I will show you a graph why glargine is not recommended uh, in these patients, although it is being used, but it is not largely recommended. Oral hypoglycemics, if insulin needs uh, less than 20 units. And we can use, as oral hypoglycemics, we can use D magnetites or DPP-4 inhibitors, if unable to use, then consider glipizide. These are short-acting medications. So in the chronic phase, the lifestyle modification, that is dietary, dietary uh, advice, weight reduction, exercise, they are all part of the uh, diabetic management. Pharmacological therapy, one should consider efficacy, side effects, potential drug-drug interaction, and the cost of the treatment. Sulfonyl ureas, we can use glipizide or glimepride, which are fairly safe. Megalinitides are very short-acting, and they cover the post-prandial period only, like ripaglinide. DPP-4 inhibitors, which are the gliptons, which are the commonly used now, cetagliptin, vildagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin, they are safe and effective. They are mainly cleared by the kidneys. So their doses have to be adjusted according to the EGFR, except the lina linagliptin, which has got enter, which is cleared by enterohepatic circulation. The cetagliptin can increase the cyclosporin levels, so one has to be careful using cetagliptin in patients who are in cyclosporin. Metformin, some people have got reservations regarding metformin, but if the EGFR is more than 30 ml, one can use metformin. GLP-1 uh, agonists like liraglutide, exenatide, dulaglutide, they improve glycemic control, they enhance glucose-dependent insulin secretion, delay gastric emptying, uh, regulates postprandial glucose and reduce food intake. The only problem with uh, GLP-1 agonists is the price. A month's uh, dose can cost up to anywhere between 20 and 30,000 rupees. Alpha glycosidase inhibitors considered if the options are not available. Thiazolindines, deons like uh, pioglutazone are generally not used in transplant recipients because they can cause edema and use of diuretics can increase the uh, calcineurin toxicity. SGLT inhibitors, they tend to be used as second line agents, limited safety data in this population. There may be decrease in EEGFR of more than 10% in the first month of use, which then recovers out of it. They, can, they cause glucosuria, weight loss, and improve glycemic control. And there's emerging data which suggests that STL2 inhibitors may be associated with benefits beyond glycemic control in the kidney transplant recipients as well. Insulin, if sugars remain more than 200 or A1C above 7%, then you add insulin or replace with insulin. Now, this is a uh, graph to remember. See, prednisolone is used in the morning. In these post-transplant diabetes patients, the morning sugars are mostly normal. Majority of them have, will have normal sugars. As you give steroids over there, the glycemic effect of the steroids occurs in about seven to eight hours, and they will peak. Now, this is why I said the glargine is not recommended, because glargine is basal and may cause hypoglycemia during the night. So use of NPH would be better because this will fit the profile because the NPH, the effect of NPH would cover in about six to seven hours when the glycemic effect of steroid is peaking. So it may be better to look for postprandial uh, plasma glucose rather than fasting to diagnose or look at the sugar profile in patients with transplants on, on steroids. So adjustment of immunosuppression to control, difficult to control diabetes, glucocorticoid steroids, glucocorticoids to the minimum dose. How about switching tacrolimus uh, to cyclosporin because this is more diabetogenic. This is risky. There are small studies that uh, it can be done, but it is not recommended. mTOR inhibitors are not recommended because they may worsen insulin or glycemia control. Okay, just uh, last. 
So they can cause potential consequences, decreased graft function, decreased patient survival, and increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So it is important to control post-transplant diabetes. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now I'm requesting uh, Dr. Rukaya for her lecture on uh, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. First of all, um, I would like to thank Dr. Tasadduk for inviting me to give a brief lecture on post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders after renal transplant. Um, today I will discuss our our case which we are dealing. Brief introduction, the incidence, the pathological classification, WHO based, the risk factors, clinical features, case presentation which is rare, a rare, a rare case presentation, its prognostic factors and management. Uh, a 50 year old female live related renal transplant uh, which was done in 2002. The cause of renal failure was not known. She was on regular follow-up in our OPD. Her baseline serum creatinine was 1.3 to 1.5. Her immunosuppression included cyclosporin 25 mg twice a day, azathioprine 100 mg a day and delta cotyl 5 mg once a day. Pre-transplant Epstein-Barr virus status was not known and she has no history of pre-transplant induction. Few months back, she was presented with a lump in the back. On examination, there was a small lump around two centimeter, soft lump in the back. At that time, her baseline labs were normal. There was no history of fever, weight loss, or any constitutional symptoms. Wide local excision of the lump done and the biopsy showed high grade B cell lymphoma. We did a sequential risk stratified treatment which will be fur further discussed. These are the labs, histo immunohistochemistry, which showed CD20 positivity and KI67, which is a, a proliferative index marker and it, it also shows the prognostic prognostic marker. Bone marrow biopsy done, which was normal. PTLD is a feared complication. PTLD represents a heterogeneous group of lymphoid and plasmacytic proliferative diseases, which occur as a result of immunosuppressive therapy in patients who have solid organ transplant or bone marrow transplant. Proliferation mainly affects B lymphocytes in more than 85% of the cases and in 15% of the cases, it usually affects T, T cells, T lymphocytes. The higher the immunosuppression and increase the cumulative dose, then there is more chance of developing post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. The disease occur in a wide, wide variety of locations like Extranodal, it can involve the bone marrow, CNS, or GIT. Host drive PTLD is more common as compared to donor drive PTLD, or a PTLD can only involve the allograft tissue. The first case report of PTLD was reported in 1968 by Duke and its colleagues. One cadaveric renal transplant was done in 1968. After three months, patient developed herpes infection, and after a few months, he developed reticulum cell sarcoma. The term PTLD was first introduced in 1984 by Stats and his colleagues because after few renal transplants, a few tumors were developed in patients. So term post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder was introduced. The cumulative incidence of post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders in renal transplant patients is 1 to 3 percent. 
well more than 80% of the cases occurring in the first year of transplant without t cell depletion the risk further decreases to 0.5 to 1% this is the cumulative incidence which showed that in multi organ intestine and lung transplant the incidence is less than 20% well in hematopoietic stem cell transplant the risk is more than 20% this is the revised who pathological classification in which which showed that ptld is divided into four categories hyperplastic or non destructive which is mostly ebv associated the second one is polymorphic which includes polymorphic hyperplasia and polymorphic ptld third one is monomorphic and the last one is hodgkins like ptld now the risk factors the majority of ptlds like 55 to 65% are ebv associated immunosuppression leads to lack of depressed t cell function with association of lack lack of t cell control of b cell proliferation which leads to uncontrolled proliferation of ebv transformed cells which leads to development of ptld the risk of ptld is more increased when ebv negative patients received a transplant graft from ebv a positive donor that's why the american society of transplant and akdigo recommend ebv viral monitoring uh, intensively like weekly to biweekly for around 1 year this is the pathogenesis how ebv causes ptld initially when a primary infection occurs there is a primary cytotoxic t cell response if persistent infection then there is a memory t cell formation and then secondary t cell response immunosuppression immunosuppression causes this secondary t cell response and memory t cell stop so that's why there is a formation of post transplant lymphoproliferative disorders well uh, this graph shows that in non destructive type there is a 100% chance of ptld well in polymorphic and uh, hodgkins type there is a chance of 90% in monomorphic form there is only a 50% chance of ebv positivity ebv ebv epstein barr virus negative ptld occurs tends to occur late when as compared to ebv a positive ebd ebv a positive patients mostly presented in the first year of renal transplants there are some other infectious etiologies like cmv human herpes virus 8 and hepatitis c these all are all are related to development of post transplant lymphoproliferative disorders well uh, immunosuppression plays a higher role ATG calcineurin inhibitors and anti CD3 which is OK T3 all these are implicated in the development of causing PTLD in some studies uh, which showed that tacrolimus is more associated with PTLD as compared to cyclosporin age less than 10 years and more than 60 years are more are more associated with PTLD because in pediatric population there is an increased chance of developing uh, of developing epstein's barr virus in their post transplant course and in older patients there is decreased immune survival uh, some genetic factors like increased chance with hla a2 11 b5 18 b21 and decreased risk with hla a3 and dr7 the clinical features can be like fever pharyngitis tonsil enlargement or any constitutional symptoms or it can be like if it involve git tract cns tract then clinical features varied accord according to disease involvement this is one case report a rare case report which was published in 2022 a 31 year old male patient with identical live related renal transplant in 2007 is on regular follow up in brazil his immunosuppression included tacrolimus and mmf in 2014 when he came for routine visit his creatinine rose to 2 mg per deciliter from 1.3 mg per deciliter 
her general physical examination was normal and graft was normal renal biopsy was planned which shows dense lymphocytic infiltrate affecting 75% of the sample first they think that it is acute rejection this is the biopsy which shows dense lymphocytic infiltrates the immunohistochemistry for c4d and C sv41 negative well immunohistochemical profile uh, showed a positivity of cd3 20 138 cd30 kappa lambda and ki67 ebv pcr was negative the patient was treated with uh, chop r chop therapy like uh, rituximab and chop therapy and uh, with addition of prednisolone and they convert tacrolimus to sirolimus during treatment the creatinine remained between 1.6 to 2.2 and uh, up at the end of six monthly cycles of chemotherapy the patient was disease free currently uh, five years after the end of treatment the patients became asymptomatic with a stable creatinine of 2 and uh, and he was on sirolimus and prednisolone the prognosis of ptld depends on the type its features and stage of the disease mostly the monoclonal form is more malignant as compared to polymorphic forms and the adverse prognostic factors are uh, high grade lymphoma histology cns involvement bone involvement disseminated form of the disease like more than two nodal involvements decreased albumin concomitant hepatitis c or b infection and late ptld in uh, this is a based analysis australia and new zealand dialysis and transplant registry in which francis and his colleagues demonstrated that those patients with a kidney transplant who are who are having ptld they have 10 year poorer prognosis with excess mortality occurring only the first years post transplant well uh, i already discussed that bone marrow and cerebral lymphomas are higher risk factors now the management the treatment of ptld is very much dependent on morphological subtype the most important is the reduction in immunosuppression other subtypes includes aggressive immunotherapy or uh, or r therapy r chop therapy or sequential or risk stratified sequential the current recommendation includes CN reducing cni dose discontinuing antimetabolites and continuing steroids if possible the main treatment of a solid organ transplant ptld encompasses uh, re reduction in immunosuppression rituximab and chemotherapy well the early lesions can be eradicated by ri, RI alone whereas polymorphic and monomorphic can be treated with immunosuppression this is the ptld cells and these are all the drugs this is the new one histone decyclase inhibitor this is the new one while these all are already used if ri is not feasible then we can give the chop therapy or it, it can be combined with rituximab or rituximab can be given alone this is basically the treatment divided into three sequential risk stratified sequential and nowadays modified risk stratified sequential the sequential treatment includes firstly four cycles of rituximab then chop therapy for four weeks the risk stratified sequential after the sequential treatment if the patient develop complete response then we gave four cycles of rituximab our patient received risk stratified sequential uh, the overall the median overall survival was almost equal in both the studies in both the treatments uh, I discussed the sequential treatment uh, it involves four cycles of rituximab weekly then four cycles of CHOP if complete remission occurs then no chemotherapy was advised and again four cycles of rituximab can be given there is currently no evidence that bus last last time the new treatment option is brentuximab and uh, the summary of reduction uh, the most the most important treatment is reduction of immunosuppression or we can give the r chop or simply rituximab thank you Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, now we are moving towards the last lecture of this session. Uh, I would like to call uh, Dr. Shahinila, who is uh, who was the part of renal transplant unit for uh, about uh, two years, 
and she got trained for infectious diseases at SIUT and now she's practicing at uh, Patel Hospital. Now, ma'am, please come on stage for your lecture. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Tasadduk, for inviting me for this lecture. Uh, I'm the last speaker of today's evening, but uh, my topic, pulmonary infection in renal transplants, you know, these can, can't be the last infections in renal transplant. So the, pul so the pulmonary infection in renal transplant are the leading cause of morbidity and mortality. And the changing the immunosuppression protocols have contributed to the improved graft survival and the patient survival, but at the cost of risk of increased infections. So more immunosuppression and there are chances of more infections. So the immunosuppression should be the well balanced because if there is too little immunosuppression, there would be the chances of rejection. And with too much uh, immunosuppression, there would be infections and the neoplasia. So the immunosuppression should be well balanced. So if we see the timeline of infections, which uh, Dr. Fessel has already discussed, I'm, I will go briefly. The, uh, we divided the timeline of infections in the three uh, you know, categories. Immediately after transplantation, first month, then one to six months, and then after six months. In the first six months, you can see in the first six months there are chances, infections similar to the uh, 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 patients in any other surgery, aspiration pneumonia or gram-negative bacterial uh, pneumonia or the septic emboli. But after uh, first month and in one to six months, there are chances of uh, opportunistic infections because the effect of immunosuppression ar uh, arises. They have started to appear. That, so we see the opportunistic infection after one to six months. And these opportunistic infections are mostly caused by the viral uh, viruses like CMV virus or uh, herpes viruses, other herpes viruses. And then fungal infections, we, uh, we include the spergillus and PGP, which cause opportunistic infections. And after six months, you know, the, uh, the infections are divided into the, the patients which have, uh, who has normal graft function. So they have infections similar to the general population in the community. The patients who have suboptimal graft function and requiring immunosuppression, they have again the chances of opportunistic infection. The clock starts again from the intense immunosuppression, and they have chance. Uh, they are at risk of uh, getting opportunistic infections. And there is always a chance of chronic viral infection in 10 to 15, uh, 5 to 10 percent. And these chronic viral infection predispose to the organ failure and malignancy. So pulmonary infections are most common in the first six months with a peak at about three months. And bacterial pneumonia is the most common cause in the pulmonary infections. And uh, there is a study which, which showed the incidence of early bacterial pneumonia in kidney, kidney transplant recipients is 6 to 30 percent, with high mortality around 35 percent. And uh, there is obviously a risk of no nosocomial pathogens, gram-negative bacteria especially, which are mostly MDROs. And empirical antibiotic therapy should be, you know, started early in these patients because the pneumonia in transplant recipients is rapidly progressive. So the antibiotic should be started and, uh, and, it, and the antibiotics should be depend on the previous colonization of the recipients and the bacterial resistance pattern of that institution according to the antibiogram of that institution. So this is a study uh, uh, which showed, uh, this was a retrospective study of 29 uh, kidney transplant recipients who developed pulmonary infections. And the infections, these infections mostly present uh, within the three months. And the mixed infections were common, 62% have mixed infections, 24% have viral infections, and 13.8% of patients have bacterial infections. And the CT manifestations of these pulmonary infections are, you know, uh, very complex and diverse. But the most common finding was the ground glass opacity. Um, this is another study which published last year. And uh, this study was from India, which showed the, um, they studied 88 kidney transplant patients, uh, um, out of which 102 has pulmonary infections. Uh, 
and 32% presented in the first year of transplant. And the bacterial infections with 29.4% were most common, followed by the tuberculosis, 23.5%, then the fungal infections, then a PCP, viral, and nocardial infections. This is another study which shows uh, uh, early after transplantation, gram-negative bacteria, especially Klebsiella, E. coli, Pseudomonas are the most common. And six months after transplantation, pneumonias are mostly due to the community inquired uh, bacteria like Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza, Mycoplasma, and Chlamydia. This is a study from SIUT, Pakistan, and uh, in this study, they also, you know, see the pulmonary infection in renal transplant recipients. They see the frequency of pulmonary infection in renal transplant recipients, but they do not, you know, they do not uh, uh, study in this study the timeline. Uh, they did not mention the time of transplant uh, uh, in these infections, but they reviewed the 1,015 cases of suspected pneumonia, and in, in these patients, they found the Haemophilus influenza was the most commonest organism in community echoid pneumonia, whereas in hospital echoid pneumonia, the Klebsiella was the commonest with 40% multidrug resistance. 10% infection was contributed by the aspergillus, and pneumocystis caused, uh, 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 is responsible in 5% of patients. So the opportunity, opportunistic infections present in one to six months after transplant. And the uh, uh, organisms causing opportunistic infections include the nucardia, legionella, non-tuberculous mycobacterium, mycobacterium tuberculosis, rhodococcus, PJP, and the herpes viruses, which include the CMV, varicella zoster, and herpes simplex virus. So the P, uh, PJP and fungal infections and CMB was uh, covered before. I will cover the nucardia as opportunistic infection. Is, it is a gram-positive rod environmental pathogen, most commonly found in the soil and the water. And the patient, you know, it, uh, when the patient transplant patient exposed to the soil or the water contaminated with nucardia, it gets the nucardia infection. And it can, it can also be, you know, can, uh, a patient can be infected by the direct inoculation of the organism in the skin. Mostly present such pulmonary nodules or consolidation or cavitation, and it usually presents months to years after transplantation. Diagnosis uh, depends on the chest imaging, X-ray or H HRCT, which usually shows the nodules, cavities, infiltrates with consolidation. There would be the gram positive rods on the gram staining. And we, it, it, it is a weekly acid fast bacilli, so we need the modified zeal nail cell stain for the identification of nucardia. Uh, organism can be cultured in the blood, bile, or sputum samples. Histopathology can also be used for the diagnosis. And nucardia is a neurotropic, uh, you know, uh, bacteria. So even in asymptomatic pulmonary nucardiosis, we should obtain MRI brain because asymptomatic brain involvement is very common in these patients. And the treatment uh, is uh, changed according to the site and uh, site of infection. If there is brain involvement, we, we have to use three drugs with one uh, uh, parenteral drug. But in pulmonary nucardiosis, we used two drugs. So MRI brain is mandatory in nucardia, asymptomatic uh, nuc uh, pulmonary nucardiosis patient. This is a CT finding, uh, having the ground uh, consolidation and cavitation. This is a study from, uh, published last year in BMJ. And it showed, uh, you know, the incidence of, they found the incidence of 0.32% uh, uh, in their study. Uh, nocardia was diagnosed in 0.32% of patients. And uh, pneumonia was the most frequent presentation, 15.2%, followed by the brain abscess in 8.4% of patients. Administration of ATG, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and presentation of uh, CNS nocardia were associated with increased risk of graft rejection. This is a study from the SIUT, uh, Pakistan. And uh, you know, they sh uh, showed the incidence of 0.8%. They evaluated 3,415 patients, in which 29 patients were diagnosed with nocardia. 
and uh, they used only the culture positive, uh, they included only culture positive cases of nocardia. And interestingly, no patients developed inf nocardia infection on co trimoxazole pro prophylaxis, which was used for uh, pneumocystis. 31% patients have disseminated infection to the brain and connective tissue. So treatment of nocardia includes a septron in higher dose, plus the combination, uh, we have to use a combination therapy uh, in the case of nocardia. If the, there is pulmonary nocardia, we use the uh, septron along with the uh, lenizolid or uh, carbapenems, but we have uh, uh, high resistance of carbapenem and ceftriaxone in our samples of, uh, in our uh, nocardia patients. So we use uh, amino glycosides along with ciptron or coenolones. And the uh, treatment and treatment duration depends on the susceptibility data and the site of infection. Another opportunistic infection in, uh, in transplant is the tuberculosis, which is endemic in our region. And transplant patients usually develop uh, tuberculosis after the reactivation of latent tuberculosis, or it can be transmitted from the donor, or it can be acquired from the community. So this is the uh, uh, data. This is a WHO data which showed the incidence of post-transplant tuberculosis. And as if we compare the uh, incidence of tuberculosis in transplant population from the journal population, we can see there is, uh, you know, in the journal population, incidence of uh, transplant is, uh, uh, incidence of tuberculosis is 50, in Pakistan, it's 15.2%. And in general population, it is 265 per 100,000 uh, population. So this study was done uh, at SIUT Karachi to see the, uh, you know, to see the effect of isoniazid pro uh, prophylaxis in transplant patients because there are higher chances of getting, you know, of uh, reactivation of tuberculosis, of getting TB from the, uh, uh, or getting TB, TB from the community. So they did this study to see the efficacy of isoniazid prophylaxis in renal transplant recipients. And they uh, started the INH prophylaxis from uh, 2009. Uh, no IGRA or DST was done in these patients, but active TB was ruled out. And total of 910 patients were reviewed. Out of this, 46 patients developed TB as compared to 15% in the historical controls. If you see the uh, graph, if you see this graph, there is, you know, uh, This 0 to 12 months, when the patients in pre-INH, uh, in the pre-INH historical controls, there were 52%, you know, cases, 52% uh, uh, chances of getting the TB, and there are 13% in the post-INH group. From 13 to 24 months, this is equal. 25% in the pre-INH group and post-INH group, 20%. And you know, see this. 67% after the two years, when the INH prophylaxis was stopped at one year after transplantation, uh, after two years, the post-INH group has a surge of uh, tuberculosis with 67% of cases. So this is, uh, you know, community, uh, it's not, it's questionable okay, how long we should continue the TB prophylaxis, isoniazid prophylaxis in our transplant recipients because, you know, uh, the, uh, we are living in endemic area and chances of uh, uh, getting TB from community is very high for these transplant recipients. So diagnosis depends on the smear microscopy, a gene expert, which, which has sensitivity in between my, uh, culture and microscopy and mycobacterial culture, which is the, still the gold standard. And treatment depend, uh, and depend on the uh, susceptibility testing. But the most important in transplant is drug-drug interactions bet between rifampicin and CNIs inhibitors. So we should frequently monitor drug levels when we are using rifampicin.
this is the last slide. Uh, uh, briefly, I will, uh, I will show the uh, algorithm for the investigation. Uh, if a patient present with a cl clinical suspicion of pulmonary infection, we should go for the chest x-ray, CT scan, and the sputum and blood cultures, but if the, and start empirical antimicrobial uh, therapy. But if there is no response in 24 to 48 hours, we should go for the invasive procedures because early diagnosis and treatment is mandatory in transplant recipients, and pneumonia in these patients is rapidly progressive. So uh, go for the bell or biopsy and uh, send this fluid, bell fluid, for the gram stain. All these, you, you know, uh, investigations are necessary in uh, ruling out the opportunistic infections as well as the routine uh, infections. Summary, there is a you know, high mortality of, uh, because of pulmonary infections in renal transplant recipients. Early diagnosis, especially invasive procedures, can lead to definitive treatment and decrease morbidity and mortality. Community acquired bacterial infections and tuberculosis predominate with no specific timeline. And opportunistic infections like CMV and PJP usually present late after cessation of prophylactic therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Now we are uh, concluding today's symposium and uh, towards the end, the last question and answer session. Uh, first, the panel of, uh, panel of experts. You're also tired now. Can you hear me? So I think uh, we must thank all the speakers for giving some good talks. And what was heartening was that some local data, very good local data were also shared. If you have any quick questions, yes, please. Uh, Professor Austin, thank you for such an informative talk. Uh, I just want to know about, uh, you talk about ABU incompatible testing. Uh, you mentioned two tests, the gel card and the direct method. We call it as a tube method. So are you uh, performing both the tests? simultaneously or which or which one is more preferential for the determination of anti anti-butyl would you please elaborate so thank you for your question so we only we only perform the gel card test that's it it takes about uh, 45 minutes uh, so it's uh, not automated for sure and the readings, are, well, it's visually reading, and so therefore there is a margin of error according to the technician. But at the end of the day, it's reproducible and um, it's, it's sufficient. Thank you. Pleasure. Any other questions? Uh, first of all, I'm thankful to Dr. Tasuduk for inviting. Uh, I am looking forward this question towards uh, Tasuduk and a uh, few comments from Professor Rostring. As all the protocols for the desensitization drugs are available, still we are uh, far away from ABO incompatible transplantation. What could be the reason? Uh, that's a good, good question and that's a burning question inside me because I'm looking forward for this ABO incompatible for the last two years. And I'm trying hard to start this program in our university. This actually just required a very vigilant immunologist and uh, vigilant uh, blood bank team. And uh, since you all are aware, we are working in, uh, you know, some restricted environment that we are still looking forward for a great support from the administration and from the immunology department. Anybody from the SIUT, whether they are doing it? Anyone from the SIUT? So we are still fair. The most important thing is fair that if anything is happened in the ABU incompatible, then what we will uh, explain the That's patient and the donor. So this, this is the fear of. But inshallah, I'm mm. very much looking forward for it. And for that, even I went uh, in 2017 to the Professor Rostring unit and spent there some time and educate myself. And I know it's not a big deal 
since we are desensitizing HLA DSA positive patient, so it's not a big deal. It's just a matter of the teamwork which is required and which has to be very vigilant. Any other further questions from the audience? Okay. Sir, do you have any further questions? No, I think yeah, in a couple of uh, talks in this session, in the previous session, we heard about, you know, if too much immunosuppression will cause infections and malignancies and too little it would cause, as mentioned by Dr. Rukaya and Dr. Shinil as well. So I think a transplant physician is looking, is more, uh, you know, bothered about the kidney. And at times, saving the kidney, he, 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 he is giving him, over, he was giving more uh, immunosuppression, causing, you know, PTLDs and all infections. So one has to be judicial. And the problem in our community is that majority of the people, they don't want a trans, they don't want a kidney biopsy. And then you have to treat them blindly. And then, you know, you don't know what to exactly to do. Yes, sir, uh, this is a very uh, difficult scenario because at the same time, since you are a transplant physician, you want to save your kidney. But at the same time, you have to be very thoughtful regarding the infection and what infection would be prone in, in your patients. And you have to start the uh, empiric antibiotics, as Dr. Shanila said, because the time, uh, uh, patient doesn't give time the immuno, uh, after the certain heavy immunosuppressive medication. So you have to be very vigilant and you have to be very careful in using high doses of immunosuppression. And there are medical diseases, so that, that makes us uh, to realize that it is not just a nephrology in a transplant. It's a physician, a good physician need to be there uh, for handling uh, renal transplant patient because majority of the patients coming up with different problems, chest problems, some com somebody coming from the neurological aspect. So you should have a good insight of the internal medicine thing then you can always deal with it because other departments are not that uh, prompt in dealing your patient because since it's a transplant patient so everything need to be on your shoulder so you have to look after that because in our setup you have to own your patient it would have been interesting if dr shalila uh, could have given us the timeline of those infections when they did they occur how sooner or later in the transplant and whether there was any correlation with the immunosuppression baseline or the rescue therapy they had with the infections. So in the timeline, uh, you know, the first, in the first month after transplant, you, uh, the risk is same as any surgery patient. My question is specifically your study, whether in your patients, did so you look at that? No, no, we didn't uh, uh, study. Uh, with the timeline, we start, We see just only the transplant in uh, pulmonary infections in renal transplant recipients. We did not, you know, study the timeline of infections. Ke wo infections kab hue, transplant ke kitne arse baad hue, ye is hum study mein humne nahi dekha. Uh, in your uh, data, you were showing there are a lot of influenza infections. So can we give vaccine before transplant? Sir, it's hemophilus influenza, bacterial infection, not the viral influenza virus. It, it was the uh, bacterial, hemophilus influenza. And in my experience, like w what we are practicing, uh, we do the uh, IGRA quantiferon test and if the patients are positive, so we give prophylaxis, I INH prophylaxis. Yeah, and Septron DS is already on the prophylaxis list, so it is covering your nocardia as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I, from I mean, our study, we find that uh, those patients who were on uh, Septron prophylaxis, they, they, have not, they did not develop nocardia. But interestingly, uh, in the international data, we found that they have uh, the, this septron prophylaxis was not covering against nocardia. And the patients are developing nocardia. But in our study, we found that patients are mostly developing after four years uh, of transplant, they are de developing nocardia infections. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, so with this, uh, we'll end this session, but uh, there is a shield distribution ceremony, and for that. Uh, for the C uh, shield distribution ceremony, I would like to call uh, Dr. Sayyid Nayyar Mahmood, who has come across uh, all the way from Islamabad just to attend the symposium. Uh, really appreciate it.
I would like to call uh, Dr. Bilal Jamil from the panel of experts to receive his shield. Dr. Puran Kumar. He also has traveled from Hyderabad just to attend this symposium. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Mansoor Shah. Dr. Rukaya. Dr. Shanila, please come stay. Now I would like to uh, ask Professor Lionel Rosting uh, to come on stage and present the shield to Professor uh, Dr. Sayyid Nayyar Mahmood Saab. Uh, in the last, uh, behind this successful event, uh, there are pharmaceutical industry which has which helped us in making this program successful. So I would like to invite people from Novartis, if somebody is here, I think they have left. Uh, somebody from Almed, can you come up on the stage? Next would be from Sami Pharma. Because without their support, this event was not possible. So thank you very much. Next is Biotech Pharma. Somebody from Biotech. Next would be Gets Pharma. Somebody from the Gets. Next would be from Macta Pharma. This is from Gets, yes. Gets Pharma first. Gets. Next would be from Macta Pharma. Next would be from Gentech Pharma. Next would be from Alliance Pharma. Somebody from the Alliance Pharma.
Thank you very much all the other pharmaceutical company who have helped us in other aspects as well. So thank you very much. Uh, in the last, uh, there is one company who wants to have a cake cutting ceremony and I'd like to thank my panel of experts and they can have a seat. And uh, from Macter Pharma, they want to cut a cake over here. Thank you. And uh, we have still left with the postgraduate surprise gift. So first we'll announce the gift for the postgraduate. So first prize goes to Miss Neha from JPMC. <laughs> Miss Neha. She has won the quiz competition today. Which year you are, Dr. Neha? I have just recently completed my postgraduate. Okay, thank you. So she has won the first prize. Okay. Second prize uh, is for Dr. Rabia from AKUH, but I think they have left. Is there anyone from AKUH? So Dr. Kashyap will receive on his her behalf. So here we'll end today's session and I'd like to thank all the distinguished delegates who have spared their Sunday and gave us a time. It was a great honor and privilege for the renal transplant team to host you. Thank you very much and we are looking forward for these kind of events in the future. So there is a cake cutting ceremony by Macter Pharma. Uh, मेरी तमाम डॉक्टर साइबन से रिक्वेस्ट है स्पेशली पैनलिस्ट और डॉक्टर तसद्दुक से कि हमारा ईपोकेन का जो ब्रांड नेम था वो हमने चेंज करके मैक ईपो रखा है उसकी केक कटिंग है जस्ट पांच मिनट आपके चाहूँगा मैं ऑल ऑफ दोस पार्टिसिपेंट्स हु वांट टू रिसीव देयर सर्टिफिकेट्स कैन रिसीव द You can receive your certificates from uh, left side of the stage. Or for those who have left and want their CME certificate, they can contact the registration email address. The distinguished guest, the Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Nusrat, uh, all the head of the departments who have uh, given their precious time on Sunday and come to celebrate on this occasion, I thank you all and very warm welcome to everyone. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Rashid bin Hamid to come on stage for his welcome speech. Assalamu alaikum everyone. And first of all, I am thankful to Almighty Allah for his countless blessing and who always show us light in the darkness. I am thankful to my parents who always pay for my success, although they are no more with me, but their pair are always with me. I am thankful to my teacher and my mentor, Professor Adibul Hassan Rizvi Saab. Sir, I have learned the value of tolerance, patience and trust in this field from you. The knowledge you have imparted to me has been a great asset throughout my career and my success today is due to your support and mentorship and I appreciate you so much and value everything I have learned from you. Today, I feel a great honor and privilege to stand here in front of you all with my team to celebrate this success. To establish a transplant program was not an easy task, especially when, uh, especially in a semi-government setup. While a well-reputed and well-established largest transplant center, SIUT, is already present and have done more than 500 kidney transplant. So in 2016, the founder Vice Chancellor Professor uh, Masood Hamid Saab had established the Nizot and started the transplant program. And then from 2017, Professor Saeed Qureshi took this charge and as a VC and we are thankful to him that under his pattern we have achieved this milestone of 500 kidney transplant. <laughs> Our first kidney transplant was done in 2017 and since then within a short period of time we have done 500 kidney transplant and now our transplant center is the second largest transplant center in the province of Sindh. 
Our transplant program has not only grown to be a reliable standard of care for patients, but is leading the way in the future of transplant procedure. This achievement is not possible without my team. It is not about any one individual success. If you don't have a team like we have, then ac accomplishment of any goal is not possible. Today we have gathered here not just to celebrate our achievement, but also to give due regard to our other team members. This is the time to recognize and acknowledge the contribution of our entire university department as a whole or by individual doctor and supporting staff who always help us on priority basis. I am thankful to my all team, especially Dr. Tasaddu Khan, the man behind all this show. No doubt he is not only a good physician, but also a good administrator and an organizer. Dr. Naranjan is my right hand in transplant surgery and in the management of surgical issue in ward. Dr. Hassan, thankful to our senior SMO who, who helped us in a technical issue to organize this uh, symposium. My OT team, Mr. Ikram, Mr. Abdul Qadir, Larev, without which smooth surgery is not possible. Our paramedical staff, Staff Noreen, Staff Suresh, Staff Imran, who take care of our patient after transplantation. Although Noreen and Suresh have left this uh, university, but in the initial period they have worked a lot. Then our transplant coordinator, Noreena, Nasreen, Zaid, and Zahzeb, who is responsible for all pre and post operative workup. And finally, our ward manager, Mr. Naveed, who worked day and night tirelessly to accomplish this achievement. In the end, I would like to thank our VC staff, Professor Saeed Qureshi, our Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Nusrat, and Professor Kartar, Principal DMC, Professor Zeba, and Vice Principal, Professor Naveed, Medical Superintendent, and all the stakeholders holder of this university who create a clean and distinct part to achieve this goal. I would also like to extend special th thanks to Professor Rosting for joining us and making this occasion a huge success. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Rashid bin Hamid. Now I would like to invite uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Saeed Qureshi, to say a few words. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Professor Rosting, uh, Dr. Rashid bin Hamid, faculty members of the Dow University and other staff. It is, I think, a great achievement on the part of the Renal Transplant Unit to have carried out 500 uh, transplant surgeries over the last five years, and they are to be congratulated. Uh, not just Rashid Hamid, Rashid bin Hamid, but the, re the whole team. The team, <laughs> I have noticed that the team has worked with a great deal of cohesion and has been performing without any, uh, I should say, friction. And things have been working smoothly and that's why the uh, amount of work that has been possible. The money for uh, doing tr renal transplants is obviously not available to the university and we have to rely on the patients to pay their bills. But I would like to request the health department to, pro uh, to provide us funds as they are doing for the bone marrow transplant and the liver transplant units and that will allow us to do a greater number of surgeries, a greater number of transplants, which will obviously go on to benefit the patients living in and around Karachi. Other than the renal transplant unit, obviously other departments also are supporting the unit. And again, I would like to thank all of those people uh, uh, in their support, for their support, because this makes life easy for the administration and we do not have to 
do problem solving jobs. Dr. Zarnaz has been used to it, now she has retired, but previously it was her job to resolve these things, which used to happen, but I'm happy to say that now we do not uh, face these problems. So thank you, faculty, for being here today, and I hope you have an enjoyable dinner. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your precious words. Now, I would like to uh, invite our chief guest, uh, Professor Lionel Rosting, to say a few words. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is my real pleasure to be here with you today. It's not the first time in Pakistan. And I would like to, well, to greet all the faculty members uh, who are here uh, this evening, uh, all the uh, transplant team, uh, uh, Dr. Hashim bin Hamid, uh, Dr. Tasadok Khan, and all the other members from their team, but also uh, the anesthesiologists, the OT uh, persons, plus all the members of uh, different departments of medicine, without whom we cannot make the workup of our patients pre and post transplant. And for me, it's a great achievement that what you did within just five years uh, to be able to set up a very good kidney transplant program, 500 cases, which is huge. Uh, so you are the second largest uh, from the Sin province, but also to deal with uh, complicated patients because indeed in Pakistan, well, there is a huge demand for kidney transplantation, but. In, you know, it's easier to deal with uh, very simple cases, and indeed it's important, but it's important also to look after patients who are very complicated or who are HLA sensitized, and thanks to the team from Doe University, these patients, the diabetic recipients, uh, those who are sensitized, again, their, uh, their donor, are able to be transplanted with very good results. And uh, the, uh, the state of the art uh, is already present in that program. And this is a huge achievement. And I'm sure that you would be able to implement ABO incompatible transplantation because this will expand the donor pool for sure. Uh, even though this might uh, increase the risk of infections, but thanks, you, are, you have a lot of uh, um, infectious disease specialists which might uh, help you. Uh, so having said that, uh, I'm coming quite often to Pakistan and I will be keeping on. And I hope that you will be able to keep on with this uh, symposium dedicated for transplantation and especially to make some workshops in which um, colleagues uh, might exchange about um, some issues in transplantation and this first symposium was a great success because, in fact, all the um, transplant, kidney transplant teams from various places in Karachi were invited to that, were given lectures, and I think uh, this is mandatory to work all together, all the teams, uh, all the different teams, sorry, to, to work together for the patients. So thank you for, having me, for inviting me for this dinner. And I'm really with you, committed. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Zarnas to come on the stage and say a few words, uh, because she, uh, as Sir told you all that uh, she was very supportive and solving all the issues. So she knows renal transplant very well. Thank you. Thank you, Tasadu. Bismillah rahman rahim A very warm welcome to see everybody whom I've already known and a warm welcome to our foreign guest here, uh, Dr. Rostring. It's a pleasure to have you around. I hope you have the good exposure of our culture today. And uh, uh, our worthy Vice Chancellor, you can see he is very, very busy. And then to you all managed to get him. What I would request that today's function was an uh, eye-opener because they started on time and anybody who took extra time, they would ring a bell. 
and wherever our vice chancellor is invited i have never seen him come late he is very punctual in fact he comes 2 minutes before time so so that is one thing which is very commendable and they uh, it was followed here in this program today in the morning session they started and that's why it gave me hope to revisit this uh, hotel in one day twice and uh, 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 actually why why they are referring me to as a help because it was nothing it was a teething problem you see whenever you start something new and whenever you are with a group of people everybody has got their strengths and weaknesses and it you have to gel in together to get the best results just criticism that we uh, and i had to talk it out with them i had to talk it out with the medical superintendent with the staff with everybody that shortage of staff everything will be there and you'll have to deliver in those limited resources and in those difficult circumstances with diversity of nature and so it was just a bit of counseling which was needed the team is uh, you know it's very impressive because uh, in a public in a private setup you are paid a lot and then you that is a big motivation for you to give you your best uh, one thing i tell you you know these doctors are as good as any foreign doctors they are outstanding doctors in our own community in pakistan and they are still serving in a public sector hospital with limited compensation for their services so that is the thing which i appreciate and i never felt in that campus that i was at a public sector institute where salary is guaranteed and whatever service you want you can give they were up to the mark they were giving more than what was asked from them and uh, that is the reason you can see the results are there and with this uh, i i think uh, there is always a hope that god comes down and helps you and you have seen your major strength is your leadership you have a leadership who has shown you the path and you should continue on his footsteps and you will hit success because it's not what you make it's what you give to your nation what you give to your country what you give to your province and what you give to your community and that is very important and that ethics is there in each faculty that i have seen at dau both campuses and that is the reason that we have in a very short uh, span of time we have come in the world ranking of universities which was lacking we were not there and we are not very old as a university but because of the dynamic leadership we have made it so congratulations dr saeed for doing such a commendable job for us and and i hope you can continue for another decade or so so that we can see the pace going as good as it is right now and uh, in uh, cultural uh, sense since i have been to france and i was very impressed uh, their food the cuisine was so good i was exposed to i was introduced to the french onion soup for the first time when i was in uh, nice and i really loved it every day i used to order till i came and now uh, when i ordered it here it wasn't the same so <laughs> you come from a place where there, there is a lot of culture there is a lot of uh, you know there is a lot of art there is a lot of uh, beauty in your uh, society and a lot of uh, um, you can say uh, the, uh, there is a soft sweet uh, cultural ethics which attracts a lot of people and i don't think so there is anyone who has not dreamt of going to paris in pakistan it is a dream and it came true for me at a very young stage so i have very good memories of france and uh, tuscan i had already told you we had a very cultural event at tuscany and we had the tuscan dinner and the cultural event was also very impressive and very lively and it has made a big impact on my life i always loved the culture the civilization and the beauty that france holds is uh, you know god has gifted you with everything 
and it is so nice to see you visit and we look forward for frequent visits from you. You can visit with your family, friends and children. And with that, I would thank and compliment the whole team, especially Professor Rashid bin Hamid and Tasadduk, who are the team leader of this uh, transplant team. And they have organized this event very well. And I compliment you again, and I wish you all the best. Thanks. Love you all. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. This is Ms. Sumaira Khan here. और इस वक्त इस महफिल में जो है बाकायदा तौर पर एक खूबसूरत से प्रोग्राम का आगाज होने वाला है लेकिन उससे पहले मैं अपने साथी होस्ट को बुलाना चाहूँगी जिन्हें कौन नहीं जानता दुनिया के मशहूर मरूफ शख्सियत और उसके साथ साथ एक ड्रामे में उन्होंने वर्ड कहा था जैसे कि जावेद मियादाद ने एक छक्का मारा था लेकिन उसके उसी तरीके से उन्होंने एक ड्रामे में कहा था वन टू थ्री तो वो एक छोटी सी दुनिया से निकल के एक बहुत बड़े इवेंट ऑर्गेनाइज़र वो बहुत बड़े होस्ट और बहुत बड़े आर्टिस्ट एंड बेस्ट कॉमेडियन जिन्होंने उमर शरीफ साहब के साथ भी काम किया है आ, उनको मैं बुलाऊंगी इस वक्त मंच पर और बड़ी ही इज्जत और एहतराम के साथ जनाब अली मोहतरम आफ्ताब आलम साहब को जिनको जानू जर्मन भी कहा जाता है आप सबकी भरपूर तालियों में जानू जर्मन साहब आफ्ताब आलम साहब वेलकम सर वेलकम सबसे पहले तो सबको सलाम डॉक्टरों के प्रोग्राम में इतनी कम तालियां बजी मेडिसिन यूज तो नहीं करते थैंक यू वेरी मच अच्छा मेरी बातें जो होंगी उसमें किसी को भी इस बात का बुरा नहीं मानना है कि ये क्यों कह रहा है क्योंकि आप लोगों ने हमें बुलाया है हमारी लाइफ के एक अच्छे आर्टिस्ट की हैसियत से बुलाया है आपको लेकिन आपके बारे में मुझे पता चला कि अलहमद 500 से ज्यादा या 500 आपने गुर्दे ट्रांसफेंट कर दिए सलामत रहें आप और अल्लाह करे कि हमारे मुल्क में सब गुर्दे वाले ही हों किसी का बगैर गुर्दे कोई एंट्री ना हो पुरजोर तालियां बजाइएगा <coughs> कुछ काम ऐसे होते जिसमें रब आपका साथ देता है मुझे पता है मेरे बहुत सारे दोस्त हैं जिनको गुर्दों का प्रॉब्लम है इतनी तकलीफ होती है डायलिसिस कराने जाते हैं पहले हफ्ते में एक दफ़ा जाना होता है फिर चार दिन में फिर दो दिन में और इंतहा ये होती है कि एक दिन से वहीं बैठे हुए होते हैं तो अल्लाह ताला किसी को कोई बीमारी ना दे आज सब आप लोग इस हेल्थ के प्रोग्राम में तशीफ लाए हैं और मेरे एक हाथ की तालियों की गूंज आपके लिए कम है आप मेरा साथ दीजिएगा और आपके आने के लिए पुरजोर तालियाँ बजाइएगा डॉक्टर साहब आप सलामत रहें और आप फ्रांस से भी कोई तशीफ लाए हैं इंग्लिश में बात करूं क्योंकि अंग्रेजी मुझे आती नहीं है जानू जर्मन वन टू थ्री फोर वेलकम टू पाकिस्तान एंड आई आस्क यू टू माय फ्रेंड्स प्लीज क्लैप इन फॉर फ्रांसिस डॉक्टर क्योंकि वक्त कम है और प्रोग्राम हमारे पास बहुत लंबा है तो मैं चाहता हूं कि मेरी होस्ट के लिए भी तालियां बजाइएगा आप इधर आ जाइए ना मेरे पास करीब से आने के बाद गुर्दे खुद ब खुद फड़कते हैं तो आप के गुर्दों का जहां हम आए हुए हैं जो इतने काबिल डॉक्टर बैठे हुए हैं अल्लाह ताला आपको सलामत रखे मज़ा में किसी ना किसी को सामने रखना पड़ता है मैं अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह डॉक्टर साहब मेमन हूँ और मज़ा को सिलसिले को मेमनी से ही शुरू करता हूँ ताकि कोई ये ना कहे कि आपने दूसरे को क्यों कहा और डॉक्टरी से ही वाबस्ता प्रोग्राम में मेमनी बात कर रहा हूँ ये एक मेमन सुबह ही सुबह उठ कर आहिस्ता आहिस्ता बावरची खाने में गया शुगर का डब्बा खोला हाथ घुमाया हंसता हुआ बंद करके वापस आ गया उसकी बीवी ने देखा थी क्या हो गया रजाक के बाप को दूसरे दिन फिर गई फिर डब्बा खोला और फिर आहिस्ता आहिस्ता घुमा के बंद कर दिया तीसरे दिन जैसे ही जाने लगा रजाक की मां ने चीखा ए रजाक के बाप पागल हो गए हो क्या रोजाना सुबह जाते हो किचन में और शुगर का डब्बा चेक करते हो कि मैंने शुगर खा ली है अरे हम तो छोड़ो हमारे घर कोई मेहमान भी आता है ना तो उसको भी बोलते हैं कि शुगर को हाथ मत लगाना शुगर हो जाएगी शुगर हो जाएगी और तुम रोज आना जाके शुगर का डब्बा चेक करते हो इसने कहा चुप कर रजा की मां मेरे को कहती है कि पागल हो गए हो अरे पगली डॉक्टर ने मेरे को कहा कि सुबह ही सुबह अपनी शुगर चेक किया करो आप लोग अगर इंजॉय करेंगे तो इन ये आज का प्रोग्राम याद रहेगा बहुत सारे जिंदगी में प्रोग्राम किए लेकिन डॉक्टरों के भी किए 
लेकिन इतने अच्छे और खामोश डॉक्टर पहली दफा देखे और इन डॉक्टरों को बताना पड़ेगा कि इसके बाद डिनर भी है ताकि खामोशी खत्म हो जाए ऐसा नहीं है असल में आप लोग जिस शोबे से ताल्लुक रखते हैं मरीजों को बड़े प्यार से सुनते हैं और एक छोटी सी मैं आपसे वैसे तो आप सब काबिल हैं लेकिन नसीहत करता हूं कि आपके पास जो भी मरीज आए वो यही तवक को लेके आता है कि ये मेरा मसीहा है यही मेरा इलाज करेगा तो आप उसे ऐसी गुफ्तु करें कि आप वाकई इसका मसीहा हो और वो खुश खुश वापस लौटे आइए अब जब हम चलते हैं डांस की तरफ हाँ हाँ अच्छा 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 नहीं नहीं अब रे डॉक्टर साइलेंट नहीं है डॉक्टर जब बोलने पे आते हैं तो वाह वाह अल्लाह इनको सलामत रखे ये भी हमारी तरह है लेकिन कुछ काम ऐसे होते हैं जिनमें इनको खामोश रहना पड़ता है एक मेरा बहुत बड़ा सर्जन महरूम डॉक्टर साहब बहुत बड़ा एक दिन मेरे को कहने लगा कि पता है क्या होता है आफ्ताब बोले क्या मेरे को अटेंडेंट जो आते हैं वो बहुत डिस्टर्ब करते हैं और वो हड्डियों का डॉक्टर था डॉक्टर मोहम्मद अली शाह उसने कहा कि जब एक हमें पता होता है कि ये बहुत अटेंडेंस बकवास कर रहा है तो पांव होता है ये टूटा हुआ और हम बात है ये है तो कहता डॉक्टर साहब ये नहीं ये नहीं ये नहीं ये वाला अच्छा अच्छा फिर हम उंगली खींचे डॉक्टर साहब ये नहीं इधर टूटा है तीसरी दफा बोलता है तो मैं अपने गनमैन को बुलाता हूं जरा अगर ये अटेंडेंट अब यहां होगा तो मरीज को भी बाहर भेज दो तो अटेंडेंट को भी सोचना चाहिए कि डॉक्टर खुद सब कुछ समझता है आप लोग जाके क्यों टह टह करते हैं आपके पास लोग आएंगे आपको पता है कि उसका गुर्दा चेंज करना है या नहीं करना या कोई मेडिसिन से आपसे बढ़कर कौन समझेगा अगर मुझे पता होता तो मैं आपके पास क्यों आता डॉक्टरों आप लोग सलामत रहो अल्लाह ताला आपके हाथ में इतनी शिफा दे कि हर मरीज आपसे इन शह फैजियाब होके जाए आमीन आइए इसी पर एक सिंधी म्यूजिक सुनवाते हैं और सिंधी म्यूजिक के बारे में मैं बता दूँ या हमारे मैं भी सिंध में पैदा हुआ हूँ मुझे भी लोग पूछते हैं तो मैं कहता हूँ हैदराबाद सिंध में पैदा हुआ और सिंध की मौसी की अच्छा, कमाल है सर ये भेदभाव नहीं होता वैसे ये बेबी कह रही है कि यहाँ सिंधी बहुत डॉक्टर्स हैं है नहीं है अरे नहीं नहीं है क्या चेक करूँ अच्छा ये कुछ देना है उनको गिफ्ट विफ्ट देना है तो सब हाथ उठ जाएंगे नहीं नहीं सबके लिए हमारे पाकिस्तान में जो भी आर्टिस्ट आता है पूरे मुल्क की परफॉर्म करता है लेकिन मैं जिसे सिंधी से हम प्रोग्राम का आगाज कर रहे हैं मैं मैं एक बात बता दूं इनको कि हमारे मुल्क में प्रेसिडेंट अयूब खान जिस वक्त सदर थे और खरू से जो रूस से तशीफ लाए थे और एक कैपरी में प्रोग्राम हो रहा था तो एक धुन बजी थी सिंधी धुन ये फैक्ट है खरू से भी झूमने लगे तो प्रेजिडेंट अयूब साहब ने पूछा कि क्या आप इस म्यूजिक को समझ रहे हैं उसने कहा ना म्यूजिक नहीं समझ रहा लेकिन इस धुन का कमाल है कि आदमी खुद ब खुद धुनी हो जाता है तो सिंध की धुन इतनी अच्छी है और मैं सिंध की धुन से प्रोग्राम शुरू कर रहा हूँ अक्रम सोनू एक बहुत अच्छा डांस ग्रुप है वो आपके सामने परफॉर्म करने के लिए आ रहा फिर भी भी हम पूछेंगे कि सिंधी कौन है तो आप बुलाइए अक्रम सोनू को हाँ इस वक्त जो है हम सिंधी परफॉर्मेंस शुरू करने जा रहे हैं और आप सबकी भरपूर तालियों में अक्रम सोनू तालियों में मजा आएगा तो फिर डांस में भी मजा भरपूर बजाइएगा अक्रम सोनू के लिए आओ अक्रम सोनू हेल्थ के प्रोग्राम में अक्रम सोनू की फर्स्ट एंट्री है और इन शह मौसी की म्यूजिक वगैरह सब रेडी है हम हट जाएं या आप आ रहे हैं क्या हुआ अच्छा अब दूसरी तो शो जो होगा हमारी उसमें पहले से हर चीज रेडी रखिएगा क्योंकि वक्त कम है और मुकाबला थोड़ा सा जी हमारा मीडिया ग्रुप भी है जिसमें एक बहुत अच्छे मेरे पुराने सहाफ़ी दोस्त भी हैं मैं उनके बारे में भी बताऊंगा कि वो सेहत के हवाले से ही करते हैं प्रोग्राम वन टू थ्री फोर ओ 
थैंक यू आप लोगों ने इतना पसंद किया परफॉर्म को अब मैं जिस आर्टिस्ट को बुला रहा हूँ सच है कि उसी की वजह से मैं इस प्रोग्राम में आया और जब उसने ब्रीफिंग की कि आपका ये शो है और डॉक्टर्स हैं तो मैं बे इंतहा खुश हुआ और यहाँ आने के बाद मैं और मेरे साथ समर दोनों बहुत खुश हुए अभी भी बाहर ये बात कर रहे थे कि पढ़े लिखों की प्रोग्राम में जाना बहुत खुशी की बात होती है ये अमजद राना है उसका नाम लेकिन सबसे ज़्यादा खुशी की बात है कि पाँच तारीख को ये प्रोग्राम कर रहा है आर्ट काउंसिल ऑफ पाकिस्तान में मेरी पहचान पाकिस्तान मेरी पहचान पाकिस्तान मेरी पहचान उसके बारे में हम बात करेंगे लेकिन अभी हम चाह रहे हैं कि वक्त कम है क्योंकि आज आपने प्रोग्राम शायद अपनी मजबूरी से थोड़ा लेट शुरू किया इसलिए हम जल्दी जल्दी बोल रहे हैं आइए इस्तेबाल करते हैं उस आर्टिस्ट का जिसे मैं अमेरिका लेके गया तो जब वो होटल में एंट्री दे रहा था तो होटल के रिसेप्शन पे सब ने कहा कि भाई इसकी एंट्री नहीं हो सकती मैनेजर ने कहा नहीं हो सकती क्योंकि फायर वर्क करता है ये बहुत अच्छा कैंडल डांसर के हैसियत से बड़ा नाम है इसका मैंने कहा आप एक दफ़ा देखें अगर अच्छा लगे तो इसके बाद अलहमदिल्ला उस होटल में हमने तीन दफ़ा प्रोग्राम किया और उन्होंने पूछा कैंडी डालसर कंपलसरी 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 तो आज इस कंपलसरी को मैं बुला रहा हूँ आपकी पुरजोर तालियों में तशीफ लाते हैं अमजद राना अब आ ही गया हाथ में तो मैं बता दूं कि आपका शो जो पांच तारीख को हो रहा है वो क्या नाम है पाकिस्तान मेरी पहचान और उसमें यह है कि ये आर्ट काउंसिल ऑफ पाकिस्तान में है और जितने मेहमान आएंगे उनको वहाँ कोई कार्ड के चार्ज नहीं है लेकिन वक्त पर आएंगे तो उनको सीटें भी मिलेंगी नहीं ऐसा ही है ना ऐसा ही है और अब ये इसका प्रोग्राम देखिएगा फिर इसके बाद बात करते हैं शुक्रिया और बहुत ही खूबसूरत मनकबत है ये 
حضرت علی لال شہباز کلندر کے مزار پر گئے تھے حضرت علی کی شان میں یہ منقبت ہے تو بہت اچھا لگے گا کہ آج فرسٹ ٹائم میں اس کو یہاں پر آپ لوگوں کے سامنے پرفارم کر رہا ہوں یہ ابھی میڈیا میں نہیں آیا ہے کیونکہ میں نے اپنے شوز کے لیے بنائے میں سارے لیکن میری خوش نصیبی ہے کہ اتنی اچھی آڈینس یہاں بیٹھی ہے جی ریڈی بیٹا ٹریک Let me go. 
थैंक यू सर थैंक यू क्योंकि आजकल ट्रैक का जमाना है ये रेडी बेटा वॉल्यूम बढ़ा दे वॉल्यूम तालियां होनी चाहिए यह हमारे प्रोग्राम का एक हिस्सा है डॉक्टर तसद्द और डॉक्टर रशीद साहब से तसद्द साहब से जो मुलाकात हुई उन्होंने कहा कि इसके बाद इस एक परफॉर्म के बाद हमारी एक अपनी है जो आर्ट जो आए हुए हैं डॉक्टर्स उनको सील देनी है 
और उन्होंने एक बड़ी अच्छी बात की मुझे बहुत अच्छा लगा कि कोई डॉक्टर ये भी बात कर सकता है कहने लगे कि बेशक आपकी परफॉर्म दूसरों की परफॉर्म हमें बहुत खुशी से देखते हैं लेकिन हमारा मेहमान जो डॉक्टर फुरान से तशीफ लाए उन्हें हम कल्चर शो दिखाना चाहते हैं कि हमारे यहाँ का कल्चर यह है तो इस कल्चर के हवाले से अब हम जिसे बुला रहे हैं इस कल्चर जो आपने देखा वो सिंधी कल्चर था उसके बाद मौला अली की एक वो भी देखिए और उसके बाद जो है अब हम आपको दिखाने जा रहे हैं एक बलोची कल्चर जिसको शायद आप बहुत ज़्यादा एंटरटेन करेंगे और बहुत मज़ा आने वाला है आपको तो इस वक्त बलोची कल्चर के लिए मैं बुलाने जा रही हूँ सोनू वही ग्रुप है अक्रम सोनू और वही आपकी पुरजोर तालियाँ हैं थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू अब आप लोगों का प्रोग्राम शुरू हो रहा है डॉक्टर तसदुक को लेकर आया हूँ और वो करेंगे लेकिन एक बात कह दूँ स्पेशल फॉर यू दिस इज आवर कल्चर प्रोग्राम माय डियर प्रोफेसर स्पेशल फॉर यू दिस इज आवर कल्चर प्रोग्राम कल्चर परफॉर्मर यू लाइक इट ओके क्लैप थैंक यू जी सो विल स्टार्ट द first we'll start the cake cutting ceremony or shield distribution okay so we'll start with the shield distribution ceremony and for that uh, i would like to invite uh, honorable professor said qureshi on the stage to start uh, shield giving ceremony later Uh, I request uh, Professor Lionel Rosting to come on stage and receive his gift and the shield.
Now I'm requesting uh, Professor Nusrat Shah to please come on stage and receive her shield. I request Professor Naveed Ali Khan to come on stage and receive his shield if he's available. I request Professor uh, Ashar Afaq, if he's available, to please come on stage and receive his shield. Uh, I request Professor Sayyid Muhammad Zahid Azam, uh, Medical Superintendent of Dow University Hospital, to please come on stage and receive his shield. Professor Zeba Haq, if, if she's available. Yes. Professor Zeba Haq, our principal of Dow International Medical College. Kindly come on the stage for your shield. Kartar, our Pro Vice Chancellor, if he's available, no, he is not here. So there's a special gift for our Vice Chancellor. Uh, there's a special gift uh, for him from the renal transplant unit. Uh, so this is your. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Rashid bin Hamid to, he's already on the stage, to collect his shield. Dr. Naranjan Lal, please come on stage and receive his shield, please. Dr. Mohammed Tasadduk Khan. Dr. Hassan, please take your shield. Mr. Naved, our award manager, please come on the stage.
Next is Mr. Ikram, our transplant technologist and OT manager. Sir Abdul Qadir, transplant technologist. Ms. Lareb Khan, Transplant Technologist. Jahazeb Salim, our Transplant Coordinator. Norina Malik. Our transplant coordinator, I think she has left due to her some personal issue. Uh, Nasreen, come on the stage for the shield. She is our transplant coordinator. Zaid, our transplant coordinator, the youngest one. Now I'd like to invite Imran Gilal, head nurse of transplant team. There are few special uh, people who have worked extraordinary other than their departmental support, like Do Dr. Noman Kakepoto from cardiology department, if he's here or somebody from the cardiology can pick his shield. Uh, Dr. Hamid Mahmood from anesthesiology. Professor Amjad, Dr. Amjad Sattar from Radiology Department. He's working tirelessly for the interventional radiology, which is the main backbone of transplant program. Dr. Anila from Ultrasound Department, if she's here. Professor Saeed Khan from the Molecular Department because molecular department has a very important role for the renal transplant. I think he's not here. Dr. Jawadus Salam from the neurology department. He's also not here. Dr. Saira Abbas from the neurology department. She's also not here. Dr. Tehreem Ansari from the infectious disease. Dr. Nadeem Ahsan from nephrology. Dr. Faisal Asad from Pulmonology. Professor Akhtar Ali Baloch, if he's here. Okay, Professor Jahanara from uh, Ops and Gaini and Director OT Complex. Professor Faisal Ghani, Head of Department Surgery because we have always, whenever surgical complications occur, the surgical teams are always on toes. So it's a great help for us. Professor Iftikhar Ahmed, he's the head of department of the medicine and he's working very hard with us and uh, he's an important role in the hospital for managing all the medical related issues. So Professor Iftikhar Ahmed.
Professor Naila Naeem is the head of Department of Neurology and uh, she is the executive member of the Transplant Committee. So I welcome you, Madam. Please come on the stage. She is a very important member of our Transplant Committee. Dr. Farooq Ali Khan from the Bone Marrow Transplant. I'd like to invite him. He's the head of department and running a successful bone marrow transplant program in Dow University of Health Sciences. Dr. Jahzeb Heather who's the head of department of liver transplant unit and he's running a very successful liver transplant program. So now we are the only program in province of Sindh who is catering all the three ones, renal, liver and bone marrow. I would like to invite Dr. Rustum Zaman, he's the director, OPD, to come on the stage. He's always helping in every nitty-gritty matters related to the hospital. So please come on the stage. <laughs> Dr. Sabaha Sarfraz, and our immunologist, a backbone of the renal transplant unit, because without immunology, we cannot do anything. Nothing, yes, very important role. <laughs> Ms. Badar Hina Afnan, a dietitian, if she's here, no. Okay, so now uh, the Department of uh, Cardiology, I would like to invite uh, Professor Tarek, Tarek Farman. Professor Tarek Farman from Department of Cardiology, he's the head of department. He's collected shield because cardiology is an important pre-op thing that we always disturb them a lot. Dr. Noman Al Kamri from Radiology Department, Interventional Radiology. He's also an important player of the renal transplant team because we always ask him for the renal biopsies and other uh, interventional procedures. So he is playing a very important role in the success of this renal transplant. Now, I would like to invite Head of the Department of Radiology, Professor Nasreen Nas, to please come on the stage because radiology has a very important role because we disturb them all the time and ask them to come as early as possible and their team are always on their toes. So I thank you, Madam, for all your support. Uh, now I would like to invite the uh, Head of Department of Pathology, Dr. Uzma Bukhari, to please come on the stage and receive her shield because without her support we cannot run investigations. Department of Biochemistry, if Dr. Talha is over here. No. 
So Department of ENT, anyone from the, yes. So head of the Department of ENT, please come on the stage and collect his shield. Now I'd like to invite uh, head of the Department of Orthopedics or anyone from the Department of Orthopedics because we have AVN, so they are important members, but unfortunately they are not here. Uh, somebody from the Department of Dermatology. So Madam Zanaz, we will like you to be on the stage as the head of Department of Dermatology because your other team members are not here. Now I would like to invite uh, Director Nursing. They have a very important role in managing patient because I always say we only give 20% time to the patient. Rest of the time is always given by the staff. So they have a very important role to play. Please give her a big applaud. And our transplant nurses are doing very well. Now I'd like to invite uh, head of department of pharmacy. Please come on the stage. Without them, we cannot prescribe all those difficult medications. And all the time, we always disturb them to bring this medication, bring that medication. So they are always there for our help. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to invite someone from the finance department, uh, if Director of Finance is here, or someone from the finance department. Nobody, okay. I think all the... uh, uh, one shield for the media coordinator. We are very thankful that he has uh, arranged such a good show with a good uh, media coverage, because most of the channels are here. Okay, so thank you very much and I thank, no, there is no one from the diagnostic laboratory, someone from the, yes, Shiraz is here, so please come on the stage. Now I would like to invite Dr. Hamad Mithani to come on the stage and take his shield. He is uh, in charge of uh, urology and he's doing a very good job in laparoscopic surgery in Dow University of Health Science. I think uh, that concludes our shield distribution ceremony and we'll continue with a cultural show and other entertainment. Thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. Thank you very much.
is a cake cutting ceremony as well. So I would like to invite all the head of the department to please come in front and have a one photograph together. Next performers, please uh, come on stage for a performance. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you very much for a honorable guest. Please, you guys will be able to do Sir, sir, thank you very much. Abhi, uh, but honorable guest ko baithne dijiyega munne doc sahab bithaiye bithaiye ab hum ek baar phir wohi silsila shuru karte hain culture show jisme hum perform karne ke liye bula rahe hain waqt ki kami hai aur aap log full enjoy kijiyega kyunki takr takaduz sahab ne kaha hai ki waqt kam hai aur abhi hamare honorable guest jo hai apna views de rahe the to isliye hum chup the ek baar phir purzor taaliyon mein apne program ko aagaaz karte hain bharpoor bajaiyega taaliyan Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bulao. इस वक्त हम बुलाने जा रहे हैं पंजाबी और पढ़ानी कल्चर को जो कि आपको दिखाएंगे इस मंच पर और बहुत इंजॉय करवाएंगे अकरम सोनू अकरम सोनू ग्रुप प्लीज पंजाबी और पठानी पठानी नहीं पश्चो पठानी 
tu Bibi Shiri के से था और अब हम पंजाबी परफॉर्म करवाने के लिए बुला रहे अकरम सानू फौरन आइएगा क्योंकि हमारे पास टाइम कम है और हम चाहते हैं कि हमारे ऑनरेबल गेस्ट को तमाम कल्चर परफॉर्म दिखाएं थैंक यू वेरी मच जाके पूछ क्या कह रहे हैं आप तैयार हैं नहीं अच्छा वो एक मिनट के लिए क्योंकि पंजाबी ड्रेस होता है वो चेंज कर रहे हैं सर तो वो कर रहे हैं तो जब तक मैं आपको एक छोटी सी बात बता दूँ तब जो से सुनिएगा क्योंकि थोड़ा सा मज़ा आएगा सुनने में अच्छा हम मेमन जो होते हैं ना वो जब तक किसी को ताने का जवाब नहीं देते चैन से नहीं बैठते बड़ी तोज्जो से सुनिएगा एक मेमन ट्रेन में जा रहा था बराबर में बहुत सारे पैसेंजर बैठे हुए थे पंजाबी बैठा हुआ था जो अब रक्स करने आ रहे हैं ना पंजाब के कल्चर के हवाले से याद आया मेमन को सर्दी लगी अब उसने खिड़की बंद करने की कोशिश की नहीं हो रही थी पंजाबी ने कहा हट टॉय मैं मरदा पुत्र करता पिया एवेक पुर करके बंद कर दी खिड़की बोले लस्सी का कमाल है मेमन चुप हो गया अब दोपहर हुई तो फिर गर्मी लगी अब मेमन ने फिर खिड़की ऊंची करके कोशिश की अब खोल लू खोलने की कोशिश मैं पंजाबी ने कहा मैं मरदा पुत्र ऐ मैं ही करता पिया मुंह हट उसने भुर की खिड़की ऊपर चली गई बोले लस्सी का कमाल है अब मेमन को गुस्सा आया कि ताने का जवाब देना है सामने जो ट्रेन की जंजीर होती है मेमन उधर गया आहिस्ता आहिस्ता और खींचने की कोशिश की पंजाबी ने कहा ठोए पे मरदा पुत्र एवं ही करता पिया हूँ उसने जाग के जंजीर को खींचा घर ट्रेन रुक गई पुलिस ऊपर आई बोले जंजीर किसने खींची है सबने बोला इसने और पंजाबी को पकड़ के लेके जा रहे तो मेमन ने कहा ए! ये चाय का कमाल है चाय का कमाल है तालियां बजनी चाहिए मेमन की अकल देखे <laughs> ओके अमजद साहब हम्म जावे साहब ओके ओके आगे ओके सर एक बार फिर पुरजोर तालियों में हमारा कल्चर पंजाब पंजाब का परफॉर्म करने के लिए तशीफ ला रहा है एक बार फिर अक्रम सोनू ग्रुप क्योंकि ड्रेस चेंज करनी होती है ना सर 
तो थोड़ा सा अच्छा लगता है परफॉर्म में जैसे अभी हमारे के पी के का किया यस आगे आ जाइए आप सर अच्छा कुछ है आपका ओके ओके मैं चलो ओके रेडी है चलो वन टू थ्री फोर जोर तालियां सब चीज पंजाब में नहीं है पाकिस्तान में कराची में भी है थैंक यू वेरी मच थोड़ा जे म्यूजिक दे दे ओ पंजाबी टच नच पंजा बन नच पंजा बन नच पंजा बन नच कोई नच पंजा बन नच पंजा बन नच पंजा बन नच दे दे वे तुम तो मा जा किसी चीज लेके आ जा बिटंगा नु छिड़का जा दिला नु नी तड़का जा पावे अंग्रेजी से पावे दे पंजाबी टच नच पंजा बन नच पंजा बन नच पंजा बन नच कोई नच पंजा बन नच पंजा बन नच पंजा बन नच चांदी वर्ग के तंग चमकने मर जावा गुड़ खाके पैसा रुक जाते छड़िया दे तू हसी बच बचा के कोई लग दी अग्जा पान दी पर पिछो मतान दी मकरानी थलो चीते पंजाबी टाची नच पंजा बन नच पंजा बन नच पंजा बन नच ओ नच पंजा बन 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 नच पंजा बन
she is with the little girl please come on the stage she is working in the molecular department so we must give her a letter of appreciation miss huda if she is here mr ayaz if he is here from radiology mr ata mohammed if he is here mr ata mohammed please come on the stage mr saleem ata yes mr asad bhatti from theater mr asad bhatti anesthesia mr danish kamar Mr Amir Ali he is a renal transplant nurse Amir please come on the stage Abdul Basit please come on the stage Mr Tufail Ahmed Mr Naveed Mr Naveed Mr Zafar I have seen both of them Mr Naveed come on the stage Mr Zafar Abdul Khaliq Imran Khan Mr Zafar Mr Dilawar Dilawar Mr Ishtiaq Mr Fahim from renal transplant Mr Fahim Ms Sajida please come on the stage Ms Noreen Mushtaq please come on the stage Noreen Mushtaq Although she has left us she has worked really hard in our department she was head nurse before Ms Amreen from infectious disease nurse she is not here so mr zafar is not here okay thank you very much we have a last uh, cultural performance yes, and yes, after sir. that uh, the dinner would be ready and after the dinner there is a musical night as well so please don't go away after the dinner thank you very much uh, okay. after this song dinner will be start but special for you sir this is our culture pakistan and pakistani song with mr amjad rana and sonu group mr amjad rana and sonu group दिल कुर्बान इस पे जान भी कुर्बान है इस पे दिल कुर्बान इस पे जान भी कुर्बान है हम पाकिस्तानी तेरा पाकिस्तान है ये मेरा पाकिस्तान है तेरा पाकिस्तान है ये मेरा पाकिस्तान है इस पे दिल कुर्बान 
कुर्बान इस पे जान भी कुर्बान है इस पे दिल कुर्बान इस पे जान भी कुर्बान है मौज पड़े या आधी आए दिया जलाए रखना है घर की खातिर सो तो मुझे ले घर तो आपसे रखना है दुनियादों में है तेरा लहू मेरा लहू हम पाकिस्तानी हम पाकिस्तान इसकी दुनियादों में है तेरा लहू मेरा लहू इससे तेरी आबरू है इससे मेरी आबरू इससे तेरा नाम है इससे मेरी पहचान है इससे तेरा नाम है इससे मेरी पहचान है इस पे दिल कुर्बान इस पे जान भी कुर्बान है इस पे दिल कुर्बान जान भी कुर्बान है पाकिस्तानी तेरा पाकिस्तान है ये मेरा पाकिस्तान है तेरा पाकिस्तान है ये मेरा पाकिस्तान है इस पे दिल कुर्बान इस पे जान भी कुर्बान है इस पे दिल कुर्बान इस पे जान भी कुर्बान है नूरो रंग है वादी ये मेहरान ये हम पाकिस्तानी हम पाकिस्तानी इक दिया रे नूरो रंग है वादी ये मेहरान ये नूर आंखों का मेरी आंखें बलोचिस्तान है दिल है सरहद की जमी पंजाब जिसमो जान है दिल है सरहद की जमी पंजाब जिसमो जान है इस पे दिल कुर्बान इस पे जान भी कुर्बान है इस पे दिल कुर्बान इस पे जान भी हम पाकिस्तानी तेरा पाकिस्तान है ये मेरा पाकिस्तान है तेरा पाकिस्तान है ये मेरा पाकिस्तान है इस पे भी कुर्बान इस पे जान भी कुर्बान इस पे भी कुर्बान इस पे जान भी कुर्बान हम पाकिस्तानी हम पाकिस्तानी हम पाकिस्तानी हम पाकिस्तानी हम पाकिस्तानी पाकिस्तान जिंदाबाद थैंक यू आफ्ताब आलम साहब देखिए बड़े फख्र से मैं कह रहा हूं और दुआओं के साथ कह रहा हूं कि मुझे इस दुआ में शरीक कीजिएगा कि अल्लाह ताला ने मुझ पर इतना कर्म किया है कि न जाने कहां कहां दुनिया में गया हूं और जाता हूं मोबाइल डॉक्टर साहब भूल गए तो मैंने एक आदमी को गवाह रखा कि जो कोई मैं मोबाइल उठा रहा हूँ अब मैं ये डॉक्टर साहब को मोबाइल दे रहा हूँ उसके अवज आप मुझे क्या देंगे तालियों की गूंज देंगे या नहीं देंगे डॉक्टर साहब ऊपर आइएगा दिस इज़ द गिफ्ट फॉर यू इतना अच्छा प्रोग्राम करने पर और कोशिश कीजिएगा कर लीजिएगा आप मुझे साथ रखें ताकि मैं मोबाइल उठाया करूँ इस मुल्क का मोबाइल पर याद आई बात प्लीज तवज्जो से सुनिएगा अभी एक प्रोग्राम में एक प्रोग्राम में सर दिस इज अ फैक्ट एक प्रोग्राम में इसी तरह कोई मोबाइल भूल गया और मेरे पास आ गया और वो भागता हुआ आया कि सर मेरा मोबाइल मेरा मोबाइल अनाउंस कीजिएगा मैंने कहा ओके ओके मैंने कहा कि देखिए इनका मोबाइल खो गया और ये कह रहे हैं अनाउंस करो और हम जिस मुल्क में रहते हैं वहां सोना ही सोना है लेकिन हमारे मुल्क की बदनसी भी है ये बड़ी तोजो से सुनिएगा ये मैंने खुद कहा है बस दुआ कीजिएगा कि अल्लाह मुझे बचा के रखे मैंने कहा हमारे इस मुल्क का बड़ा कमाल अलमिया है मोबाइल कोई ले जाता है और मोबाइल में बिठा के कोई ले जाता है पता नहीं दोनों कहां चले जाते हैं समझ गए तो पुरजोर तालियां बजाइएगा और सर ये एडिट कर दीजिएगा वरना मैं भी मोबाइल में जाऊंगा थैंक यू वेरी मच अच्छा एक बहुत अच्छी खूबसूरत परफॉर्म के लिए डॉक्टर साहब ने मुझसे कहा कि थोड़ा लेंदी करो तो मुझे अच्छा लगा कि यार एक खुद ऑर्गेनाइजर कह रहा है कि मेरे मेहमान स्पेशली फ्रॉम फ्रांस तशीफ लाए हैं तो मैं चाहता हूँ तो एक बड़ी अच्छी परफॉर्म करने के लिए बुला रहा हूँ वो बिल्कुल रेडी कर रहे हैं और जी ये ये मेरे साथ वो कंपेयर है खाली दूर से यूं करती है जैसे ट्रेन में हम बैठे हैं देखिए नहीं आप, मैं ओके यही कह रहा हूं स्पेशल फॉर यू मैं आप ताकि दो मिनट में वो रेडी हो जाए ड्रेस सर स्पेशल माय डियर फ्रेंड यू अच्छा यू आस्क मी नाउ प्लीज फ्रेंकली डू यू लाइक दिस शो हंड्रेड परसेंट वन सेकेंड वन सेकेंड इफ यू डोंट माइंड आई अब बजाइए पुरसोर तालियां क्योंकि जब गेस्ट ऐसा हो मैंने कहा वन सेकेंड ये आ गए आई लव यू आई लव यू डॉक्टर तस्तु की तरह 
वो राशिद साहब कहाँ हैं डॉक्टर राशिद सर आप आइए ना सर सर आप आइए देखिए ये मुल्क हमारा और तरक्की करेगा लेकिन अगर ऐसे बन जाए इनके हाथ में क्या है हमारा पाकिस्तान का फ्लैग कितना पाकिस्तान से प्यार करते हैं और मेरे रब ने कहा है और सच बताता हूं डॉक्टर साहब मैं दूसरी दुनिया में जाता हूं वहां पर ये लोग कमाल होते हैं और अगर वो ये मुसलमान हो जाए तो उनसे बड़ा कोई मुसलमान नहीं होता इतना ये लोग प्यार करते हैं आई लव यू डॉक्टर मैं मैं चाहूंगा कि मैं ऐसे करूंगा और आपकी तालियां होंगी ताकि डॉक्टर को भी पता चले कि आप लोग कितना प्यार करते हैं थैंक यू थैंक यू डॉक्टर राशिद थैंक यू वेरी मच आप में से बड़ा कौन है <laughs> पूछने में क्या है मुझे पता है कि दूसरे प्रोग्राम में पिटूंगा कौन बड़ा है डॉक्टर साहब प्लीज एक सेकेंड आइएगा आप बड़े या ये बड़े सर अच्छी बात किस में पूछ रहे हैं आप उम्र में पूछ रहे हैं कि रुतबे में पूछ रहे हैं कि मेरा मैरिज ब्यूरो है उम्र में ही पूछ रहा हूँ दाढ़ी देख लें सर आप मेरी दाढ़ी से कुछ नहीं होता आप इतने जवान हैं अलहमदिल्ला और इतने चाकू चौबन हैं कि हर दफ़ा भाग भाग के काम कर रहे हैं उससे बड़ा अल्लाह ताला आपको क्या अता करे ये जिंदगी में याद रखिएगा कि जब भी कोई दुआ करो तो यही दुआ करो कि अल्लाह ताला मुझे किसी का मोहताज ना करना ये दोनों के लिए भी दुआ कीजिएगा और आप मैं आप लोगों के लिए कर रहा हूँ अभी एक अच्छी बात बताता हूँ क्योंकि हम पकड़पन लोग समझते ना बेटा वो रेडी जैसे ही हो जाए मुझे बता दीजिएगा फ़ौरन एक बाप अपने बेटे के लिए बहुत कुछ किया डॉक्टर साहब उसने उसको पढ़ाया दौलत से माला माल किया एक दिन बाप जा रहा था खुशी खुशी उसके कंधे पर हाथ था बड़ी सोच के सुनिएगा कि उसने कंधे पर हाथ रख के बाप ने पूछा बता बेटा दुनिया में सबसे सब बड़ा खुश नसीब कौन है बेटे ने कहा मैं अब्बा को गुस्सा आया कि मैंने इतना कुछ दिया और कह मैं दोबारा पूछा सुन दुनिया में सबसे सब बड़ा खुश नसीब कौन है बोले अब्बा मैं उसने गुस्से में कहा अच्छा आगे जाने लगा और बोला आखिरी दफा पूछता हूं बता दुनिया में सबसे सब बड़ा खुश नसीब कौन है बोले आप डर गया ना बोले डरा नहीं हूं उस वक्त आपका हाथ मेरे कंधे पे था तो मुझसे बड़ा खुश नसीब कौन होगा अल्लाह आप पर हमेशा रहमत बरसाए अल्लाह रहमत बरसाए ओके नाउ नेक्स्ट प्रोग्राम बेस्ट परफॉर्मर मिस्टर अमजद राना और इसका पांच तारीख को शो है आप जरूर तशीफ लाइएगा और इसके बाद डिनर है और डिनर के बाद गजलों का प्रोग्राम है और मैंने डॉक्टर से पूछा कि क्या पूरी रात का प्रोग्राम है बोले आज मेरे डॉक्टरों को मैं खुश करके भेजूंगा तो आप इन दोनों के लिए भी तालियां बजाइए ना कि खुश होकर जाएं पुरजोर बजाइएगा जैसे डॉक्टर साहब के लिए बजाया थैंक यू वेरी मच मिस्टर हम जाना ओके वन टू थ्री फोर ये सॉन्ग न्यू सॉन्ग है डेलीकेट टू मोहम्मद अली शेखी उसके लैरिक्स हमने चेंज करके इसको बनाया बड़ा खूबसूरत सा तो कभी कभार ऐसा होता है कि बड़ी बड़ी जगहों पर कोई ना कोई मिस्टेक हो जाती है तो आज 40 साल मतलब म्यूजिक शो में अभी सर का कसूर नहीं है थैंक यू आपने अप्रिशिएट करते हैं मुझे एज ए कैंडल डांस के तौर पर आप लोग जानते हैं पहचानते हैं पूरी दुनिया में जाता हूं लेकिन आज के शो में कुछ हुआ है कुछ सिलसिला टाइमिंग की वजह से लेकिन फिर भी हम आपके सामने हैं और नेक्स्ट टाइम के लिए हमें न से तो सीखता है बंदा बुढ़ापे में भी सीखता है ठोकर था <laughs> तो अब लोग बहुत अच्छे लगे आप लोग अच्छे लोग हैं अप्रिशिएट कर रहे हैं उसके बावजूद रेडी ये बहुत प्यारा जितने गाने मैंने खुद गाए हैं और ये मैं ट्रिब्यूट देता रहता हूँ मुख्तलिफ एक्टर्स को या सिंगर्स को रेडी ओके ना तड़पाना तू प्यार भरा दिल दे दीजिए आना वो नख 
रे वाली ना तड़पाना तू प्यार भरा दिल दे दीजाना दिल मेरा काबू वो नखरे वाली ना तड़पाना तू प्यार भरा दिल दे दीजिए आना वो नखरे वाली ना तड़पाना तू प्यार भरा दिल दे दीजिए आना सारी दुनिया में है तेरे ही जलो में हर सुबह सुबह तेरे ही चर्चे तू प्यार मेरा ना ठुकराना वो नखरे वाली ना तड़पाना तू प्यार भरा दिल दे दीजिए आना वो नखरे वाली ना तड़पाना तू प्यार भरा दिल दे दीजिए आना प्यार का जादू वो नखरे वाली ना तड़पाना तू प्यार भरा दिल दे दीजिए आना वो नखरे वाली ना तड़पाना तू प्यार भरा दिल दे दीजिए आना सारी दुनिया में है तेरे ही चल में हर सुबह सुबह तेरे ही चर्चे तू प्यार मेरा ना ठुकराना वो नखरे वाली ना तड़पाना तू प्यार भरा दिल दे दीजिए आना वो नखरे वाली तू प्यार भरा दिल दे दीजिए आना अमजद राना और थैंक यू अगेन स्पेशली मैं डॉक्टर साहब को इसलिए पकड़ के लाया कि एक बहुत बड़ी अच्छी अनाउंसमेंट uh, होगी डॉक्टर साहब इस अनाउंसमेंट से पहले एक बात मैं बता दूं ताकि आपके लोग बड़े एंजॉय करके खाएं एक बहुत बड़ा प्रोग्राम हो रहा था एक जनरल ने छोटे छोटे रंग रूट होते हैं ना उसको इन्विटेशन दी अब जनरल ने तकरीर की डिनर I hope, I hope uh, you are enjoying your enjoy enjoy and uh, Pakistani people's uh, hospitality. hospitality. And, and now, now you will be enjoying, enjoying our, our uh, Pakistani, Pakistani music, music. Definitely. Now I am waiting for you that our doctors, doctors, who are doctors, who are living in life. अल्लाह ताला देता है और फिर अगर उसमें कुछ ऊंच नीच हो जाती है तो यही डॉक्टर्स होते हैं यही मसीहा होते हैं जो कि उस शख्स को दूसरी जिंदगी देते हैं तो एक मसीहा जो होता है वो दर्द को कम करने का काम करता है और यहाँ माशाल्लाह इतने सारे डॉक्टर्स मौजूद हैं तो जरा जोरदार क्लैपिंग करें अपने लिए कि आप सारे के सारे यहाँ पर मौजूद हैं और इतना खूबसूरत ये माहौल है 
मैं चाहूंगी कि आप लोग अपनी जगहों पे बैठ जाएंगे ना तो फिर हमें भी आसानी होगी जोरदार क्लापिंग होनी चाहिए डॉक्टर मुसद्दिक के लिए बहुत खूबसूरत फरमाइश है तो मैं चाहती हूँ कि हम ये जो वक्त गुजार रहे हैं बड़ा खूबसूरत हो मेमोरेबल हो और अच्छी यादें कलेक्ट करके लेकर जाएं और आप लोग अपनी फरमाइशें भी मुझे ज़रूर बताइए अगर मुझे याद हुई तो मैं ज़रूर आपके लिए गाऊँगी अभी तो पहले डॉक्टर मुसद्दिक के लिए गा देते हैं तसद डॉक्टर तसद के लिए
ऐसे डॉक्टर तसद्दुक ने जो फरमाइश की थी मैंने सबके चेहरों पर देखा कि हर कोई चाहता है कि उसको उनको प्यार से बुलाया जाए और ये हर घर की कहानी है चाहे वो डॉक्टर का घर हो या वकील का घर हो या आम इंसान जो कि एक आम जिंदगी में अपने लेकिन ख्वाहिश सबकी ये होती है कि कोई हो प्यार से बुलाने वाला तो अब जो मैं गीत गाने लगी हूँ ये भी बड़ा खूबसूरत गीत है और कहते हैं ना कि ज़िंदगी के रास्ते में कुछ ऐसे दोस्त कुछ ऐसे साथी और डॉक्टर्स की फील्ड तो इतनी वसी है माशाल्लाह से कि आपको आ, हर जगह कुछ ऐसे दोस्त मैसर आते हैं जो आपकी ज़िंदगी का कीमती सरमाया होते हैं ये फिर कुछ कहने आए हैं जी नीले नी नंबर पर कौन जी डॉक्टर जहाँजेब और डॉक्टर हेरा जो हैं वो 45 मिनट्स के बाद बिल्कुल सीट बेल्ट जो है अपनी बांध लीजिए कि वो यहाँ पर परफॉर्म करेंगे ठीक है ना सही है बिल्कुल बिल्कुल हमने ये पाकिस्तानी गाए हैं अभी नीले नीले अंबर का मैं क्या करूँगे वो हिंदुस्तानी है है फिर डॉक्टर तसद को पकड़े हैं आपके ये क्या इजाजत है ना चले जी आप सभी क्लापे के साथ सुनेंगे नीले नीले अम्बर पर छाज जब छाए प्यार पर साए हमको तड़पाए नीले नीले अम्बर पर छाज जब छाए प्यार पर साए हमको तड़पाए ऐसे होनी चाहिए और मेरे पास फरमाइश आई है आफरी आफरी ये किसको डेडिकेट करना चाहेंगी डॉक्टर नसरीन आप सोचना पड़ रहा है आपको ओ वाह तो आप सबके लिए है डॉक्टर नसरीन की तरफ से तो मैं आप लोगों को डेडिकेट करती हूँ बड़ा ही खूबसूरत ये गीत उसने जाना के तारीफ हम के नहीं उसने जाना के तारीफ हम के नहीं आफरी 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 तू भी देखे अगर तो कहे हम नशी आफरी 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 का साथ ये बोगी कहाँ जा रही है ये लोग कहीं और जा रहे हैं आपको 
करना पड़ेगा फरमाइश कर रहे हैं आके बड़े मजे से ना मैं तेरे संग कैसे चलूं सजना डॉक्टर दीबा की ये फरमाइश है लेकिन कॉलेज लाइफ में भी स्कूल लाइफ में भी और फिर आप भी तो इतनी माशाल्लाह इतनी पढ़ाकू होते हैं आप लोग कि आप लोगों की पढ़ाई तो चलती ही रहती है मैं कहती हूँ ये एक ऐसा शोभा है कि जिसमें आपको रात दिन बस पढ़ाई 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 हर चीज चेंज होती रहती है कुछ नई चीज़ें आ जाती हैं कुछ नए फार्मूलाज आ जाते हैं तो डॉक्टर दीबा इन्होंने फरमाइश की है फरमाइश आपकी लेकिन डॉक्टर तस्व जो है वो आके सबकी फरमाइशें पहुंचा रहे हैं भाई इनके लिए ज़ोरदार क्लैपिंग होनी चाहिए इतनी मेहनत करना अपने कुलीग्स के लिए और आपको एक, एक, एक माशा जी हाँ फिर तो प्रिंसिपल हैं इनकी तो फिर तो बात ही अलग हो जाती है ना मैं तेरे संग कैसे चलूं सजना वैसे आपको किसके साथ चलना पसंद आएगा बस तो मुझे थोड़ा सा तारुफ करवा दे ना थोड़ा सा मुझे भी तो पता चले ना ये भी डॉक्टर हैं आप भी डॉक्टर ये इंजीनियर हैं आए देखें जरा तो ये इंजीनियर हैं इनके हस्बैंड नाम मुझे बता दीजिए हाजी मुजफ्फर साहब जोरदार क्लैपिंग हो जाए हाजी मुजफ्फर साहब के लिए डॉक्टर दीबा डॉक्टर जेबा डॉक्टर जेबा की फरमाइश है मैं तेरे संग कैसे चलूं सजना तू समंदर है मैं सागरों के बहुत ही खूबसूरत फरमाइश है अब मैं चाहती हूं कि इस तरफ से भी कोई फरमाइशें आए ताकि आप लोग भी अच्छे से इंजॉय करें 
खूबसूरत शाम है मैं तेरे संघ कैसे चलो संजना तू समे अकेले ना जाना आपका नाम क्या है डॉक्टर अरे वाह क्या बात है मेरे पास तीन फरमाइशें जमा हो गई हैं और यहाँ पर एक फरमाइश है वो बड़ी मजेदार है काली काली जुल्फों के फंदे ना डालो हमें जिंदा रहने दो ए हुस्न वालो तो ये जो ये जो फरमाइश आई है डॉक्टर जाहिद यहाँ पर हम डॉक्टर जाहिद आजम साहब के लिए जरा जोरदार क्लैपिंग हो जाए डॉक्टर साहब अगर आप खड़े हो जाएंगे ना तो इन सबको सुकून मिल जाएगा अब इनके दिल की जो कैफियत है ना वो इस मिसरे में है न छेड़ो हमें हम सताए अब आप लोग वावा भी कर सकते हैं वावा वावा कैसे कैसे वावा वावा न छेड़ो हमें हम सताए बहुत जख्म सीरे पे खाए हम 
में जिंदा रहने दो अकेले ना जाना हमें छोड़कर तुम तुम्हारे बिना हम भला क्या जिएंगे तो डॉक्टर साहब ने किसी और की फरमाइश पर यहाँ तक हम तक पहुँचाई है तो बड़ा ही खूबसूरत ये गीत है Hey <laughs> 
обычно кирки. अच्छा जी यहाँ पर बस सॉरी जी जी अच्छा डॉक्टर जहाँजेब हैं यहाँ पर हाय मुझे लग रहा था कि आप ही हैं कुछ क्योंकि पूरे महफिल में मैंने देखा ये यूं करके बैठे हैं और अब चाहेंगे कि इनकी इनकी परफॉर्मेंस में सब क्लैपिंग करें मैंने देखा मैं जज कर रही हूँ कि यार इस ये बंदा ये या तो कुछ घर में कोई बात बात हुई ये यूँ बैठे हुए बस ऐसे तो डॉक्टर जाजेब के लिए जरा जोरदार क्लैपिंग हो जाए आ जाइए भाई ये एक खूबसूरत सा गाना हमें सुनाएंगे और इनके लिए एक मतलब अब फिर जोरदार क्लैपिंग हो जाए फिर दो Oh, oh, oh. 
दिल रुका हो इतना तो मैं कहूंगा मेरी ही इस गजल का रंगीन काफिया हो एक बात तुमसे पूछू बोलो जवाब दोगे ये हुसन ये जवानी सरदार क्या करोगे एक बार मुस्कुरा दो एक बार मुस्कुरा दो एक बार मुस्कुरा दो एक बार मुस्कुरा दो एक बार मुस्कुरा वाजी बात अब मुनि बेगम के जब गजलों की बात आ ही गई है मुस्कुराना तो आपको आ गया आवारगी में हद से गुजर जाना भी चाहिए लेकिन कभी कभार तो घर जाना चाहिए आप सबके क्या पे कैसे बात एक राइटर है 
और एक सहाफी भी हैं और एक डॉक्टर यहाँ पर हमारे साथ मौजूद हैं आप डॉक्टर नहीं हैं चले जी इनकी फरमाइश है अभी ना जाओ छोड़कर के दिल अभी भरा नहीं
आज जाने की जिद ना करो बहुत ही खूबसूरत ही गजल है हबीब वली मोहम्मद साहब ने इसको बड़े खूबसूरत अंदाज में गाया है
के बाद डॉक्टर डॉक्टर हेरा आपके लिए गीत गाएंगी थैंक यू सो मच
गुरु जी थैंक यू सो मच आखिर में धमाल अगर ना हो तो फिर लगता है कि प्रोग्राम खत्म ही नहीं हुआ है चलता ही रहेगा तो अगर आप लोग कहेंगे तो मैं गा देती हूँ या वरना गजल जो भी आप बताएं डॉक्टर तस्वीर आप ही बताएं आप ही शांति इसी के साथ आपसे इजाजत चाहते हैं थैंक यू सो मच